Introduction, Part 1, of Volume 1, of A Voyage Towards the South Pole. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World Volume 1 by James Cook Introduction, Part 1 Formal Title A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World Performed in His Majesty's Ships The Resolution and Adventure In the years 1772, 3, 4, and 5 Written by James Cook, Commander of the Resolution in which is included Captain Furneaux's narrative of his proceedings in the adventure during the separation of the ships, in two volumes illustrated with maps and charts and a variety of portraits of persons and views and places, drawn during the voyage by Mr. Hodges and engraved by the most eminent masters. General Introduction Whether the unexplored part of the Southern Hemisphere be only an immense mass of water, or contain another continent, a speculative geography seemed to suggest, was a question which had long engaged the attention, not only of learned men, but of most of the maritime powers of Europe. To put an end to all diversity of opinion about a matter so curious and important was His Majesty's principal motive in directing this voyage to be undertaken the history of which is now submitted to the public. But, in order to give the reader a clear idea of what has been done in it, and to enable him to judge more accurately how far the great object that was proposed has been obtained, it will be necessary to prefix a short account of the several voyages which have been made on discoveries to the southern hemisphere, prior to that which I had lately the honour to conduct and which I am now going to relate. 1519. Magellans. The first who crossed the vast Pacific Ocean was Ferdinand Magellans, a Portuguese who, in the service of Spain, sailed from Seville with five ships on the 10th of April, 1519. He discovered the straits which bear his name, and having passed through them on the 27th of November, 1520, entered the South Pacific Ocean. In this sea he discovered two uninhabited islands whose situations are not well known. He afterwards crossed the line, discovered the Ladrone Islands, and then proceeded to the Philippines, in one of which he was killed in a skirmish with the natives. His ship, called the Victory, was the first that circumnavigated the globe, and the only one of his squadron that surmounted the dangers and distresses which attended this heroic enterprise. The Spaniards, after Magellan's, had showed them the way, made several voyages from America to the westward, previous to that of Alvaro Mandana de Neira, in 1595, which is the first that can be traced step by step, for the antecedent expeditions are not handed down to us with much precision. We know, however, in general that, in them, New Guinea, the islands called Solomons, and several others were discovered. Geographers differ greatly concerning the situation of the Solomon Islands. The most probable opinion is that they are the cluster which comprises what has since been called New Britain, New Ireland, etc. 1595 Mendana on the ninth of April, 1595, Mendana, with intention to settle these islands, sailed from Calau with four ships, and his discoveries in his route to the west were the Marquesas, in the latitude of ten degrees south, the island of San Bernardo, which I take to be the same that Commodore Byron calls the Isle of Danger, after that solitary island, in the latitude of 10 degrees 40 minutes south, longitude 178 degrees west, and lastly, Santa Cruz, which is undoubtedly the same that Captain Cataret 
calls Egmont Island. In this last island, Mendana, with many of his companions, died, and the shattered remains of the squadron were conducted to Manila by Pedro Fernandez de Queros, the chief pilot. 1605. Jueros. This same Jueros was the first sent out, with the sole view of discovering a southern continent, and, indeed, he seems to have been the first who had any idea of the existence of one. He sailed from Calao the 21st of December, 1605, as pilot of the fleet, commanded by Luis Paz de Torres, consisting of two ships and a tender, and steering to the west-south-west on the 26th of January, 1606, being then, by their reckoning, a thousand Spanish leagues from the coast of America. They discovered a small low island in latitude 26 degrees south. Two days after, they discovered another that was high, with a plain on the top. This is probably the same that Captain Catheret calls Pitcairn's Island. After leaving these islands, Juelos seems to have directed his course to west-northwest and northwest, to ten or eleven degrees south latitude, and then westward, till he arrived at the bay of St. Philip and Iago, in the island of Tierra del Espirito Santo. In this route he discovered several islands, probably some of these that have been seen by later navigators. On leaving the bay of St. Philip and St. Iago, the two ships were separated. Jueros, with a capitana, stood to the north, and returned to New Spain, after having suffered greatly for want of provisions and water. Torres, with the Almiranta and the Tender, steered to the west, and seems to have been the first who sailed between New Holland and New Guinea. 1615. La Mer and Schouten. The next attempt to make discoveries in the South Pacific Ocean was conducted by La Mer and Schouten. They sailed from the Texel on the 14th of June, 1615, with the ships Concord and Horn. The latter was burnt by accident in Port Desire. With the other, they discovered the straits that bear the name of Le Maire, and were the first who ever entered the Pacific Ocean by the way of Cape Horn. They discovered the island of Dogs in latitude 15 degrees 15 minutes south, longitude 136 degrees 30 minutes west, Sandra Grant in 15 degrees south latitude and 143 degrees 10 minutes west longitude, Vaterland in 14 degrees 46 minutes south and 144 degrees 10 minutes west, and 25 leagues westward of this, Fly Island in latitude 15 degrees 20 minutes, Traitors and Cocos Islands in latitude 15 degrees 43 minutes south, longitude 173 degrees 13 minutes west, 2 degrees more to the westward, the Isle of Hope, and in the latitude of 14 degrees 56 minutes south, longitude 179 degrees 30 minutes east, Horn Island. They next coasted the north side of New Britain and New Guinea, and arrived at Batavia in October 1616. 1642 Tasman. Except some discoveries on the western and northern coasts of New Holland, no important voyage to the Pacific Ocean was undertaken till 1642, when Captain Tasman sailed from Batavia with two ships belonging to the Dutch East India Company, and discovered Van Diemen's Land, a small part of the western coast of New Zealand, the Friendly Isles, and those called Prince William's. 1594. Sir Richard Hawkins. Thus far, I have thought it best not to interrupt the progress of discovery in the South Pacific Ocean, otherwise I should before have mentioned that Sir Richard Hawkins in 1594, being about fifty leagues to the eastward of the River Plate, was driven by a storm to the eastward of his intended course, and, when the weather grew moderate, steering towards the Straits of Magellan's, he unexpectedly fell in with land, about sixty leagues of which he coasted, and has very particularly described. This he named Hawkins' Maidenland, 
in honour of his royal mistress, Queen Elizabeth, and says it lies some three score leagues from the nearest part of South America. 1689 Strong This land was afterwards discovered to be two large islands by Captain John Strong of the Farewell, from London, who, in 1689, passed through the straits that divides the eastern from the western of those islands. To this strait he gave the name of Falkland Sound, in honour of his patron Lord Falkland, and the name has since been extended, through inadvertency, to the two islands it separates. Having mentioned these islands, I will add, that future navigators will misspend their time if they look for Pepys Island in 47 degrees south, it being now certain that Pepys Island is none other than these islands of Falkland. 1675 La Roche In April 1675, Anthony La Roche, an English merchant, in his return from the South Pacific Ocean, where he had been on a trading voyage, being carried by the winds and currents far to the east of Strait Le Maire, fell in with a coast, which may possibly be the same with that which I visited during this voyage, and have called the island of Georgia. Leaving this land and sailing to the north, La Roche, in the latitude of forty-five degrees south, discovered a large island, with a good port towards the eastern part, where he found wood, water, and fish. 1699 Haley. In 1699 that celebrated astronomer, Dr. Edmund Haley, was appointed to the command of His Majesty's ship, the Paramore Pink, on an expedition for improving the knowledge of the longitude and of the variation of the compass, and for discovering the unknown lands supposed to lie on the southern part of the Atlantic Ocean. In this voyage he determined the longitude of several places, and after his return constructed his variation chart, and proposed a method of observing the longitude at sea by means of the appulses and occultations of the fixed stars. But, though he so successfully attended to the two first articles of instructions, he did not find any unknown southern land. 1721. Rogovine. The Dutch in 1721 fitted out three ships to make discoveries in the South Pacific Ocean, under the command of a Admiral Rogovine. He left the Texel on the 21st of August, and arriving in that ocean, by going round Cape Horn, discovered Easter Island, probably seen before, though not visited by Davis. Footnote. See Vaser's description of the Isthmus of Darien. End footnote. Then, between 14 degrees 41 minutes and 15 degrees 47 minutes south latitude, and between the longitude of 142 degrees and 150 degrees west, fell in with several other islands, which I take to be some of those seen by the later English navigators. He next discovered two islands in latitude 15 degrees south, longitude 170 degrees west, which he calls Bowman's Islands, and lastly, Single Island, in latitude 13 degrees 41 minutes south, longitude 171 degrees 30 minutes west. These three islands are undoubtedly the same that Bougainville calls the Isles of Navigators. 1738. Bouvet. In 1738, the French East India Company sent Lozier Bouvet with two ships, the Eagle and Mary, to make discoveries in the South Atlantic Ocean. He sailed from Port Lorient on the 19th of July in that year, touched at the island of St. Catherine, and from thence shaped his course towards the southeast. On the 1st of January 1739 he discovered land, or what he judged to be land, in latitude 54 degrees south, longitude 11 degrees east. It will appear in the course of the following narrative that we made several attempts to find this land without success. It is therefore very probable that what Bouvet saw was nothing more than a large ice island. From hence he stood to the east in 51 degrees of latitude to 35 degrees of east longitude. 
after which the two ships separated, one going to the island of Mauritius, and the other returning to France. After this voyage of Bavette, the spirit of discovery ceased, till his present majesty formed a design of making discoveries, and exploring the southern hemisphere, and in the year 1764 directed to be put in execution. 1764 Byron. Accordingly, Commodore Byron, having under his command the Dolphin and Tarna, sailed from the Downs on the 21st of June the same year, and having visited the Falkland Islands, passed through the Straits of Magellan's into the Pacific Ocean, where he discovered the islands of Disappointment, George's, Prince of Wales, the Isles of Danger, York Island, and Byron Island. 1766 Wallace he returned to England the ninth of May, 1766, and, in the month of August following, the Dolphin was again sent out under the command of C Captain Wallace, with a swallow, commanded by Captain Catherett. They proceeded together till they came to the west end of the Straits of Magellan's, and the Great South Sea in sight, where they were separated. Captain Wallace directed his course more westerly, than any navigator had done before him in so high a latitude, but met with no land till he got within the tropic, where he discovered the islands of Whitsunday, Queen Charlotte, Egmont, Duke of Gloucester, Duke of Cumberland, Maitia, Otahite, Imeo, Tapamanu, Howe, Scilly, Boscarwen, Keppel, and Wallace, and returned to England in May 1768. Catteret. His companion Captain Catteret kept a different route, in which he discovered the islands of Osnaburg, Gloucester, Queen Charlotte's Isles, Catterets, Gowers, and the strait between New Britain and New Ireland, and returned to England in March 1769. 1766. Bougainville. In November 1766, Commodore Bougainville sailed from France in the frigate La Boudeuse with the storeship L'Etoile. After spending some time on the coast of Brazil and at Falkland Islands, he got into the Pacific Sea by the Straits of Magellan's in January 1768. In this ocean he discovered the four Farcadines, the Isle of Lancias and Harp Island, which I take to be the same that I afterwards called Lagoon, Thrumcap, and Bow Island. About twenty leagues farther to the west he discovered four other islands, afterwards fell in with Maitia, Otaheite, Isles of Navigators, and Forlorn Hope, which to him were new discoveries. He then passed through between the Hebrides, discovered the shoal of Diana, and some others, the land of Cape Deliverance, several islands more to the north, passed the north of New Ireland, touched at Batavia, and arrived in France in March 1769. This year was rendered remarkable by a transit of the planet Venus over the sun's disk, a phenomenon of great importance to astronomy, and which everywhere engaged the attention of the learned in that science. In the beginning of the year 1768, the Royal Society presented a memorial to His Majesty, setting forth the advantages to be derived from accurate observations of this transit in different parts of the world, particularly from a set of such observations made in a southern latitude between the 140th and 130th degrees of longitude, west from the Royal Observatory at Greenwich, and that vessels properly equipped would be necessary to convey the observers to their destined stations, but that the society were in no condition to defray the expense of such an undertaking. In consequence of this memorial, the Ray Admiralty were directed by His Majesty to provide proper vessels for this purpose. Accordingly, the Endeavour Bark, which had been built for the coal trade, was purchased and fitted out for the southern voyage, and I was honoured with the command of her. The Royal Society soon after appointed me, in conjunction with Mr. Charles Greens the astronomer, to make the requisite observations on the transit. 
It was at first intended to form this great, and now a principal business of our voyage, either at the Marquesas, or else at one of those islands which Tasman had called Amsterdam, Rotterdam, and Middleburg, now better known under the name of the Friendly Islands. But while the endeavour was getting ready for the expedition, Captain Wallace returned from his voyage round the world, in the course of which he had discovered several islands in the southern sea, and among others Otaheite. This island was preferred to any of those before mentioned, on account of the conveniences it afforded, because its place had been well ascertained, and found to be extremely well suited to our purpose. I was therefore ordered to proceed directly to Otaheite, and after astronomical observations should be completed, to prosecute the design of making discoveries in the South Pacific Ocean. By proceeding to the south as far as the latitude of forty degrees, then, if I found no land, to proceed to the west between forty degrees and thirty-five degrees, till I fell in with New Zealand, which I was to explore, and thence to return to England, by such route as I should think proper. 1768. Cook's First Voyage. In the prosecution of these instructions, I sailed from Deptford the 30th July, 1768, from Plymouth the 26th of August, touched at Madeira, Rio de Janeiro, and Straits Le Maire, and entered the South Pacific Ocean by Cape Horn in January the following year. I endeavoured to make a direct course to Otaheite, and in part succeeded, but I made no discovery till I got within the tropic, when I fell in with Lagoon Island, two groups, Bird Island, Chain Island, and on the 13th of April arrived at Otaheite, where I remained three months, during which time the observations on the transit were made. I then left it, discovered and visited the Society Islands and Oheteroa, thence proceeded to the south, till I arrived in the latitude of 40 degrees 22 minutes, longitude 147 degrees 29 minutes west, and on the 6th of October fell in with the east side of New Zealand. I continued exploring the coast of this country till the 31st of March 1770, when I quitted it, and proceeded to New Holland, and having surveyed the eastern part of that vast country, which part had not before been visited, I passed between its northern extremity in New Guinea, landed on the latter, touched at the island of Savu, Batavia, the Cape of Good Hope, and St. Helena. Footnote. In the account of given of St. Helena, in the narrative of my former voyage, I find two mistakes. Its inhabitants are far from exercising a wanton cruelty over their slaves, and they have had wheel carriages and porters' knots for many years. End footnote, and arrived in England on the 12th of July, 1771. In this voyage I was accompanied by Mr. Banks and Dr. Solander, the first a gentleman of ample fortune, the other an accomplished disciple of Linnaeus, and one of the librarians of the British Museum. Both of them distinguished in the learned world for their extensive and accurate knowledge of natural history. These gentlemen, animated by the love of science, and by a desire to pursue their inquiries in the remote regions I was preparing to visit, desired permission to make a voyage with me. The Admiralty readily complied with a request that promised such advantage to the Republic of Letters. They accordingly embarked with me, and participated in all the dangers and sufferings of our tedious and fatiguing navigation. The voyages of Messrs. de Serville, Kerguelen, and Marion, of which some account is given in the following work, did not come to my knowledge time enough to afford me any advantage, and as they have not been communicated to the world in a public way, I can say little about them, or about two other voyages which, I am told, have been made by the Spaniards, one to Easter Island in the year 1769, and the other to Otaheite in 1775. End of Introduction Part 1 Introduction Part 2 
of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 1, by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole. Introduction, Part 2. Before I begin my narrative of the expedition entrusted to my care, it will be necessary to add here some account of its equipment, and of some other matters equally interesting, connected with my subject. Soon after my return home in the endeavour, it was resolved to equip two ships to complete the discovery of the southern hemisphere. The nature of this voyage required ships of a particular construction, and the endeavour being gone to Falkland Isles as a store ship, the Navy Board was directed to purchase two such ships as were most suitable for this service. At this time various opinions were espoused by different people, touching the size and kind of vessels most proper for such a voyage. Some were for having large ships, and proposed those of forty guns, or East India Company ships. Others preferred large good sailing frigates, or three-decked ships, employed in the Jamaica trade, fitted with roundhouses. But of all that was said and offered to the Admiralty's consideration on this subject, as far as come to my knowledge, what, in my opinion, was most to the purpose, was suggested by the Navy Board. As the kind of ships most proper to be employed on discoveries is a very interesting consideration to the adventurers in such undertakings, it may possibly be of use to those who, in future, may be so employed, to give here the purport of the sentiments of the Navy Board thereon, with whom, after the experience of two voyages of three years each, I perfectly agree. The success of such undertakings as making discoveries in distant parts of the world will principally depend on the preparations being well adapted to what ought to be the first considerations, namely, the preservation of the adventurers and ships, and this will ever chiefly depend on the kind, the size, and the properties of the ships chosen for the service. These primary considerations will not admit of any other that may interfere with the necessary properties of the ships. Therefore, in choosing the ships, should any of the most advantageous properties be wanting, and the necessary room in them be in any degree diminished for less important purposes, such a step would be laying a foundation for rendering the undertaking abortive in the first instance. As the greatest danger to be apprehended and provided against on a voyage of discovery, especially to the most distant parts of the globe, is that of the ships being liable to be run aground on an unknown, desert, or perhaps savage coast. So no consideration should be set in competition with that of her being of a construction of the safest kind, in which the officers may, with the least hazard, venture upon a strange coast. A ship of this kind must not be of a great draught of water, yet of a sufficient burden and capacity to carry a proper quantity of provisions and necessaries for her complement of men, and for the time requisite to perform the voyage. She must also be of a construction that will bear to take the ground, and of a size which in case of necessity may be safely and conveniently laid on shore to repair any accidental damage or defect. These properties are not to be found in ships of war of forty guns, nor in frigates, nor in East India Company ships, nor in large three-decked West India ships, nor indeed in any other but North Country built ships, or such as are built for the coal trade, which are peculiarly adapted to this purpose. In such a vessel, an able sea officer will be most venturesome, and better enabled to fulfil his instructions than he possibly can, or indeed than would be prudent for him to attempt, in one of any other sort or size. Upon the whole, I am firmly of opinion that no ships are so proper for discoveries in distant unknown parts as those constructed as was the endeavour, in which I performed my former voyage. 
for no ships of any other kind can contain stores and provisions sufficient, in proportion to the necessary number of men, considering the length of time it will be necessary they should last. And even if another kind of ships would stow a sufficiency, yet on arriving at the parts for discovery, they would still, from the nature of their construction and size, be less fit for the purpose. Hence it may be concluded, so little progress had been hitherto made in discoveries in the southern hemisphere, for all ships which attempted it before the endeavour were unfit for it, although the officers employed in them had done the utmost in their power. It was upon this consideration that the endeavour was chosen for that voyage. It was to those properties in her that those on board owed their preservation, and hence we were enabled to prosecute discoveries in those seas so much longer than any other ship ever did or could do. And although discovery was not the first object of that voyage, I could venture to traverse a far greater space of sea, till then unnavigated, to discover greater tracts of country in high and low southern latitude, and to persevere longer in exploring and surveying more correctly the extensive coasts of those newly discovered countries, than any former navigator perhaps had done during one voyage. In short, those properties in the ships, with perseverance and resolution in their commanders, will enable them to execute their orders, to go beyond former discoverers, and to continue to Britain the reputation of taking the lead of nations in exploring the globe. These considerations concurring with Lord Sandwich's opinion on the same subject, the Admiralty determined to have two such ships as are here recommended. Accordingly, two were purchased of Captain William Hammond of Hull. They were both built at Whitby, by the same person who built the Endeavour, being about fourteen or sixteen months old at the time they were purchased, and were, in my opinion, as well adapted to the intended service as if they had been built for the purpose. The largest of the two was four hundred and sixty-two tons burden. She was named Resolution, and sent to Deptford to be equipped. The other was three hundred and thirty-six tons burden. She was named Adventure, and sent to be equipped at Woolwich. It was at first proposed to sheathe them with copper, but on considering that copper corrodes the ironwork, especially about the rudder, this intention was laid aside, and the old method of sheathing and fitting pursued, as being the most secure, for although it was usual to make the rubber bands of the same composition, it was not, however, so durable as iron, nor would it, I am well assured, last out such a voyage as the resolution performed. Therefore, till a remedy is found to prevent the effect of copper upon iron work, it would not be advisable to use it on a voyage of this kind, as the principal fastenings of the ship being iron, they may be destroyed. On the 28th of November, 1771, I was appointed to the command of the resolution, and Tobias Furneaux, who had been second lieutenant with Captain Wallace, was promoted on this occasion to the command of the adventures. Our complements of officers and men were fixed, as in the following table. Resolution. Officers and men. Officers' names. Captain 1. James Cook. Lieutenants 3. Robert P. Cooper. Charles Clerker. Richard Pickersgill. Master 1. Joseph Gilbert. Boatswain 1. James Gray. Carpenter 1. James Wallace. Gunner 1. Robert Anderson. Surgeon 1. James Patton. Master's Mates 3. Midshipman 6. Surgeon's Mates 2. Captain's Clerk 1. Master at Arms 1. Corporal 1. Armourer 1. Armourer's Mate 1. Sailmaker 1. Boatswain's Mate 3. Carpenter's Mate 3. Gunner's Mate 2. Carpenter's Crews 4. Cook 1. Cook's mate, one. Quartermaster, six. 
Able Seaman, 45. Marines. Lieutenant, 1. John Edgecombe. Sergeant, 1. Corporals, 2. Drummer, 1. Privates, 15. Total, 112. Adventure. Officers and men. Officers' names. Captain, 1. Tobias Ferno. Lieutenants, 3. Joseph Shank. Arthur Kemper. Master 1. Peter Fannin. Boatswain 1. Edward Johns. Carpenter 1. William Offord. Gunner 1. Andrew Glogue. Surgeon 1. Thomas Andrews. Master's Mate 2. Midshipman 4. Surgeon's Mates 2. Captain's Clerk 1. Master at Arms 1. Master at Arms Mate 1. Sailmaker 1, Sailmaker's Mate 1, Boatswain's Mate 1, Carpenter's Mate 2, Gunner's Mate 2, Carpenter's Crew's 1, Cook 4, Cook's Mate 1, Quartermaster's 4, Able Seaman 33, Marines, Lieutenant 1, James Scott, Sergeant 1, Corporals 1, Drummer 1, Privates 8. Total 81. I had all the reason in the world to be perfectly satisfied with the choice of the officers. The second and third lieutenants, the lieutenant of marines, two of the warrant officers, and several of the petty officers, had been with me during the former voyage. The others were men of known abilities, and all of them on every occasion showed their zeal for the service in which they were employed during the whole voyage. In the equipping of these ships they were not confined to ordinary establishments, but were fitted in the most complete manner, and supplied with every extra article that was suggested to be necessary. Lord Sandwich paid an extraordinary attention to this equipment, by visiting the ships from time to time, to satisfy himself that the whole was completed to his wish, and to the satisfaction of those who were to embark in them. Nor were the navy and victualling boards wanting in providing them with the very best of stores and provisions, and whatever else was necessary for so long a voyage. Some alterations were adopted in the species of provisions usually made use of in the navy. That is, we were supplied with wheat in lieu of so much oatmeal, and sugar in lieu of so much oil and when completed, each ship had two years and a half provisions on board, of all species. We had besides many extra articles, such as malt, sauerkraut, salted cabbage, portable broth, saloup, mustard, marmalade of carrots, and the inspiciated juice of wort and beer. Some of these articles had before been found to be highly antiscorbutic, and others were now sent out on trial, or by way of experiment. The inspissated juice of beer and wort, and marmalade of carrots especially. As several of these antiscorbutic articles are not generally known, a more particular account of them may not be amiss. Of malt is made sweet wort, which is given to such persons as have got the scurvy, or as whose habit of body threatens them with it from one to five or six pints a day, as the surgeon sees necessary. Sauerkraut is cabbage cut small, to which is put a little salt, juniper berries and anise seeds. It is then fermented and afterwards close-packed in casks, in which state it will keep a good long time. This is a wholesome vegetable food, and a great antiscorbutic. The allowance to each man is two pounds a week, but I increased or diminished their allowance as I thought proper. Salted cabbage is cabbage cut to pieces and salted down in casks, which will preserve it a long time. Portable broth is so well known that it needs no description. We were supplied with it both for the sick and well, and it was exceedingly beneficial. Salute, and rob of lemons and oranges, were for the sick and scorbutic only, and wholly under the surgeon's care. Marmalade of carrots is the juice of yellow carrots, inspissated till it is of the thickness of fluid honey, or treacle, 
which last it resembles both in taste and colour. It was recommended by Baron Storch of Berlin as a very great antiscorbotic, but we did not find that it had much of this quality. For the inspissated juice of wort and beer, we were indebted to Mr. Pelham, secretary to the commissioners of the victualling office. This gentleman, some years ago, considered that if the juice of malt, either as beer or wort, were inspissated by evaporation, it is probable this inspissated juice would keep good at sea, and if so, a supply of beer might be had at any time by mixing it with water. Mr. Pelham made several experiments, which succeeded so well that the commissioners caused thirty-one half-barrels of this juice to be prepared, and sent out with our ships for trial, nineteen on board the Resolution, and the remainder on board the Adventure. The success of these experiments will be mentioned in the narrative, in the order as they were made. The frame of a small vessel, twenty tons burden, was properly prepared and put on board each of the ships to be set up, if found necessary, to serve as tenders upon any emergency, or to transport the crew in case the ship was lost. We were also well provided with fishing nets, lines and hooks of every kind for catching of fish, and in order to enable us to procure refreshments in such inhabited parts of the world as we might touch at, where money was of no value, the Admiralty caused to be put on board both the ships several articles of merchandise, as well to trade with the natives for provisions, as to make them presents to gain their friendship and esteem. Their lordships also caused a number of medals to be struck, the one side representing his majesty and the other to the two ships. These medals were to be given to the natives of new discovered countries, and left there as testimonies of our being the first discoverers. Some additional clothing, adapted to a cold climate, was put on board, to be given to the seamen whenever it was thought necessary. In short, nothing was wanting that could tend to promote the success of the undertaking, or contribute to the conveniences and health of those who embarked in it. The Admiralty showed no less attention to science in general by engaging Mr. William Hodges, a landscape painter, to embark in this voyage, in order to make drawings and paintings of such places in the countries we should touch at, as might be proper to give a more perfect idea thereof, than could be formed from written descriptions only. And it being thought of public utility, that some person skilled in natural history should be engaged to accompany me in this voyage, the Parliament granted an ample sum for the purpose, and Mr. John Reinhold Forster and his son were pitched upon for this employment. The Boyd of Longitude agreed with Mr. William Wales and Mr. William Bailey to make astronomical observations, the former on board the Resolution and the latter on board the Adventure. The great improvements which astronomy and navigation have met with from the many interesting observations they have made, would have done honour to any person whose reputation for mathematical knowledge was not so well known as theirs. The same board furnished them with the best instruments for making both astronomical and nautical observations and experiments, and likewise with four timepieces or watch machines, three made by Mr. Arnold and one made by Mr. Kendall on Mr. Harrison's principles. A particular account of the going of these watches, as also the astronomical and nautical observations made by the astronomers, has been before the public by order of the Board of Longitude under the inspection of Mr. Wales. Besides the obligation I was under to this gentleman for communicating to me the observations he made from time to time during the voyage, I have since been indebted to him for the perusal of his journal, with leave to take from it whatever I thought might contribute to the improvement of this work. For the convenience of the generality of readers, I have reduced the time from the nautical to the civil computations, so that whenever the terms a.m. and p.m. are used, the former signifies the forenoon, 
and the latter the afternoon of the same day. In all the courses, bearings, etc., the variation of the compass is allowed unless the contrary is expressed. And now it may be necessary to say that, as I am on the point of sailing on a third expedition, I leave this account of my last voyage in the hands of some friends who, in my absence, have kindly accepted the office of correcting the press for me, who am pleased to think that what I have here to relate is better to be given in my own words than in the words of another person, especially as it is a work designed for information and not merely for amusement, in which it is their opinion that candour and fidelity will counterbalance the want of ornament. I shall therefore conclude this introductory discourse with desiring the reader to excuse the inaccuracies of style, which doubtless he will frequently meet with in the following narrative, and that, when such occur, he will recollect that it is the production of a man who has not had the advantage of much school education, but who has been constantly at sea from his youth, and though with the assistance of a few good friends he has passed through all the stations belonging to a seaman, from an apprentice boy in the coal trade to a post-captain in the Royal Navy, he has had no opportunity of cultivating letters. After this account of myself, the public must not expect from me the elegance of a fine writer, or the plausibility of a professed bookmaker, but will, I hope, consider me as a plain man, zealously exerting himself in the service of his country, and determined to give the best account he is able of these proceedings. James Cook, Plymouth Sound, July 7th, 1776. End of Introduction, Part 2, Book 1, Chapter 1, Part 1 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 1 by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts. Book 1. From Our Departure from England to Leaving the Society Isles for the First Time. Chapter 1. Passage from Deptford to the Cape of Good Hope, with an account of several incidents that happened by the way, and transactions there. 1772 April. I sailed from Deptford April ninth, 1772, but got no farther than Woolwich, where I was detained by easterly winds till the 23rd, when the ship fell down to Long Reach, and the next day was joined by the adventure. Here both ships received on board their powder, guns, gunner's stores, and marines. 1772 May on the 10th of May we left Long Reach, with orders to touch at Plymouth, but in plying down the river the resolution was found to be very crank, which made it necessary to put into Sheerness in order to remove this evil by making some alteration in her upper works. These the officers of the yard were ordered to take in hand immediately, and Lord Sandwich and Sir Hugh Palliser came down to see them executed in such a manner as might effectually answer the purpose intended. 1772 June. On the 22nd of June, the ship was again completed for sea when I sailed from Sheerness, and on the 3rd of July joined the adventure in Plymouth Sound. The evening before we met off the Sound Lord Sandwich in the Augusta yacht, who was on his return from visiting the several dockyards with the Glory Frigate and Hazard Sloop. We saluted his lordship with seventeen guns, and soon after he and Sir Hugh Palliser gave us the last mark of the very great attention they had paid to this equipment by coming on board to satisfy themselves that everything was done to my wish, and that the ship was found to answer to my satisfaction. At Plymouth I received my instructions, dated the 25th of June, directing me to take under my command the adventure, to make the best of my way to the island of Madeira, there to take in a supply of wine, and then proceed to the Cape of Good Hope, 
where I was to refresh the ship's companies, and take on board such provisions and necessaries as I might stand in need of. After leaving the Cape of Good Hope I was to proceed to the southward, and endeavour to fall in with Cape Circumcision, which was said by Monsieur Bouvet to lie in the latitude of fifty-four south, and in about eleven degrees twenty minutes east longitude from Greenwich. If I discovered this cape, I was to satisfy myself whether it was a part of the continent which had so much engaged the attention of geographers and former navigators, or a part of an island. If it proved to be the former, I was to employ myself diligently in exploring as great an extent of it as I could, and to make such notations thereon, and observations of every kind, as might be useful either to navigation or commerce, or tend to the promotion of natural knowledge. I was also directed to observe the genius, temper, disposition, and number of the inhabitants, if there were any, and endeavour, by all proper means, to cultivate a friendship and alliance with them, making them presents of such things as they might value, inviting them to traffic, and showing them every kind of civility and regard. I was to continue to employ myself on this service, and making discoveries either to the eastward or westward, as my situation might render most eligible, keeping in as high a latitude as I could, and prosecuting my discoveries as near to the South Pole as possible, so long as the condition of the ships, the health of the crews, and the state of their provisions would admit of, taking care to reserve as much of the latter as would enable me to reach some known port, where I was to procure a sufficiency to bring me home to England. But if Cape Circumcision should prove to be part of an island only, or if I should not be able to find the said Cape, I was in the first case to make the necessary survey of the island, and then to stand on to the southward, so long as I judged there was a likelihood of falling in with the continent, which I was also to do in the latter case, and then to proceed to the eastward in further search of the said continent, as well as to make discoveries of such islands as might be situated in that unexplored part of the southern hemisphere, keeping in higher latitudes, and prosecuting my discoveries as above mentioned, as near to the pole as possible, until I had circumnavigated the globe, after which I was to proceed to the Cape of Good Hope, and from thence to Spithead. In the prosecution of these discoveries, wherever the season of the year rendered it unsafe for me to continue in high latitudes, I was to retire to some known place to the northward to refresh my people and refit the ships, and to return again to the southward as soon as the season of the year would admit of it. In all unforeseen cases I was authorised to proceed according to my own discretion, and in case the resolution should be lost or disabled, I was to prosecute the voyage on board the adventure. I gave a copy of these instructions to Captain Furneaux, with an order directing him to carry them into execution, and in case he was separated from me, appointed the island of Madeira for the first place of rendezvous, Port Praia in the island of St. Iago for the second, Cape of Good Hope for the third, and New Zealand for the fourth. During our stay at Plymouth, Messrs. Wales and Bailey, the two astronomers, made observations on Drake's Island, in order to ascertain the latitude, longitude, and true time, for putting the timepieces and watches in motion. The latitude was found to be 50 degrees 21 minutes 30 seconds north, and the longitude 4 degrees 20 minutes west of Greenwich, which in this voyage is everywhere to be understood as the first meridian, and from which the longitude is reckoned east and west to 180 degrees each way. 1772 July On the 10th of July the watches were set a-going in the presence of the two astronomers, Captain Furneaux, the first lieutenants of the ships, and myself, and put on board. The two on board the adventure were made by Mr. Arnold, and also one of those on board the Resolution, but the other was made by Mr. Kendall upon the same principle in every respect as Mr. Harrison's timepiece, 
the commander, first lieutenant, and astronomer, on board each of the ships, kept each of them keys of the boxes which contained the watches, and were always to be present at the winding them up, and comparing the one with the other, or some other officer, if at any time through indisposition, or absence upon any other necessary duties, any of them could not conveniently attend. The same day, according to the custom of the navy, the companies of both ships were paid two months' wages in advance, and, as a further encouragement of their going this extraordinary voyage, they were also paid the wages due to them to the 28th of the preceding May. This enabled them to provide necessaries for the voyage. On the 13th, at six o'clock in the morning, I sailed for Plymouth Sound, with the adventure in company, and on the evening of the 29th anchored in Funciale Road, in the island of Madeira. The next morning I saluted the garrison with eleven guns, which compliment was immediately returned. Soon after I went on shore, accompanied by Captain Furneaux, the two Mr. Forsters, and Mr. Wales. At our landing we were received by a gentleman from the vice-consul, Mr. Sills, who conducted us to the house of Mr. Lufnans, the most considerable English merchant in the place. This gentleman not only obtained leave for Mr. Forster to search the island for plants, but procured us every other thing we wanted, and insisted on our accommodating ourselves at his house during our stay. The town of Funciale, which is the capital of the island, is situated about the middle of the south side, in the bottom of the bay of the same name, in latitude 32 degrees 33 minutes 34 seconds north, longitude 17 degrees 12 and 7 eighths seconds west. The longitude was deduced from lunar observations made by Mr. Wales, and reduced to the town by Mr. Kendall's watch, which made the longitude 17 degrees 10 minutes 14 seconds west. During our stay here, the crews of both ships were supplied with fresh beef and onions, and a quantity of the latter was distributed among them for a sea store. 1772 August. Having got on board a supply of water, wine, and other necessaries, we left Madeira on the 1st of August, and stood to the southward with a fine gale at northeast. On the 4th we passed Parma, one of the Canary Isles. It is of a height to be seen twelve or fourteen leagues, and lies in the latitude twenty-eight degrees thirty-eight minutes north, longitude seventeen degrees fifty-eight minutes west. The next day we saw the Isle of Ferro, and passed it at a distance of fourteen leagues. I judged it to lie in the latitude of twenty-seven degrees forty-two minutes north, and longitude eighteen degrees nine minutes west. I now made three puncheons of beer of the inspissated juice of malt. The proportion I made use of was about ten of water to one of juice. Fifteen of the nineteen half-barrels of the inspissated juice, which we had on board, were produced from wort that was hopped before inspissated. The other four were made of beer that had been both hopped and fermented before inspissated. This last requires no other preparation to make it fit for use than to mix it with cold water, from one part in eight to one part in twelve of water, or in such other proportion as might be liked, then stop it down, and in a few days it will be brisk and drinkable. But the other sort, after being mixed with water in the same manner, will require to be fermented with yeast, in the usual way of making beer. At least it was so thought. However, experience taught us that this will not always be necessary, for by the heat of the weather and the agitation of the ship, both sorts were at this time in the highest state of fermentation, and had hitherto evaded all our endeavours to stop it. If this juice could be kept from fermenting, it certainly would be a most valuable article at sea. On finding that our stock of water would not last as to the Cape of Good Hope, without putting the people to a scanty allowance, I resolved to stop at St. Iago for a supply. On the ninth, at nine o'clock in the morning, 
we made the island of Bonavista, bearing southwest. The next day we passed the Isle of Mayo on the right, and the same evening anchored in Port Praia, in the island of St. Iago, in eighteen fathoms water. The east point of the bay bore east, the west point southwest a half south, and the fort northwest. I immediately dispatched an officer to ask leave to water, and purchase refreshments, which was granted. On the return of the officer I saluted the fort with eleven guns, on the promise of its being returned with an equal number. But by a mistake as they pretended, the salute was returned with only nine, for which the governor made an excuse the next day. The fourteenth in the evening, having completed our water, and got on board a supply of refreshments, such as hogs, goats, fowls, and fruit, we put to sea and proceeded on our voyage. Port Praia is in a small bay, situated about the middle of the south side of the island of St. Iago, in the latitude of 14 degrees 53 minutes 30 seconds north, longitude 23 degrees 30 minutes west. It may be known, especially in coming from the east, by the southernmost hill on the island, which is round and peaked at top, and lies a little way inland, in the direction of west from the port. This mark is the more necessary, as there is a small cove about a league to the eastward, with a sandy beach in the bottom of it, a valley and coconut trees behind, which strangers may mistake for Port Praia, as we ourselves did. The two points which form the entrance of Port Praia Bay are rather low, and in the direction of west-south-west and east-north-east, half a league from each other. Close to the west point are sunken rocks, on which the sea continually breaks. The bay lies in north-west near half a league, and the depth of water is from fourteen to four fathoms. Large ships ought not to anchor in less than eight, in which depth the south end of the green island, a small island lying under the west shore, will bear west. You water at a well that is behind the beach at the head of the bay. The water is tolerable but scarce, and bad getting off, on account of a great surf on the beach. The refreshments to be got here are bullocks, hogs, goat, sheep, poultry, and fruits. The goats are of the antelope kind, so extraordinarily lean that hardly anything can equal them, and the bullocks, hogs, and sheep are not much better. Bullocks must be purchased with money. The price is twelve Spanish dollars a head, weighing between two fifty and three hundred pounds. Other articles may be got from the natives in exchange for old clothes, etc. But the sale of bullocks is confined to a company of merchants to whom this privilege is granted, and who keep an agent residing upon the spot. The fort above mentioned seems wholly designed for the protection of the bay, and is well situated for that purpose, being built on an elevation which rises directly from the sea on the right at the head of the bay. We had no sooner got clear of Port Praia than we got a fresh gale at north-north-east, which blew in squalls, attended with showers of rain. But the next day the wind and showers abated and veered to the south. It was, however, variable and unsettled for several days, accompanied with dark gloomy weather and showers of rain. On the 19th in the afternoon, one of the carpenter's mates fell overboard and was drowned. He was over the side, fitting in one of the scuttles, from whence it is supposed he had fallen, for he was not seen till the very instant he sunk under the ship's stern, when our endeavours to save him were too late. This loss was sensibly felt during the voyage, as he was a sober man and a good workman. About noon the next day the rain poured down upon us, not in drops but in streams. The wind at the same time was variable and squally, which obliged the people to attend the decks, so that few in the ships escaped a good soaking. We, however, benefited by it, as it gave us an opportunity of filling all our empty water casks. This heavy rain at last brought on a dead calm, which continued twenty-four hours, when it was succeeded by a breeze from south-west 
betwixt this point and south. It continued for several days, and blew at times in squalls, attended with rain and hot sultry weather. The mercury in the thermometers at noon kept generally from 79 to 82. On the 27th spoke with Captain Furneaux, who informed us that one of his petty officers was dead. At this time we had not one sick on board, although we had everything of this kind to fear from the rain we had had, which is a great promoter of sickness in hot climates. To prevent this, and agreeable to some hints I had from Sir Hugh Palliser and from Captain Campbell, I took every necessary precaution by airing and drying the ship, with fires made betwixt decks, smoking, etc., and by obliging the people to air their bedding, wash and dry their clothes, whenever there was an opportunity. A neglect of these things causeth a disagreeable smell below, affects the air, and seldom fails to bring on sickness, but more especially in hot and wet weather. We now began to see some of those birds which are said never to fly far from land, that is, man-o'-war and tropic birds, gannets, etc. No land, however, that we knew of, could be nearer than eighty leagues. On the thirtieth at noon, being in the latitude of two degrees thirty-five minutes north, longitude seven degrees thirty minutes west, and the wind having veered to the east of south, we tacked and stretched to the southwest. In the latitude of zero degrees fifty-two minutes north, longitude nine degrees twenty-five minutes west, we had one calm day, which gave us an opportunity of trying the current in a boat. We found it set to the north, one-third of a mile an hour. We had reason to expect this, from the difference we frequently found between the observed latitude and that given by the log, and Mr. Kendall's watch showed us that it was set to the east also. This was fully confirmed by the lunar observations, when it appeared that we were three degrees zero minutes more to the east than the common reckoning. At the time of trying the current, the mercury in the thermometer in the open air stood at seventy-five and a half and when immersed in the surface of the sea at seventy-four, but when immersed eighty fathoms deep, where it remained fifteen minutes, when it came up, the mercury stood at sixty-six. At the same time we sounded, without our finding the bottom, with a line of two hundred and fifty fathoms. The calm was succeeded by a light breeze at south-west, which kept veering by little and little to the south, and at last to the eastward of south, attended with clear, serene weather. End of Book One, Chapter One, Part One. Book One, Chapter One, Part Two of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume One by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts. Chapter 1. Passage from Deptford to the Cape of Good Hope. Part 2. 1772, September. At length, on the 8th of September, we crossed the line in the longitude of 8 degrees west, after which the ceremony of ducking, etc., generally practised on this occasion, was not omitted. The wind now veering more and more to the east, and blowing a gentle top-gallant gale, in eight days it carried us into the latitude nine degrees thirty minutes south, longitude eighteen degrees west. The weather was pleasant, and we daily saw some of those birds which are looked upon as signs of the vicinity of land, such as boobies, man-of-war, tropic birds, and gannets, we supposed they came from the Isle of St. Matthew or Ascension, which isles we must have passed at no great distance. On the 27th, in the latitude of 25 degrees 29 minutes, longitude 24 degrees 54 minutes, we discovered a sail to the west standing after us. She was a snow, and the colours she showed, either a Portuguese or St. George's ensign, 
the distance being too great to distinguish the one from the other, and I did not choose to wait to get nearer, or to speak with her. The wind now began to be variable. It first veered to the north, where it remained two days with fair weather. Afterwards it came round by the west to the south, where it remained two days longer, and, after a few hours' calm, sprung up at south-west. But here it remained not long, before it veered to south-south-east, and to the north of east, blew fresh and by squalls, with showers of rain. 1772 October With these winds we advanced but slowly, and, without meeting with anything remarkable, till the 11th of October, when, at six hours twenty-four minutes twelve seconds, by Mr. Kendall's watch, the moon rose about four digits eclipsed, and soon after we prepared to observe the end of the eclipse as follows. By me, at six hours fifty-three minutes fifty-one seconds, with a common refractor. By Mr. Forster, six hours fifty-five minutes twenty-three seconds. By Mr. Wales, six hours fifty-four minutes fifty-seven seconds, quadrant telescope. By Mr. Pickersgill, six hours fifty-five minutes thirty seconds, three feet refractor. By Mr. Gillett, six hours fifty-three minutes twenty-four seconds, naked eye. By Mr. Hervey, six hours fifty-five minutes thirty-four seconds, quadrant telescope. Mean, six hours fifty-four minutes forty-six and a half seconds by the watch. Watch slow of apparent time, three minutes fifty-nine seconds. Apparent time, six hours fifty-eight minutes forty-five and a half seconds, end of the eclipse. Ditto, seven hours twenty-five minutes zero seconds at Greenwich. Difference of longitude. Zero hours twenty-six minutes fourteen and a half seconds equivalent to six degrees thirty three minutes thirty seconds of longitude the longitude observed by mr wales was by the moon and aquilae five degrees fifty one minutes by the moon and aldebaran six degrees thirty five minutes mean six degrees thirteen minutes zero seconds by Mr. Kendall's watch, six degrees, fifty-three, seven-eighths minutes. The next morning, having but little wind, we hoisted a boat out, to try if there was any current, but found none. From this time to the sixteenth, we had the wind between the north and east, a gentle gale. We had for some time ceased to see any of the birds before mentioned, and were now accompanied by albatrosses, pintados, shearwaters, etc., and a small gay petrel, less than a pigeon. It had a whitish belly and grey back, with a black stroke across from the tip of one wing to the tip of the other. These birds sometimes visited us in great flights. They are, as well as the pinteros, southern birds, and are, I believe, never seen within the tropics or north of the lion. On the 17th we saw a sail to the northwest, standing to the eastward, which hoisted Dutch colours. She kept us company for two days, but the third we outsailed her. On the 21st, at 7 hours 30 minutes, 20 seconds, a.m., our longitude, by the mean of two observed distances of the sun and moon, was 8 degrees 4 minutes 30 seconds east. Mr. Kendall's watch at the same time gave seven degrees twenty-two minutes. Our latitude was thirty-five degrees twenty seconds north. The wind was now easterly, and continued on till the twenty-third, when it veered to the north and northwest, after some hours' calm, in which we put a boat in the water, and Mr. Forster shot some albatrosses and other birds, on which we feasted the next day, and found them exceedingly good. At the same time we saw a seal, or, as some thought, a sea-lion, which probably might be an inhabitant of one of the isles of Tristan de Cunha. 
being now nearly in their latitude and about five degrees east of them. The wind continued but two days at northwest and southwest, then veered to the southeast, where it remained two days longer, then fixed at northwest, which carried us to our intended port. As we approached the land, the sea fowl, which had accompanied us hitherto, began to leave us. At least they did not come in such numbers. Nor did we see gannets, or the black bird, commonly called the Cape Hen, till we were nearly within sight of the Cape. Nor did we strike sounding until Penguin Island bore north-north-east, distant two or three leagues, where we had fifty fathom water not but that the soundings might extend farther off. However, I am very sure that they do not extend very far west from the Cape, for we could not find ground with a line of 210 fathoms, 25 leagues west of Table Bay, the same at 35 leagues and at 64 leagues. I sounded these three times in order to find a bank, which I had been told, lies to the west of the Cape, but how far I never could learn. I was told before I left England, by some gentlemen who were well enough acquainted with the navigation between England and the Cape of Good Hope, that we sailed at an improper season of the year, and that I should meet with much calm weather near and under the line. This probably may be the case some years. It is, however, not general. On the contrary, we hardly met with any calms, but a brisk south-west wind in those very latitudes where the calms were expected. Nor did we meet with any of those tornadoes so much spoken of by other navigators. However, what they have said of the current setting towards the coast of Guinea, as you approach that shore, is true. For, from the time of our leaving St. Iago, to our arrival in the latitude of one and a half degrees north, which was eleven days, we were carried by the current three degrees of longitude more east than our reckoning. On the other hand, after we had crossed the line and got to the southeast trade wind, we always found by observation that the ship outstripped the reckoning, which we judged to be owing to a current setting between the south and west but on the whole the currents in this run seem to balance each other, for upon our arrival at the Cape the difference of longitude by dead reckoning kept from England, without once being corrected, was only three-quarters of a degree less than that by observation. At two in the afternoon on the twenty-ninth we made the land of the Cape of Good Hope. The Table Mountain, which is over the Cape Town, bore east-south-east, distance twelve or fourteen leagues. At this time it was a good deal obscured by clouds, otherwise it might, from its height, have been seen at a much greater distance. We now crowded all the sail we could, thinking to get into the bay before dark, but when we found this could not be accomplished, we shortened sail, and spent the night standing off and on, between eight and nine o'clock, the whole sea, within the compass of our sight, became at once, as it were, illuminated, or what the seamen call, all on fire. This appearance of the sea, in some degree, is very common, but the cause is not so generally known. Mr. Banks and Dr. Solander had satisfied me it was occasioned by sea insects. Mr. Forster, however, seem not to favour this opinion. I therefore had some buckets of water drawn up from alongside the ship, which we found full of an innumerable quantity of small globular insects, about the size of a common pin's head, and quite transparent. There was no doubt of their being living animals when in their own proper element, though we could not perceive any life in them. Mr. Forster, whose province it is, more minutely to describe things of this nature, was now well satisfied with the cause of the sea's illumination. At length daylight came and brought us fair weather, and having stood into Table Bay with the adventure in company, we anchored in five fathom water. 
We afterwards moored northeast and southwest, Green Point on the west point of the bay, bearing northwest by west, and the church, in one with the valley between the Table Mountain and the Sugar Loaf, or Lion's Head, bearing southwest by south and distant from the landing-place near the fort, one mile. We had no sooner anchored than we were visited by the captain of the port, or master attendant, some other officers belonging to the company, and Mr. Brandt. This last gentleman brought us off such things as could not fail of being acceptable to persons coming from sea. The purport of the master attendant's visit was, according to custom, to take an account of the ships, to inquire into the health of the crews, and in particular if the smallpox was on board, a thing they dread above all others at the Cape, and for these purposes a surgeon is always one of the visitants. My first step after anchoring was to send an officer to wait on Baron Plattenberg, the governor, to acquaint him with our arrival and the reasons which induced me to put in there. To this the officer received a very polite answer, and upon his return we saluted the garrison with eleven guns, which compliment was returned. Soon after I went on shore myself, and waited upon the governor, accompanied by Captain Furneaux and the two Mr. Forsters. He received us with very great politeness, and promised me every assistance the place could afford. From him I learned that two French ships from the Mauritius, about eight months before, had discovered land in the latitude of forty-eight degrees south, and in the meridian of that island, along which they sailed forty miles, till they came to a bay in which they were about to enter, when they were driven off and separated in a hard gale of wind after having lost some of their boats and people, which they had sent to sound the bay. One of the ships, viz. La Fortune, soon after arrived at the Mauritius, the captain of which was sent home to France with an account of the discovery. The governor also informed me that in March last two other French ships from the island of Mauritius touched at the Cape in their way to the South Pacific Ocean, where they were going to make discoveries, under the command of Monsieur Marion. Aituro, the man Monsieur de Bougainville brought from Otaheite, was to have returned with Monsieur Marion, had he been living. After having visited the governor and some other principal persons of the place, we fixed ourselves at Mr. Brandt's, the usual residence of most officers belonging to English ships. This gentleman spares neither trouble nor expense to make his home agreeable to those who favour him with their company, and to accommodate them with everything they want. With him I concerted measures for supplying the ships with provisions, and all other necessaries they wanted, which he set about procuring without delay, while the seamen on board were employed in overhauling the rigging and the carpenters in caulking the ship's sides and decks, etc. Messrs. Wales and Bailey got all their instruments on shore in order to make astronomical observations for ascertaining the going of the watches and other purposes. The results of some of these observations showed that Mr. Kendall's watch had answered beyond all expectations by pointing out the longitude of this place to within one minute of time to what it was observed by Messrs. Mason and Dixon in 1761. Three or four days after us, two Dutch Indiamen arrived here from Holland, after a passage of between four and five months, in which one lost, by the scurvy and other putrid diseases, a hundred and fifty men, and the other forty-one. They sent, on their arrival, great numbers to the hospital in very dreadful circumstances. It is remarkable that one of these ships touched at Port Praya, and left it a month before we arrived there, and yet we got here three days before her. The Dutch at the Cape, having found their hospital too small for the reception of their sick, 
were going to build a new one at the east part of the town, the foundation of which was laid with great ceremony while we were there. 1772 November By the healthy condition of the crews of both ships at our arrival, I thought to have made my stay at the Cape very short. But as the bread we wanted was unbaked, and the spirit, which I found scarce, to be collected from different parts out of the country, it was the 18th of November, before we had got everything on board, and the 22nd before we could put to sea. During this day the crews of both ships were served every day with fresh beef or mutton, new-baked bread, and as much greens as they could eat. The ships were corked and painted, and in every respect put in as good a condition as when they left England. Some alterations in the officers took place in the adventure. Mr. Shank, the first lieutenant, having been in an ill state of health ever since we sailed from Plymouth, and not finding himself recovering here, desired my leave to quit, in order to return home for the re-establishment of his health. As his request appeared to be well founded, I granted him leave accordingly, and appointed Mr. Kemp, first lieutenant in his room, and Mr. Burney, one of my midshipmen, second in the room of Mr. Kemp. Mr. Forster, whose whole time was taken up in the pursuit of natural history and botany, met with a Swedish gentleman, one Mr. Sparman, who understood something of these sciences, having studied under Dr. Linnaeus. He being willing to embark with us, Mr. Forster strongly importuned me to take him on board, thinking he would be of great assistance to him in the course of the voyage. I at last consented, and he embarked with us accordingly, as an assistant to Mr. Forster, who bore his expenses on board, and allowed him a yearly stipend besides. Mr. Hodges employed himself here in drawing a view of the Cape Town, and parts adjacent, in oil colours, which, was properly packed up with some others, and left with Mr. Brandt, in order to be forwarded to the Admiralty, by the first ship that should sail for England. End of chapter 1, part 2 Book 1, chapter 2, part 1 Of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World Volume 1 by James Cook this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts. Chapter 2. Departure from the Cape of Good Hope in Search of a Southern Continent. 1772, November. Having at length finished my business at the Cape, and taken leave of the Governor and some others of the Chief Officers, who, with very obliging readiness, had given me all the assistance I could desire, on the 22nd of November we repaired on board, and at three o'clock in the afternoon weighed, and came to sail with the wind at north by west. As soon as the anchor was up, we saluted the port with fifteen guns, which was immediately returned, and after making a few trips, got out of the bay by seven o'clock, at which time the town bore south-east, distant four miles. After this we stood to the westward all night, in order to get clear of the land, having the wind at north-north-west and north-west, blowing in squalls attended with rain, which obliged us to reef our topsails. The sea was again illuminated for some time, in the same manner as it was the night before we arrived in Table Bay. Having got clear of the land, I directed my course for Cape Circumcision. The wind continued at northwest a moderate gale until the 24th, when it veered round to the eastward. On the noon of this day, we were in the latitude of 35 degrees 25 minutes south, and 29 minutes west of the Cape, and had abundance of albatrosses about us, several of which were caught with hook and line and were very well relished by many of the people, notwithstanding they were at this time served with fresh mutton. Judging that we should soon come into cold weather, I ordered slops to be served to such as were in want, and gave each man 
the fear-nought jacket and trousers allowed them by the Admiralty. 1772 December The wind continued easterly for two days and blew a moderate gale, which brought us into the latitude of thirty-nine degrees four minutes and two degrees of longitude west of the Cape. Thermometer fifty-two and a half. The wind now came to west and southwest, and on the twenty-ninth fixed at west-northwest, and increased to a storm, which continued with some few intervals of moderate weather, till the sixth of December, when we were in the latitude of forty-eight degrees forty-one minutes south, and longitude eighteen degrees twenty-four minutes east. This gale, which was attended with rain and hail, blew at times with such violence that we could carry no sails, by which means we were driven far to the eastward of our intended course, and no hopes were left me of reaching Cape Circumcision. But the greatest misfortune that attended us was the loss of a great part of our livestock, which we had brought from the Cape, and which consisted of sheep, hogs, and geese. Indeed, this sudden transition from warm, mild weather to extreme cold and wet, made every man in the ship feel its effects. For by this time the mercury in the thermometer had fallen to thirty-eight, whereas at the Cape it was generally at sixty-seven and upwards. I now made some addition to the people's allowance of spirit, by giving them a dram whenever I thought it necessary, and ordered Captain Furneaux to do the same. The night proved clear and serene, and the only one that was so since we left the Cape, and the next morning the rising sun gave us such flattering hopes of a fine day, that we were induced to let all the reefs out of the topsails, and to get topgallant yards across, in order to make the most of a fresh gale at north. Our hopes, however, soon vanished, for before eight o'clock the serenity of the sky was changed into a thick haze, accompanied with rain. The gale increasing obliged us to hand the mainsail, close reef our topsails, and to strike topgallant yards. The barometer at this time was unusually low, which foreboded an approaching storm, and this happened accordingly. For, by one o'clock p.m., the wind, which was at northwest, blew with such strength as obliged us to take in all our sails, to strike topgallant masts, and to get the spirit sail yard in, and I thought proper to wear and lie to, under a mizzen stay sail, with the ship's heads to the northeast, as they would bow the sea, which ran prodigiously high, better on this tack. At eight o'clock next morning, being the eighth, we wore and lay on the other tack. The gale was a little abated, but the sea ran too high to make sail any more than the fore topmast staysail. In the evening, being in the latitude of forty-nine degrees forty minutes south, and one and a half degrees east of the Cape, we saw two penguins and some sea or rockweed, which occasioned us to sound, without finding ground at one hundred fathoms. At eight p.m. we wore, and lay with our heads to the northeast till three in the morning of the ninth, then wore again to the southward, the wind blowing in squalls accompanied with showers of snow. At eight, being something more moderate, I made the adventure signal to make sail, and soon after made sail ourselves under the courses and close-reefed topsails. In the evening took in the topsails and mainsail, and brought to under foresail and mizzen, thermometer at thirty-six degrees. The wind still at northwest blew a fresh gale, accompanied with a very high sea. In the night we had a pretty smart frost with snow. In the morning of the tenth we made sail under courses and topsails close reefed, and made the signal for the adventure to make sail and lead. At eight o'clock saw an island of ice to the westward of us, being then in the latitude of fifty-six degrees forty minutes south and longitude two degrees zero minutes east of the Cape of Good Hope. Soon after the wind moderated, and we let all the reefs out of the topsails, got the spirit sail yard out, and topgallant mast up. The weather coming hazy, 
I called the adventure by signal under my stern, which was no sooner done than the haze increased so much with snow and sleet that we did not see an island of ice which we were steering directly for, till we were less than a mile from it. I judged it to be about fifty feet high and half a mile in circuit. It was flat on top, and its sides rose in a perpendicular direction, against which the seas broke exceedingly high. Captain Furneaux at first took this ice for land, and hauled off from it, until called back by signal. As the weather was foggy, it was necessary to proceed with caution. We therefore reefed our topsails, and at the same time sounded, but found no ground with a hundred and fifty fathoms. We kept on with, to the southward, with the wind at north till night, which we spent in making short trips, first one way and then another, under an easy sail. Thermometer these twenty-four hours from thirty-six and a half to thirty-one. At daylight in the morning of the eleventh, we made sail to the southward with the wind at west, having a fresh gale attended with sleet and snow. At noon we were in the latitude of fifty-one degrees fifty minutes south, and longitude twenty-one degrees three minutes east, where we saw some white birds about the size of pigeons, with blackish bills and feet. I never saw any such before, and Mr. Forster had no knowledge of them. I believe them to be of the petrel tribe, and natives of these icy seas. At this time we passed between two ice islands, which lay at a little distance from each other. In the night the wind veered to north-west, which enabled us to see a south-west. On the twelfth we had still thick hazy weather, with sleet and snow, so that we were obliged to proceed with great caution on account of the ice islands. Six of these we passed this day, some of them near two miles in circuit and sixty feet high. And yet such was the force and height of the waves, that the sea broke quite over them. This exhibited a view which for a few moments was pleasing to the eye, but when we reflected on the danger, the mind was filled with horror. For were a ship to get against the weather side of one of these islands, when the sea runs high, she would be dashed to pieces in a moment. Upon our getting among the ice islands, the albatrosses left us, that is, we saw but one now and then. Nor did our other companions, the pintadoes, sheer waters, small grey birds, fulmars, etc., appear in such numbers. On the other hand, penguins began to make their appearance. Two of these birds were seen to-day. The wind in the night veered to west, and at last fixed at southwest. a fresh gale with sleet and snow, which froze on our sails and rigging as it fell, so that they were all hung with icicles. We kept on to the southward, passed no less than eighteen ice islands, and saw more penguins. At noon on the 13th, we were in the latitude of 54 degrees south, which is the latitude of Cape Circumcision, discovered by Monsieur Bouvet in 1739, but we were 10 degrees of longitude east of it, that is near 118 leagues in this latitude. We stood on to the south-south-east till 8 o'clock in the evening, the weather still continuing thick and hazy, with sleet and snow. From noon till this time, twenty ice islands, of various extent, both for height and circuit, presented themselves to our view. At eight o'clock we sounded, but found no ground with a hundred and fifty fathom of line. We now tacked and made a trip to the northward till midnight, when we stood again to the southward, and at half an hour past six in the morning of the fourteenth, we were stopped by an immense field of low ice, to which we could see no end, either to the east, west, or south. In different parts of this field were islands or hills of ice, like those we found floating in the sea, and some on board thought they saw land also over the ice, bearing south-west by south. I even thought so myself, but changed my opinion 
upon more narrowly examining these ice hills and the various appearances they made when seen through the haze for at this time it was both hazy and cloudy in the horizon, so that a distant object could not be seen distinct. Being now in the latitude of 54 degrees 50 minutes south, and longitude 21 degrees 34 minutes east, and having the wind at northwest, we bore away along the edge of the ice, steering south-south-east and south-east, according to the direction of the north side of it, where we saw many whales, penguins, some white birds, pindados, etc. At eight o'clock we brought to under a point of the ice, where we had smooth water, and I sent on board for Captain Furneaux. After we had fixed on rendezvous, in case of separation, and some other matters for the better keeping company, he returned on board, and we made sail again along the ice. Some pieces we took up alongside, which yielded fresh water. At noon we had a good observation, and found ourselves in latitude 54 degrees 55 minutes south. We continued a south-east course along the edge of the ice till one o'clock, when we came to a point round which we hauled south-south-west, the sea appearing to be clear of ice in that direction. But after running four leagues upon this course, with the ice on our starboard side, we found ourselves quite embayed, the ice extending from north-north-east, round by the west and south to east, in one compact body. The weather was indifferently clear, and yet we could see no end to it. At five o'clock we hauled up east, wind at north, a gentle gale, in order to clear the ice. The extreme east point of it at eight o'clock bore east by south, over which appeared a clear sea. We, however, spent the night in making short boards under an easy sail, thermometer these twenty-four hours, from thirty-two to thirty. Next day, the fifteenth, we had the wind at northwest, a small gale, thick foggy weather with much snow, thermometer from thirty-two to twenty-seven, so that our sails and rigging were all hung with icicles. The fog was so thick at times that we could not see the length of the ship, and we had much difficulty to avoid the many islands of ice that surrounded us. About noon, having but little wind, we hoisted out a boat to try the current, which we found set southeast near three-quarters of a mile an hour. At the same time a thermometer which in the open air was at thirty-two degrees, in the surface of the sea was at thirty degrees, and after being emerged one hundred fathoms deep for about fifteen to or twenty minutes, came up at thirty-four degrees, which is only two degrees above freezing. Our latitude at this time was fifty-five degrees eight minutes. The thick fog continued till two o'clock in the afternoon of the next day, when it cleared away a little, and we made sail to the southward, wind still at northwest, a gentle gale. We had not run long to the southward, before we fell in with a main field of ice, extending from south-southwest to east. We now bore away to east along the edge of it, but at night hauled off north, with the wind at west-northwest, a gentle gale attended with snow. At four in the morning on the seventeenth, stood again to the south, but was again obliged to bear up on account of the ice, along the side of which we steered betwixt east and south-south-west, hauling into every bay or opening, in hopes of finding a passage to the south, but we found everywhere the ice closed. We had a gentle gale at north-west, with showers of snow. At noon we were by observation in the latitude of fifty-five degrees sixteen minutes south. In the evening the weather was clear and serene. In the course of this day we saw many whales, one seal, penguins, some of the white birds, another sort of petrel, which is brown and white, and not much unlike a pintado, and some other sorts already known. 
we found the skirts of the loose ice to be more broken than usual, and it extended some distance beyond the main field, insomuch that we sailed amongst it the most part of the day, and the high ice islands without us were innumerable. At eight o'clock we sounded, but found no ground with two hundred and fifty fathoms of line. After this we hauled close upon a wind to the northward, as we could see the field of ice extend as far as northeast. But this happened not to be the northern point, for at eleven o'clock we were obliged to tack to avoid it. At two o'clock the next morning we stood again to the northward, with the wind at north-west by west, thinking to weather the ice upon this tack, on which we stood but two hours, before we found ourselves quite embayed, being then in latitude fifty-five degrees eight minutes, longitude twenty-four degrees three minutes. The wind veering more to the north, we tacked and stood to the westward, under all the sail we could carry, having a fresh breeze and clear weather, which last was of short duration. For at six o'clock it became hazy, and soon after there was thick fog. The wind veered to the northeast, freshened and brought with it snow and sleet, which froze on the rigging as it fell. We were now enabled to get clear of the field of ice, but at the same time we were carried in amongst the ice islands, in a manner equally dangerous, and which, with much difficulty, we kept clear of. Dangerous as it is to sail among these floating rocks, if I may be allowed to call them so, in a thick fog, this, however, is preferable to being entangled with immense fields of ice under the same circumstances. The great danger to be apprehended in the latter case is the getting fast in the ice, a situation which would be extremely alarming. I had two men on board that had been in the Greenland trade, the one of them in a ship that lay nine weeks, and the other in one that lay six weeks, fast in this kind of ice, which they called packed ice. What they called field ice is thicker, and the whole field, be it ever so large, consists of one piece. Whereas this which I call field ice, from its immense extent, consists of many pieces of various sizes, both in thickness and surface, from thirty or forty feet square, to three or four, packed close together, and in places heaped one upon another. This, I am of opinion, would be found too hard for a ship's side, that is not properly armed against it. How long it may have lain, or will lie here, is a point not easily determined. Such ice is found in the Greenland seas all the summer long, and I think it cannot be colder there in the summer than it is here. Be this as it may, we certainly had no thaw. On the contrary, the mercury in Fahrenheit's thermometer kept generally below the freezing point, although it was the middle of summer. It is a general opinion that the ice I have been speaking of is formed in bays and rivers. Under this supposition, we were led to believe that land was not far distant, and that it even lay to the southward behind the ice, which alone hindered us from approaching to it. Therefore, as we had now sailed above thirty leagues along the edge of the ice, without finding a passage to the south, I determined to run thirty or forty leagues to the east, afterwards endeavour to get to the southward, and if I met with no land or other impediment, to get behind the ice, and put the matter out of all manner of dispute. With this view we kept standing to the north-west, with a wind at north-east and north, thick foggy weather, with sleet and snow, till six in the evening, when the wind veered to north-west, and we tacked and stood to the eastward, meeting with many islands of ice of different magnitudes and some loose pieces. The thermometer from thirty to thirty-four, weather very hazy with sleet and snow, and more sensibly colder than the thermometer seemed to point out, insomuch that the whole crew complained. In order to enable them to support this weather the better, I caused the sleeves of their jackets, which were so short as to expose their arms, 
to be lengthened with bays, and had a cap made for each man of the same stuff, together with canvas, which proved of great service to them. Some of our people appearing to have symptoms of the scurvy, the surgeons began to give them fresh wort every day, made from the malt we had on board for that purpose. One man in particular was highly scorbutic, and yet he had been taking the rob of lemon and orange for some time, without being benefited thereby. On the other hand, Captain Furneaux told me that he had two men who, though far gone in this disease, were now in a manner entirely cured by it. We continued standing to the eastward till eight o'clock in the morning of the 21st, when being in the latitude of 53 degrees 50 minutes, and longitude 29 degrees 24 minutes east, we hauled to the south, with a wind at west, a fresh gale and hazy with snow. In the evening the wind fell and the weather cleared up, so as that we could see a few leagues round us, being in the latitude of 54 degrees 43 minutes south, longitude 29 degrees 30 minutes east. At ten o'clock, seeing many islands of ice ahead, and the weather coming on foggy with snow, we wore and stood to the northward till three in the morning, when we stood again to the south. At eight the weather cleared up, and the wind came to west-south-west, with which we made all the sail we could to the south, having never less than ten or twelve islands of ice in sight. Next day we had the wind at south-west and south-south-west, a gentle gale, with now and then showers of snow and hail. In the morning, being in the latitude of fifty-five degrees twenty minutes south, and longitude thirty-one degrees thirty minutes east, we hoisted out a boat to see if there was any current, but found none. Mr. Forster, who went in the boat, shot some of the small grey birds before mentioned, which were of the petrel tribe, and about the size of a small pigeon. Their back and upper side of their wings, their feet and bills, are of a blue-grey colour. Their bellies and under side of their wings are white, a little tinged with blue. The upper side of their quill feathers is a dark blue tinged with black. A streak is formed by feathers nearly of this colour, along the upper parts of the wings, and crossing the back a little above the tail. The end of the tail feathers is also of the same colour. Their bills are much broader than any I have seen of the same tribe, and their tongues are remarkably broad. These blue petrels, as I shall call them, are seen nowhere but in the southern hemisphere, from about the latitude of twenty-eight degrees and upwards. Thermometer at thirty-three degrees in the open air, and thirty-two degrees in the sea at the surface, and at thirty-four and a half when drawn, and six and a half minutes in drawing up from one hundred fathoms below it, where it had been sixteen minutes. On the twenty-fourth the wind blew from north-west to north-east a gentle gale, fair and cloudy. At noon we were by observation in the latitude of fifty-six degrees thirty-one minutes south, and longitude thirty-one degrees nineteen minutes east, the thermometer at thirty-five. And being near an island of ice, which was about fifty feet high, and four hundred fathoms in circuit, I sent the master in the jolly boat to see if any water ran from it. He soon returned with an account that there was not one drop or any other appearance of thaw. In the evening we sailed through several floats, or fields of loose ice, lying in the direction of south-east and north-west. At the same time we had continually several islands of the same composition in sight. On the twenty-fifth, the wind veering round from the north-east to the east by south, it blew a gentle gale, with which we stood the west-south-west, and at noon, were in the latitude of fifty-seven degrees fifty minutes south, and longitude twenty-nine degrees thirty-two minutes east. The weather was fair and cloudy, the air sharp and cold, attended with a hard frost. And although this was the middle of summer with us, I much question if the day was cold in any part of England. The wind continued at south, blew a fresh gale, fair and cloudy weather till near noon the next day, when we had clear sunshine, 
and found ourselves by observation in the latitude of 58 degrees 31 minutes south, longitude 26 degrees 57 minutes east. In the course of the last 24 hours, we passed through several fields of broken loose ice. They were in general narrow, but of a considerable length, in the direction of north-west and south-east. The ice was so close in one, that it would hardly admit the ship through it. The pieces were flat, from four to six or eight inches thick, and appeared of that sort of ice, which is generally formed in bays or rivers. Others again were different, the pieces forming various honeycombed branches, exactly like coral rocks, and exhibiting such a variety of figures as can hardly be conceived. We supposed this ice to have broke from the main field we had lately left, and which I was determined to get to the south of, or behind if possible, in order to satisfy myself whether or not it joined to any land, as had been conjectured. With this view I kept on to the westward, with a gentle gale at south and south-southwest, and soon after six o'clock in the evening we saw some penguins, which occasioned us to sound, but we found no ground with a hundred and fifty fathoms. In the morning of the twenty-seventh we saw more loose ice, but not many islands, and those we did see were but small. The day being calm and pleasant, and the sea smooth, we hoisted out a boat, from which Mr. Forster shot a penguin and some petrels. These penguins differ not from those seen in other parts of the world, except in some minute particulars distinguishable only by naturalists. Some of the petrels were of the blue sort, but differed from those before mentioned in not having a broad bill, and the ends of their tail feathers were tipped with white instead of dark blue. But whether these were only the distinctions betwixt the male and female, was a matter disputed by naturalists. We were now in the latitude of 58 degrees 19 minutes south, longitude 24 degrees 39 minutes east, and took the opportunity of the calm to sound, but found no ground with a line of 220 fathoms. The calm continued until six in the evening, when it was succeeded by a light breeze from the east, which afterwards increased to a fresh gale. In the morning of the 28th I made the signal to the adventure to spread four miles on my starboard beam, and in this position we continued sailing west-south-west till four o'clock in the afternoon, when the hazy weather, attended with snow showers, made it necessary for us to join. Soon after we reefed our topsails, being surrounded on all sides with islands of ice. In the morning of the twenty-ninth we let them out again and set topgallant sails, still continuing our course to the westward and meeting with several penguins. At noon we were by observation in the latitude of fifty-nine degrees twelve minutes, longitude nineteen degrees one minute east, which is three degrees more to the west than we were when we first fell in with the field of ice, so that it is pretty clear that it joined to no land as we conjectured. Having come to a resolution to run as far west as the meridian of Cape Circumcision, provided we met with no impediment, as the distance was not more than eighty leagues, the wind favourable, and the sea seemed to be pretty clear of ice, I sent on board for Captain Furneaux to make him acquainted therewith, and after dinner he returned to his ship. At one o'clock we steered for an island of ice, thinking if there were any loose ice round it, to take some on board and convert it into fresh water. At four we brought two, close under the lee of the island, where we did not find what we wanted, but saw upon it eighty-six penguins. This piece of ice was about half a mile in circuit, and one hundred feet high and upwards, for we lay for some minutes with every sail becalmed under it, the side on which the penguins were rose sloping from the sea, so as to admit them to creep up it. It is a received opinion that penguins never go far from land, 
and that the sight of them is a sure indication of its vicinity. The opinion may hold good where there are no ice islands, but where such are, these birds, as well as many others which usually keep near the shores, finding a roosting place upon these islands, may be brought by them a great distance from any land. It will, however, be said that they must go on shore to breed, that probably the females were there, and that these were only the males which we saw. Be that as it may, I shall continue to take notice of these birds whenever we see them, and leave every one to judge for himself. We continued our course to the westward, with a gentle gale at east-north-east, the weather being sometimes tolerably clear, and at other times thick and hazy with snow. The thermometer for a few days past was from thirty-one to thirty-six. At nine o'clock the next morning, being the thirtieth, we shot one of the white birds, upon which we lowered a boat into the water to take it up, and by that means killed a penguin, which weighed eleven pounds and a half. The white bird was of the petrel tribe. The bill, which is rather short, is of a colour between black and dark blue, and their legs and feet are blue. I believe them to be the same sort of birds that Bouvet mentions to have seen when he was off Cape Circumcision. We continued our westerly course till eight o'clock in the evening, when we steered northwest, the point on which I reckon the above-mentioned Cape to bear. At midnight we fell in with loose ice, which soon after obliged us to tack, and stretched to the southward. At half an hour past two o'clock in the morning of the thirty-first, we stood for it again, thinking to take some on board, but this was found impracticable. For the wind, which had been at northeast, now veered to southeast, and increasing to a fresh gale, brought with it such a sea as made it very dangerous for the ships to remain among the ice. The danger was yet farther increased by discovering an immense field to the north, extending from northeast by east to southwest by west, farther than the eye could reach. As we were not above two or three miles from this, and surrounded by loose ice, there was no time to deliberate. We presently wore, got our tacks on board, all to the south and soon got clear, but not before we had received several hard knocks from the loose pieces, which were of the largest sort, and among which we saw a seal. In the afternoon the wind increased in such a manner as to oblige us to hand the topsails and strike topgallant yards. At eight o'clock we tacked and stood to the east, till midnight, when being in the latitude of six degrees twenty-one minutes south, longitude thirteen degrees thirty-two minutes east, we stood again to the west. End of Book One, Chapter Two, Part One Book One, Chapter Two, Part Two of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 1, by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts. Departure from the Cape of Good Hope. 1773, January. Next day, towards noon, the gale abated, so that we could carry close-reefed topsails. But the weather continued thick and hazy, with sleet and snow, which froze on the rigging as it fell, and ornamented the hole with icicles, the mercury in the thermometer being generally below the freezing point. This weather continued until near noon the next day, at which time we were in the latitude of 59 degrees 12 minutes south, longitude 9 degrees 45 minutes east, and here we saw some penguins. The wind had now veered to the west and was so moderate that we could bear two reefs out of the topsails. In the afternoon we were favoured with the sight of the moon, whose face we had seen but once since we left the Cape of Good Hope. By this a judgment may be formed of the sort of weather we had since we left that place. We did not fail to seize the opportunity to make several observations of the sun and moon. The longitude deduced from it was nine degrees thirty-four minutes thirty seconds east. 
Mr. Kendall's watch at the same time giving 10 degrees 6 minutes east, and the latitude was 58 degrees 53 minutes 30 seconds south. This longitude is nearly the same that is assigned to Cape Circumcision, and at the going down of the sun we were about ninety-five leagues to the south of the latitude it is said to lie in. At this time the weather was so clear that we might have seen land at fourteen or fifteen leagues distance. It is therefore very probable that what Bouvet took for land was nothing but mountains of ice surrounded by loose or field ice. We ourselves were undoubtedly deceived by the ice hills the day we first fell in with the field ice. Nor was it an improbable conjecture that that ice joined to land. The probability was, however, now greatly lessened, if not entirely set aside, for the space between the northern edge of the ice along which we sailed and our route to the west, when south of it, nowhere exceeded one hundred leagues and in some places not sixty. The clear weather continued no longer than three o'clock the next morning, when it was succeeded by a thick fog, sleet, and snow. The wind also veered to north-east and blew a fresh gale, with which we stood to south-east. It increased in such a manner that before noon we were brought under close-reefed topsails. The wind continued to veer to the north, at last fixed at north-west, and was attended with intervals of clear weather. Our course was east one quarter north, till noon the next day, when we were in the latitude of fifty-nine degrees two minutes south, and nearly under the same meridian as we were when we fell in with the last field of ice, five days before, so that, had it remained in the same situation, we must now have been in the middle of it, whereas we did not so much as see any. We cannot suppose that so large a float of ice as this was could be destroyed in so short a time. It therefore must have drifted to the northward, and this makes it probable that there is no land under this meridian, between the latitude of fifty-five degrees and fifty-nine degrees, where we had supposed some to lie, as mentioned above. As we were now only sailing over a part of the sea where we had been before, I directed the course east-south-east in order to get more to the south. We had the advantage of a fresh gale and the disadvantage of a thick fog. Much snow and sleet, which as usual, froze on our rigging as it fell, so that every rope was covered with the finest transparent ice I ever saw. This afforded an agreeable sight enough to the eye, but conveyed to the mind an idea of coldness much greater than it really was for the weather was rather milder than it had been for some time past, and the sea less encumbered with ice. But the worst was, the ice so clogged the rigging, sails, and blocks, as to make them exceedingly bad to handle. Our people, however, surmounted these difficulties with a steady perseverance, and withstood this intense cold much better than I expected. We continued to steer to the east-south-east with a fresh gale at north-west, attended with sleet and snow till the 8th, when we were in the latitude of 61 degrees 12 minutes south, longitude 31 degrees 47 minutes east. In the afternoon we passed more ice islands than we had seen for several days. Indeed, they were now so familiar to us that they were often passed unnoticed but more generally unseen on account of the thick weather. At nine o'clock in the evening we came to one which had a quantity of loose ice about it. As the wind was moderate and the weather tolerably fair, we shortened sail and stood on and off, with a view of taking some on board on the return of light. But at four o'clock in the morning, finding ourselves to leeward of this ice, we bore down to an island to leeward of us, there being about it some loose ice, part of which we saw break off. There we brought two, hoisted out three boats, and in about five or six hours took up as much ice as yielded fifteen tons of good fresh water. The pieces we took up were hard and solid as a rock. Some of them were so large that we were obliged to break them with pickaxes before they could be taken into the boats. The salt water, 
which adhered to the ice, was so trifling as not to be tasted, and, after it had lain on deck for a short time, entirely drained off, and the water which the ice yielded was perfectly sweet and well tasted. Part of the ice we broke in pieces and put into casks. Some we melted in the coppers and filled up the casks with the water, and some we kept on deck for present use. The melting and stowing away the ice is a little tedious, and takes up some time. Otherwise this is the most expeditious way of watering I ever met with. Having got on board this supply of water, and the adventure about two-thirds as much, of which we stood in great need, as we had once broke the ice, I did not doubt of getting more whenever we were in want. I therefore without hesitation directed our course more to the south, with a gentle gale at north-west, attended as usual with snow-showers. In the morning of the eleventh, being then in the latitude of sixty-two degrees forty-four minutes south, longitude thirty-seven degrees east, the variation of the compass was twenty-four degrees ten minutes west, and the following morning, in the latitude of sixty-four degrees twelve minutes south, longitude thirty-eight degrees fourteen minutes east, by the mean of three compasses, it was no more than twenty-three degrees fifty-two minutes west. In this situation we saw some penguins, and being near an island of ice from which several pieces had broken, we hoisted out two boats, and took on board as much as filled all our empty casks, and the adventure did the same. While this was doing, Mr. Forster shot an albatross, whose plumage was of a colour between brown and dark grey, the head and upper side of the wings rather inclining to black, and it had white eyebrows. We began to see these birds about the time of our first falling in with the ice islands, and some have accompanied us ever since. These and the dark brown sort with the yellow bill were the only albatrosses that had not now forsaken us. At four o'clock p.m. we hoisted in the boats, and made sail to the south-east, with a gentle breeze at south by west, attended with showers of snow. On the 13th at 2 o'clock a.m. it fell calm. Of this we took the opportunity to hoist out a boat to try the current, which we found to set northwest near one-third of a mile an hour. At the time of trying the current, a Fahrenheit thermometer was emerged in the sea one hundred fathoms below its surface, where it remained twenty minutes. When it came up, the mercury stood at thirty-two, which is the freezing point. Some little time after, being exposed to the surface of the sea, it rose to thirty-three and a half, and in the open air to thirty-six. The calm continued till five o'clock in the evening, when it was succeeded by a light breeze from the south and south-east, with which we stood to the north-east, with all our sails set. Though the weather continued fair, the sky as usual was clouded. However, at nine o'clock the next morning it was clear, and we were enabled to observe several distances between the sun and moon, the mean result of which gave thirty-nine degrees thirty minutes thirty seconds east longitude. Mr. Kendall's watch at the same time gave thirty-eight degrees twenty-seven minutes forty-five seconds, which is one degree two minutes forty-five seconds west of the observations, whereas, on the third instant, it was half a degree east of them. In the evening I found the variation by the mean of azimuths, taken with Gregory's compass, to be twenty-eight degrees fourteen minutes zero seconds. By the mean of six azimuths, by one of Dr. Knight's, twenty-eight degrees thirty-two minutes zero seconds, and by another of Dr. Knight's, twenty-eight degrees, thirty-four minutes, zero seconds. Our latitude at this time was sixty-three degrees, fifty-seven minutes, longitude thirty-nine degrees, thirty-eight and a half minutes. The succeeding morning, the fifteenth, being then in latitude sixty-three degrees, thirty-three minutes south, the longitude was observed by the following persons, viz. Myself, 
being the mean of six distances of the sun and moon, forty degrees one minute forty-five seconds east. Mr. Wales, ditto, thirty-nine degrees twenty-nine minutes forty-five seconds. Ditto, ditto, thirty-nine degrees fifty-six minutes forty-five seconds. Lieutenant Clerk, ditto, thirty-nine degrees thirty-eight minutes zero seconds. Mr. Gilbert, ditto, 39 degrees, 48 minutes, 45 seconds. Mr. Smith, ditto, 39 degrees, 18 minutes, 15 seconds. Median, 39 degrees, 42 minutes, 12 seconds. Mr. Kendall's watch made 38 degrees, 41 minutes, 30 seconds, which is nearly the same difference as the day before. But Mr. Wales and I took each of us six distances of the sun and moon, with the telescopes fixed to our sextants, which brought out the longitude nearly the same as the watch. The results were as follows, by Mr. Wales, 38 degrees 35 minutes 30 seconds, and by me, 38 degrees 36 minutes 45 seconds. It is impossible for me to say whether these or the former are the nearest to the truth, nor can I assign any probable reason for so great a disagreement. We certainly can observe with greater accuracy through the telescope than with the common sight, when the ship is sufficiently steady. The use of the telescope is found difficult at first, but a little practice will make it familiar. By the assistance of the watch, we shall be able to discover the greatest error this method of observing the longitude at sea is liable to, which at the present does not exceed a degree and a half, and in general will be found to be much less. Such is the improvement navigation has received by the astronomers and mathematical instrument makers of this age, by the former from the valuable tables they have communicated to the public, under the direction of the Board of Longitude, and contained in the astronomical ephemeris, and by the latter, from the great accuracy they observe in making instruments, without which the tables would, in a great measure, lose their effect. The preceding observations were made by four different sextants of different workmen. Mine was by Mr. Bird, one of Mr. Wales's by Mr. Dolland, the other and Mr. Clerk's by Mr. Ramsden, and also Mr. Gilbert's and Smith's, who observed with the same instrument. Five tolerably fine days had now succeeded one another. This, besides giving us an opportunity to make the preceding observations, was very serviceable to us on many other accounts, and came at a very seasonable time. For, having on board a good quantity of fresh water, or ice, which was the same thing, the people were enabled to wash and dry their clothes and linen, a care that can never be enough attended to in all long voyages. The winds during this time blew in gentle gales, and the weather was mild. Yet the mercury in the thermometer never rose above thirty-six, and was frequently as low as the freezing point. In the afternoon, having but little wind, I brought to under an island of ice, and sent the boat to take up some. In the evening the wind freshened at east, and was attended with snow-showers and thick hazy weather, which continued a great part of the sixteenth. As we met with little ice, I stood to the south, close hauled, and at six o'clock in the evening, being in the latitude of sixty-four degrees fifty-six minutes south, longitude thirty-nine degrees thirty-five minutes east, I found the variation by Gregory's compass to be twenty-six degrees forty-one minutes west. At this time the motion of the ship was so great that I could by no means observe with any of Dr. Knight's compasses. As the wind remained invariably fixed at east and east by south, I continued to stand to the south, and on the 17th between 11 and 12 o'clock, we crossed the Antarctic Circle in the longitude of 39 degrees 35 minutes east, for at noon we were by observation in the latitude of 66 degrees 36 minutes 30 seconds south. The weather was now become tolerably clear, so that we could see several leagues round us, 
and yet we had only seen one island of ice since the morning. But about 4 p.m., as we were steering to the south, we observed the whole sea in a manner covered with ice, from the direction of southeast round to the south by west. In this space, thirty-eight ice islands, great and small, were seen, besides loose ice in abundance, so that we were obliged to luff for one piece and bear up for another, and as we continued to advance to the south, it increased in such a manner that at three quarters past six o'clock, being then in the latitude of sixty-seven degrees fifteen minutes south, we could proceed no farther, the ice being entirely closed to the south, in the whole extent from east to west-south-west, without the least appearance of any opening. This immense field was composed of different kinds of ice, some as high hills, loose or broken pieces packed close together, and what I think Greenland men call field ice. A float of this kind of ice lay to the south-east of us, of such extent that I could see no end to it from the masthead. It was sixteen or eighteen feet high at least, and appeared of a pretty equal height and surface. Here we saw many whales playing about the ice, and for two days before had seen several flocks of the brown and white pintados, which we named Antarctic pectorals, because they seem to be natives of that region. They are, undoubtedly, of the petrel tribe, are in every respect shaped like the pintados, differing only from them in colour. The head and fore part of the body of these are brown, and the hind part of the body, tail, and the ends of the wings are white. The white petrel also appeared in greater numbers than before, some few dark grey albatrosses, and our constant companion the blue petrel. But the common pintados had quite disappeared, as well as many other sorts, which are common in lower latitudes. End of Book 1, Chapter 2, Part 2 Book 1, Chapter 3, Part 1 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 1, by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts. Chapter 3. Sequel of the Search for a Southern Continent Between the Meridian of the Cape of Good Hope and New Zealand, with an account of the separation of the two ships, and the arrival of the Resolution in Dusky Bay. 1773, January. After meeting with this ice, I did not think it was at all prudent to persevere in getting farther to the south, especially as the summer was already half spent, and it would have taken up some time to have got round the ice, even supposing it to have been practicable, which, however, is doubtful. I therefore came to a resolution to proceed directly in search of the land lately discovered by the French, and, as the winds still continued at east by south, I was obliged to return to the north, over some part of the sea I had already made myself acquainted with, and, for that reason, wished to have avoided. But this was not to be done, as our course made good, was little better than north. In the night the wind increased to a strong gale, attended with sleet and snow, and obliged us to double-reef our topsails. About noon the next day the gale abated, so that we could bear all our reefs out, but the wind still remained in its old water. In the evening, being in the latitude of 64 degrees 12 minutes south, longitude 40 degrees 15 minutes east, a bird, called by us in my former voyage Port Egmont Hen, on account of the great plenty of them at Port Egmont in Falkland Isles, came hovering several times over the ship, and then left us in the direction of north-east. They are a short thick bird about the size of a large crow, of a dark brown or chocolate colour, with a whitish streak under each wing in the shape of a half-moon. I have been told that these birds are found in great plenty at the Faroe Isles north of Scotland, and that they never go far from land. Certain it is, I never before saw them above forty leagues off, 
but I do not remember ever seeing fewer than two together, whereas here was but one, which, with the islands of ice, may have come a good way from land. At nine o'clock the wind veering to east-north-east, we tacked and stood to the south-south-east, but at four in the morning of the twentieth it returned back to its old point, and we resumed our northerly course. One of the above birds was seen this morning, probably the same we saw the night before, as our situation was not much altered. As the day advanced the gale increased, attended with thick hazy weather, sleet and snow, and at last obliged us to close reef our topsails and strike topgallant yards. But in the evening the wind abated, so as to admit us to carry whole topsails and topgallant yards aloft. Hazy weather with snow and sleet continued. In the afternoon of the 21st, being in the latitude of 62 degrees 24 minutes south, longitude 42 degrees 19 minutes east, we saw a white albatross with black-tipped wings and a pintado bird. The wind was now at south and southwest a fresh gale. With this we steered northeast against a very high sea, which did not indicate the vicinity of land in that quarter, and yet it was there we were to expect it. The next day we had intervals of fair weather. The wind was moderate, and we carried our studding sails. In the morning of the 23rd we were in latitude of 60 degrees 27 minutes south, longitude 45 degrees 33 minutes east. Snow showers continued, and the weather was so cold that the water in our water vessels on deck had been frozen for several preceding nights. Having clear weather at intervals, I spread the ships abreast four miles from each other, in order the better to discover anything that might lie in our way. We continued to sail in this manner till six o'clock in the evening, when hazy weather and snow showers made it necessary for us to join. We kept our course to northeast till eight o'clock in the morning of the twenty fifth, when the wind having veered round to northeast by east, by the west and north we tacked, and stood to northwest. The wind was fresh, and yet we made but little way against a high northerly sea. We now began to see some of that sort of petrels so well known to sailors by the name of shearwaters, latitude fifty eight degrees ten minutes longitude 50 degrees 54 minutes east. In the afternoon the wind veered to the southward of east, and at eight o'clock in the evening it increased to a storm, attended with thick hazy weather, sleet and snow. During night we went under our foresail and main topsail close reefed. At daylight the next morning added to them the fore and mizzen topsails. At four o'clock it fell calm, but a prodigious high sea from the northeast, and a complication of the worst of weather, viz., snow, sleet, and rain continued, together with the calm till nine o'clock in the evening. Then the weather cleared up, and we got a breeze at southeast by south. With this we steered north by east till eight o'clock the next morning, being the twenty-seventh, when I spread the ships and steered north-northeast, all sails set, having a fresh breeze at south by west and clear weather. At noon we were by observation in the latitude of 56 degrees 28 minutes south, and about three o'clock in the afternoon, the sun and moon appearing at intervals, their distances were observed by the following persons, and the longitude resulting therefrom was, by Mr. Wales, the mean of two sets, 50 degrees 59 minutes east. Lieutenant Clerk, fifty one degrees eleven minutes mr gilbert fifty degrees fourteen minutes mr smith fifty degrees fifty minutes mr kendall's watch fifty degrees fifty minutes at six o'clock in the evening being in latitude fifty six degrees nine minutes south i now made signal to the adventure to come under my stern and at eight o'clock the next morning sent her to look out on my starboard beam having at this time a fresh gale at west and pretty clear weather. But this was not of long duration, for, at two in the afternoon, the sky became cloudy and hazy, the wind increased to a fresh gale, 
blew in squalls attended with snow, sleet, and drizzling rain. I now made signal to the adventure to come under my stern, and took another reef in each topsail. At eight o'clock I hauled up the mainsail, and run all night under the foresail and two topsails, our course being north-north-east and north-east by north, with a strong gale at north-west. The twenty-ninth at noon we observed in latitude fifty-two degrees twenty-nine minutes south, the weather being fair and tolerably clear. But in the afternoon it again became very thick and hazy with rain, and the gale increased in such a manner as to oblige us to strike top-gallant yards, close reef and hand the topsails. We spent part of the night, which was very dark and stormy, in making a tack to the south-west, and in the morning of the thirtieth stood again to the north-east, wind at north-west and north a very fresh gale which split several of our small sails. This day no ice was seen, probably owing to the thick hazy weather. At eight o'clock in the evening we tacked and stood to the westward under our courses, but as the sea ran high we made our course no better than south-south-west. At four o'clock the next morning the gale had a little abated, and the wind had backed to west by south. We again stood to the northward under courses and double reef topsails, having a very high sea from the north-north-west, which gave us but little hopes of finding the land we were in search of. At noon we were in the latitude of fifty degrees fifty-six minutes south, longitude fifty-six degrees forty-eight minutes east, and presently after we saw two islands of ice. One of these we passed very near, and found that it was breaking or falling to pieces by the crackling noise it made which was equal to the report of a four-pounder. There was a good deal of loose ice about it, and had the weather been favourable, I should have brought to and taken some up. After passing this we saw no more, till we returned again to the south. 1773 February Hazy gloomy weather continued, and the wind remained invariably fixed at north-west so that we could make our course no better than north-east by north, and by this course we held until four o'clock in the afternoon of the 1st of February, being then in the latitude of 48 degrees 30 minutes, and longitude 58 degrees 7 minutes east, nearly in the meridian of the island of Mauritius, and where we were to expect to find the land said to be discovered by the French, of which at this time we saw not the least signs, we bore away east. I now made the signal to the adventure to keep at the distance of four miles on my starboard beam. At half an hour past six, Captain Furneaux made the signal to speak with me, and upon his coming under my stern, he informed me that he had just seen a large float of sea or rockweed, and about it several birds, divers. These were certainly signs of the vicinity of land but whether it lay to the east or west was not possible for us to know. My intention was to have got into this latitude four or five degrees of longitude to the west of the meridian we were in, and then to have carried on my researches to the east. But the west and north-west winds we had had for the five preceding days prevented me from putting this in execution. The continual high sea we had lately had from the north-east, north, north-west and west, left me no reason to believe that land of any extent lay to the west. We therefore continued to steer to the east, only lying to a few hours in the night, and in the morning resumed our course again, four miles north and south from each other, the hazy weather not permitting us to spread farther. We passed two or three small pieces of rockweed, and saw two or three birds known by the name of egg-birds, but saw no other signs of land. At noon we observed in latitude 48 degrees 36 minutes south, longitude 59 degrees 35 minutes east, as we could see only a few miles farther to the south, and as it was not impossible that there might be land not far off in that direction, I gave orders to steer south a half east, and made the signal for the adventure to follow, she being by this movement thrown astern the weather continuing hazy till half an hour past six o'clock in the evening, when it cleared up, 
so as to enable us to see about five leagues round us. Being now in the latitude of forty-nine degrees thirteen minutes south, without having the least signs of land, I wore and stood again to the eastward, and soon after spoke with Captain Furneaux. He told me that he thought the land was to the northwest of us, as he had at one time observed the sea to be smooth when the wind blew in that direction. Although this was not conformable to the remarks we had made on the sea, I resolved to clear up the point, if the wind would admit of my getting to the west in any reasonable time. At eight o'clock in the morning of the third, being in the latitude of forty-eight degrees fifty-six minutes south, longitude sixty degrees forty-seven minutes east, and upwards of eight degrees to the east of the meridian of the Mauritius, I began to despair of finding land to the east, and as the wind had now veered to the north, resolved to search for it to the west. I accordingly tacked and stood to the west with a fresh gale. This increased in such a manner that, before night, we were reduced to our two courses, and at last obliged to lie to under the foresails, having a prodigious high sea from west-north-west, notwithstanding the height of the gale, was from north by west. At three o'clock the next morning, the gale abating, we made sail, and continued to ply to the west till ten o'clock in the morning of the sixth. At this time, being in the latitude of forty-eight degrees six minutes south, longitude fifty-eight degrees twenty-two minutes east, the wind seemingly fixed at west-north-west, and seeing no signs of meeting with land, I gave over plying, and bore away east a little southerly. Being satisfied that if there is any land hereabout, it can only be an isle of no great extent, and it was just as probable I might have found it to the east as to the west. While we were plying about here, we took every opportunity to observe the variation of the compass, and found it to be from twenty-seven degrees fifty minutes to thirty degrees twenty-six minutes west, probably the mean of the two extremes, viz. twenty-nine degrees four minutes, is the nearest of the truth, as it nearly agrees with the variation observed on board the adventure. In making these observations we found that, when the sun was on the larboard side of the ship, the variation was the least, and when on the starboard side the greatest. This was not the first time we had made this observation, without being able to account for it. At four o'clock in the morning of the seventh, I made the adventure signal to keep at a distance of four miles on my starboard beam, and continued to steer east-south-east. This being a fine day, I had all our men's bedding and clothes spread on deck to air, and the ship cleaned and smoked betwixt decks. At noon I steered a point more to the south, being then in the latitude of forty-five degrees forty-nine minutes south, longitude sixty-one degrees forty-eight minutes east. At six o'clock in the evening I called in the adventure, and at the same time took several azimuths, which gave the variation thirty-one degrees twenty-eight minutes west. These observations could not be taken with the greatest accuracy, on account of the rolling of the ship, occasioned by a very high westerly swell. The preceding evening three Port Egmont hens were seen. This morning another appeared. In the evening and several times in the night penguins were heard, and at daylight in the morning of the eighth several of these were seen, and divers of two sorts, seemingly such as are usually met with on the coast of England. This occasioned us to sound, but we found no ground with a line of two hundred and ten fathoms. Our latitude was now forty-nine degrees fifty-three minutes south, and longitude sixty-three degrees thirty-nine minutes east. This was at eight o'clock. By this time the wind had veered round by the northeast to east, blew a brisk gale, and was attended with hazy weather, which soon after turned to a thick fog, and at the same time the wind shifted to northeast. I continued to keep the wind on the larboard tack and to fire a gun every hour till noon, when I made the signal to tack and tacked accordingly. But as neither this signal nor any of the former was answered by the adventure, we had but too much reason to think that a separation had taken place, though we were at a loss to tell 
how it had been effected. I had directed Captain Fourneau, in case he was separated from me, to cruise three days in the place where he last saw me. I therefore continued making short boards and firing half our guns till the ninth in the afternoon, when, the weather having cleared up, we could see several leagues round us, and found that the adventure was not within the limits of our horizon. At this time we were about two or three leagues to the eastward of the situation we were in when we last saw her, and were standing to the northwest with a very strong gale at north-northwest, accompanied with a great sea from the same direction. This, together with an increase of wind, obliged us to lie to till eight o'clock the next morning, during which time we saw nothing of the adventure, notwithstanding the weather was pretty clear, and we had kept firing guns and burning false fires all night. I therefore gave over looking for her, made sail and steered south-east, with a very fresh gale at west by north, accompanied with a high sea from the same direction. While we were beating about here, we frequently saw penguins and divers, which made us conjecture the land was not far off, but in what direction it was not possible for us to tell. As we advanced to the south, we lost the penguins and most of the divers, and, as usual, met with abundance of albatrosses, blue petrels, sheer waters, etc. The eleventh at noon, and in a latitude of fifty-one degrees fifteen minutes south, longitude sixty-seven degrees twenty minutes east, we again met with penguins, and saw an egg-bird, which we also look upon to be a sign of the vicinity of land. I continued to steer to the south-east, with a fresh gale in the north-west quarter, attended with a long hollow swell, and frequent showers of rain, hail, and snow. The twelfth in the morning, being in the latitude of fifty-two degrees thirty-two minutes south, longitude sixty-nine degrees forty-seven minutes east, the variation was thirty-one degrees thirty-eight minutes west. In the evening, in the latitude of fifty-three degrees seven minutes south, longitude seventy degrees fifty minutes east, it was thirty-two degrees thirty minutes, and the next morning, in the latitude of fifty-three degrees thirty-seven minutes south, longitude seventy-two degrees ten minutes, it was thirty-three degrees eight minutes west. Thus far we had continually a great number of penguins about the ship, which seemed to be different from those we had seen near the ice, being smaller, with reddish bills and brownish heads. The meeting with so many of these birds gave us some hopes of finding land, and occasioned various conjectures about its situation. The great westerly swell, which still continued, made it improbable that land of any considerable extent lay to the west, nor was it very probable that any lay to the north, as we were only about a hundred and sixty leagues to the south of Tasman's track in 1642, and I conjectured that Captain Furneaux would explore this place which accordingly happened. In the evening we saw Port Egmont Hen, which flew away in the direction of northeast by east, and the next morning a seal was seen, but no penguins. In the evening, being in the latitude of 55 degrees 49 minutes south, longitude 75 degrees 52 minutes east, the variation was 34 degrees 48 minutes west, and in the evening of the 15th, in latitude 57 degrees 2 minutes south, longitude 79 degrees 56 minutes east. It was 38 degrees west. Five seals were seen this day, and a few penguins, which occasioned us to sound, without finding any bottom, with a line of 150 fathoms. At daylight, in the morning of the 16th, we saw an island of ice to the northward, for which we steered in order to take some on board, but the wind shifting in that direction hindered us from putting this in execution. At this time we were in the latitude of 57 degrees 8 minutes south, longitude 80 degrees 59 minutes east, and had two islands of ice in sight. This morning we saw one penguin, which appeared to be of the same sort which we had formerly seen near the ice but we had now been so often deceived by these birds that we could no longer look upon them, nor indeed upon any other oceanic birds which frequent high latitudes. 
as sure signs of the vicinity of land. The wind continued not long at north, but veered to east by northeast, and blew a gentle gale, with which we stood to the southward, having frequent showers of sleet and snow. But in the night we had fair weather, and a clear, serene sky, and between midnight and three o'clock in the morning lights were seen in the heavens, similar to those in the northern hemisphere, known by the name of Aurora Borealis, or Northern Lights. But I never heard of the Aurora Australia being seen before. The officer of the watch observed that it sometimes broke out in spiral rays, and in a circular form, then its light was very strong and its appearance beautiful. He could not perceive it had any particular direction, for it appeared at various times in different parts of the heavens, and diffused its light throughout the whole atmosphere. At nine o'clock in the morning we bore down to an island of ice which we reached by noon. It was full half a mile in circuit and two hundred feet high at least, though very little loose ice about it but while we were considering whether or not we should hoist out our boats to take some up, a great quantity broke from the island. Upon this we hoisted out our boats and went to work to get some on board. The pieces of ice, both great and small, which broke from the island, I observed, drifted fast to the westward. That is, they left the island in that direction, and were, in a few hours, spread over a large space of sea. This, I have no doubt, was caused by a current setting in that direction, for the wind could have but little effect upon the ice, especially as there was a large hollow swell from the west. This circumstance greatly retarded our taking up ice. We, however, made a shift to get on board about nine or ten tons before eight o'clock, when we hoisted in the boats and made sail to the east, inclining to the south, with a fresh gale at south which soon after veered to south-south-west and south-west, with fair but cloudy weather. This course brought us among many ice isles, so that it was necessary to proceed with great caution. In the night the mercury in the thermometer fell two degrees below the freezing point, and the water in the scuttled casks on deck was frozen. As I have not taken notice of the thermometer of late, I shall now observe that as we advanced to the north, the mercury gradually rose to forty-five and fell again, as we advanced to the south, to what is above mentioned, nor did it rise in the middle of the day to above thirty-four or thirty-five. In the morning of the eighteenth, being in the latitude of fifty-seven degrees fifty-four minutes south, longitude eighty-three degrees fourteen minutes east, the variation was thirty-nine degrees thirty-three minutes west. In the evening, in latitude 58 degrees 2 minutes south, longitude 84 degrees 35 minutes east, it was only 37 degrees 8 minutes west, which induced me to believe it was decreasing. But in the evening of the 20th, in the latitude of 58 degrees 47 minutes south, longitude 90 degrees 56 minutes east, I took nine azimuths with Dr. Knight's compass, which gave the variation 40 degrees 7 minutes, and nine others with Gregory's, which gave 40 degrees 15 minutes west. This day at noon, being nearly in the latitude and longitude just mentioned, we thought we saw land to the southwest. The appearance was so strong that we doubted not it was there in reality, and tacked to work up to it accordingly, having a light breeze at south and clear weather. We were, however, soon undeceived, by finding that it was only clouds, which in the evening entirely disappeared, and left us a clear horizon, so that we could see a considerable way round us, in which space nothing was to be seen but ice islands. In the night the aurora australis made a very brilliant and luminous appearance. It was seen first in the east a little above the horizon, and in a short time spread over the whole heavens. The twenty-first in the morning, having little wind and a smooth sea, two favourable circumstances for taking up ice, I steered for the largest ice island before us, which we reached by noon. At this time we were in the latitude of fifty-nine degrees south, longitude ninety-two degrees thirty minutes east, having about two hours before seen three or four penguins. 
Finding here a good quantity of loose ice, I ordered two boats, out, and sent them to take some on board. While this was doing, the island, which was not less than half a mile in circuit, and three or four hundred feet high above the surface of the sea, turned nearly bottom up. Its height, by this circumstance, was neither increased nor diminished, apparently. As soon as we had got on board as much ice we, as we could dispose of, we hoisted in the boats, and made sail to the south-east, with a gentle breeze at north by east, attended with showers of snow and dark gloomy weather. At this time we had but few ice islands in sight, but the next day seldom less than twenty or thirty were seen at once. The wind gradually veered to the east, and at last, fixing it east by south, blew a fresh gale. With this we stood to the south, till eight o'clock in the evening of the twenty-third, at which time we were in the latitude of sixty-one degrees fifty-two minutes south, longitude ninety-five degrees two minutes east. We now tacked and spent the night, which was exceedingly stormy, thick and hazy, with sleet and snow, in making short boards. Surrounded on every side with danger, it was natural for us to wish for daylight. This, when it came, served only to increase our apprehensions, by exhibiting to our view those huge mountains of ice, which in the night we had passed without seeing. These unfavourable circumstances, together with dark nights at this advanced season of the year, quite discouraged me from putting in execution a resolution I had taken of crossing the Antarctic Circle once more. Accordingly, at four o'clock in the morning we stood to the north, with a very hard gale at east-south-east, accompanied with sleet and snow, and a very high sea from the same point, which made great destruction among the ice islands. This circumstance, far from being of any advantage to us, greatly increased the number of pieces we had to avoid. The large pieces which break from the ice islands are much more dangerous than the islands themselves. The latter are so high out of water that we can generally see them, unless the weather be very thick and dark, before we are very near them whereas the others cannot be seen in the night, till they are under our ship's bows. These dangers were, however, now become so familiar to us, that the apprehensions they caused were never of long duration, and were in some measure compensated both by the seasonable supplies of fresh water these ice islands afforded us, without which we must have been greatly distressed, and also by their very romantic appearance, greatly heightened by the foaming and dashing of the waves into the curious holes and caverns which are formed in many of them, the whole exhibiting a view which at once filled the mind with admiration and horror, and can only be described by the hand of an able painter. Towards the evening the gale abated, and in the night we had two or three hours calm. This was succeeded by a light breeze at west, with which we steered east, under all the sail we could set, meeting with many ice islands. This night we saw a port Egmont hen, and next morning being the twenty-fifth another. We had lately seen but few birds, and these were albatrosses, sheer waters, and blue petrels. It is remarkable that we did not see one of either the white or Antarctic petrels, since we came last among the ice. Notwithstanding the wind kept it west and northwest all day, we had a very high sea from the east, by which we concluded that no land could be near in that direction. In the evening, being in the latitude 60 degrees 51 minutes, longitude 95 degrees 41 minutes east, the variation was 43 degrees 6 minutes west, and the next morning being the 26th, having advanced about a degree and a half more to the east, it was 41 degrees 30 minutes, both being determined by several azimuths. We had fair weather all the afternoon, but the wind was unsettled, veering round by the north to the east. With this we stood to the south-east and east till three o'clock in the afternoon, when, being in the latitude of sixty-one degrees twenty-one minutes south, longitude ninety-seven degrees seven minutes east, we tacked and stood to the northward and eastward, as the wind kept veering to the south. This in the evening increased to a strong gale, blew in squalls, attended with snow and sleet, and thick hazy weather, which soon brought us under our close-reefed topsails. 
Between eight in the morning of the 26th and noon the next day, we fell in among several islands of ice, from whence such vast quantities had broken as to cover the sea all round us, and render sailing rather dangerous. However, by noon we were clear of it all. In the evening the wind abated and veered to south-west, but the weather did not clear up till the next morning, when we were able to carry all our sails, and met with but very few islands of ice to impede us. Probably the late gale had destroyed a great number of them. Such a very large hollow sea had continued to accompany the wind as it veered from east to south-west, that I was certain no land of considerable extent could lie within a hundred or a hundred and fifty leagues of our situation between these two points. The mean height of the thermometer at noon, for several days past, was at about thirty-five, which is something higher than it usually was in the same latitude, about a month or five weeks before. Consequently the air was something warmer. While the weather was really warm, the gales were not only stronger, but more frequent, with almost continual misty, dirty, wet weather. The very animals we had on board felt its effects. A sow having in the morning farrowed nine pigs, every one of them was killed by the cold before four o'clock in the afternoon, notwithstanding all the care we could take of them. From the same cause, myself as well as several of my people, had fingers and toes chilblained. Such is the summer weather we enjoyed. End of Book One, Chapter Three, Part One. Book One, Chapter Three, Part Two of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume One by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts. Chapter Three. Sequel of the search for a southern continent between the meridian of the Cape of Good Hope and New Zealand, with an account of the separation of the two ships, and the arrival of the Resolution in Dusky Bay. Part two, seventeen seventy three March. The wind continued unsettled, veering from the south to the west, and blew a fresh gale till the evening. Then it fell little wind and soon after a breeze sprung up at north, which quickly veered to northeast and northeast by east, attended with a thick fog, snow, sleet, and rain. With this wind and weather, we kept on to the southeast, till four o'clock in the afternoon of the next day, being the first of March, when it fell calm, which continued for near twenty-four hours. We were now in the latitude of sixty degrees thirty six minutes south, longitude one o seven degrees fifty four minutes, and had a prodigious high swell from the south west, and at the same time another from the south or south southeast. The dashing of the one wave against the other made the ship both roll and pitch exceedingly, but at length the north west swell prevailed. The calm continued till noon the next day, when it was succeeded by a gentle breeze from south-east, which afterwards increased and veered to south-west. With this we steered north-east by east and east by north, under all the sail we could set. In the afternoon of the third, being in latitude 60 degrees 13 minutes, longitude 110 degrees 18 minutes, the variation was thirty-nine degrees four minutes west, but the observations by which this was determined were none of the best, being obliged to make use of such as we could get, during the very few and short intervals when the sun appeared. A few penguins were seen this day, but not so many islands of ice as usual. The weather was also milder, though very changeable, thermometer from thirty-six to thirty-eight. We continued to have a northwest swell, although the wind was unsettled, veering to northwest by the west and north, attended with hazy sleet and drizzling rain. We prosecuted our course to the east, inclining to the south, till three o'clock in the afternoon of the fourth, when, being in the latitude of sixty degrees thirty seven minutes, longitude one hundred and thirteen degrees twenty four minutes, 
the wind shifting at once to south-west and south-west by south, I gave orders to steer east by north a half north, but in the night we steered east a half south, in order to have the wind, which was at south-south-west, more upon the beam, the better to enable us to stand back, in case we fell in with any danger in the dark, for we had not so much time to spare to allow us to lie to. In the morning of the 5th we steered east by north, under all the sail we could set, passing one ice island and many small pieces, and at nine o'clock the wind, which of late had not remained long up any one point, shifted all at once to east and blew a gentle gale. With this we stood to the north, at which time we were in the latitude of 60 degrees 44 minutes south and longitude 116 degrees 50 minutes east. The latitude was determined by the meridian altitude of the sun, which appeared now and then for a few minutes, till three in the afternoon. Indeed the sky was in general so cloudy, and the weather so thick and hazy, that we had very little benefit of sun or moon, very seldom seeing the face of either the one or the other. And yet, even under these circumstances, the weather for some days past could not be called very cold. It, however, had not the least pretension to be called summer weather, according to my ideas of summer in the northern hemisphere, so far as sixty degrees of latitude, which is nearly as far north as I have been. In the evening we had three islands of ice in sight, all of them large, especially one which was larger than any we had yet seen. The side opposed to us seemed to be a mile in extent, if so, it could not be less than three in circuit. As we passed it in the night, a continual cracking was heard, occasioned, no doubt, by pieces breaking from it. For, in the morning of the sixth, the sea, for some distance round it, was covered with large and small pieces, and the island itself did not appear so large as it had done the evening before. It could not be less than one hundred feet high. Yet such was the impetuous force and height of the waves which were broken against it, by meeting with such a sudden resistance, that they rose considerably higher. In the evening we were in latitude of 59 degrees 58 minutes south, longitude 118 degrees 39 minutes east. The seventh, the wind was variable in the northeast and southeast quarters, attended with snow and sleet till the evening. Then the weather became fair, the sky cleared up, and the night was remarkably pleasant, as well as the morning of the next day, which, for the brightness of the sky, and serenity and mildness of the weather, gave place to none we had seen since we left the Cape of Good Hope. It was such as is little known in this sea, and to make it still more agreeable, we had not one island of ice in sight the mercury in the thermometer rose to forty degrees. Mr. Wales and the master made some observations of the moon and stars, which satisfied us that, when our latitude was fifty-nine degrees forty-four minutes, our longitude was a hundred and twenty-one degrees nine minutes. At three o'clock in the afternoon, the calm was succeeded by a breeze at south-east. The sky at the same time was suddenly obscured, and seemed to presage an approaching storm, which accordingly happened. For, in the evening, the wind shifted to south, blew in squalls, attended with sleet and rain, and a prodigious high sea. Having nothing to take care of but ourselves, we kept two or three points from the wind, and ran at a good rate to the east-north-east under our two courses and close reef topsails. The gale continued till the evening of the tenth. Then it abated, the wind shifted to the westward, and we had fair weather, and but little wind, during the night, attended with a sharp frost. The next morning, being in the latitude of fifty-seven degrees fifty-six minutes, longitude one hundred and thirty degrees, the wind shifted to north-east and blew a fresh gale, with which we stood south-east, having frequent showers of snow and sleet, and a long hollow swell from south-south-east and south-east by south. 
This swell did not go down till two days after the wind which raised it had not only ceased to blow, but had shifted, and blown fresh at opposite points, good part of the time. Whoever attentively considers this must conclude that there can be no land to the south, but what must be at a great distance. Notwithstanding so little was to be expected in that quarter, we continued to stand to the south till three o'clock in the morning of the twelfth, when we were stopped by a calm, being then in the latitude of fifty-eight degrees fifty-six minutes south, longitude one hundred and thirty-one degrees twenty-six minutes east. After a few hours calm a breeze sprung up at west, with which we steered east. The south-south-east swell having gone down, was succeeded by another from north-west by west. The weather continued mild all this day, and the mercury rose to thirty-nine and a half. In the evening it fell calm, and continued so till three o'clock in the morning of the thirteenth, when we got the wind at east and south-east, a fresh breeze attended with snow and sleet. In the afternoon it became fair, and the wind veered round to the south and south-south-west, in the evening, being in the latitude of 58 degrees 59 minutes, longitude 134 degrees, the weather was so clear in the horizon that we could see many leagues round us. We had but little wind during the night, some showers of snow, and a very sharp frost. As the day broke, the wind freshened at south-east and south-south-east, and soon after the sky cleared up, and the weather became clear and serene but the air continued cold, and the mercury in the thermometer rose only one degree above the freezing point. The clear weather gave Mr. Wales an opportunity to get some observations of the sun and moon. Their results reduced to noon, when the latitude was 58 degrees 22 minutes south, gave us 136 degrees 22 minutes east longitude. Mr. Kendall's watch at the same time gave 134 degrees 42 minutes, and that of Mr. Arnold the same. This was the first and only time they pointed out the same longitude since we left England. The greatest difference, however, between them, since we left the Cape, had not much exceeded two degrees. The moderate, and I might almost say pleasant weather, which we had at times for the last two or three days, made me wish I had been a few degrees of latitude further south, and even tempted me to incline our course that way. But we soon had weather which convinced us that we were full far enough, and that the time was approaching when these seas were not to be navigated without enduring intense cold, which, by the by, we were pretty well used to. In the afternoon the serenity of the sky was presently obscured, the wind veered round to the south-west to west, and blew in hard squalls, attended with thick and heavy showers of hail and snow, which continually covered our decks, sails, and rigging, till five o'clock in the evening of the fifteenth. At this time the wind abated and shifted to south-east, the sky cleared up and the evening was so serene and clear that we could see many leagues round us the horizon being the only boundary to our sight. We were now in the latitude of 59 degrees 17 minutes south, longitude 140 degrees 12 minutes east, and had such a large hollow swell from west-south-west as assured us that we had left no land behind us in that direction. I was also well assured that no land lay to the south on this side of 60 degrees of latitude. We had a smart frost during the night, which was curiously illuminated with the southern lights. At ten o'clock in the morning of the 16th, which was as soon as the sun appeared, in the latitude of 58 degrees 51 minutes south, our longitude was 144 degrees 10 minutes east. This good weather was as usual of short duration. In the afternoon of this day we had again thick snow showers, but at intervals it was tolerably clear, and in the evening being in the latitude of 58 degrees 58 minutes south, longitude 144 degrees 37 minutes east, I found the variation by several azimuths to be 31 minutes east. 
I was not a little pleased with being able to determine, with so much precision, this point of the line, in which the compass had no variation. For I look upon half a degree as next to nothing, so that the intersection of the latitude and longitude just mentioned may be reckoned the point without any sensible error. At any rate, the line can only pass a very small matter west of it. I continued to steer to the east, inclining to the south, with a fresh gale at south-west till five o'clock the next morning, when, being in the latitude of fifty-nine degrees seven minutes south, longitude one forty-six degrees fifty-three minutes east, I bore away northeast, and, at noon, north, having come to a resolution to quit the high southern latitudes, and to proceed to New Zealand to look for the adventure, and to refresh my people. I had also some thoughts, and even a desire to visit the east coast of Van Diemen's Land, in order to satisfy myself if he joined the coast of New South Wales. In the night of the 17th the wind shifted to north-west and blew in squalls, attended with thick hazy weather and rain. This continued all the 18th, in the evening of which day, being in the latitude of 56 degrees 15 minutes south, longitude 150 degrees, the sky cleared up, and we found the variation by several azimuths to be 13 degrees 30 minutes east. Soon after we hauled up with a log a piece of rockweed, which was in a state of decay and covered with barnacles. In the night the southern lights were very bright. The next morning we saw a seal, and towards noon some penguins, and more rockweed, being at this time in the latitude of 55 degrees 1 minute, longitude 152 degrees 1 minute east. In the latitude of 54 degrees 4 minutes, we also saw a port Egmont Hen and some weed. Navigators have generally looked upon all these to be certain signs of the vicinity of land. I cannot, however, support this opinion. At this time we knew of no land, nor is it even probable that there is any, nearer than New Holland or Van Diemen's Land, from which we were distant two hundred and sixty leagues. We had at the same time several porpoises playing about us, into one of which Mr. Cooper struck a harpoon, but as the ship was running seven knots it broke its hold, after towing it some minutes, and before we could deaden the ship's way. As the wind, which continued between the north and the west, would not permit me to touch at Van Diemen's land, I shaped my course to New Zealand, and being under no apprehensions of meeting with any danger, I was not backward in carrying sail, as well by night as day, having the advantage of a very strong gale, which was attended with hazy rainy weather, and a very large swell from the west and west-south-west. We continue to meet with, now and then, a seal, port Egmont hens, and seaweed. On the morning of the twenty-second the wind shifted to south, and brought with it fair weather. At noon we found ourselves in the latitude of 49 degrees 55 minutes, longitude 159 degrees 28 minutes, having a very large swell out of the southwest. For the three days past the mercury in the thermometer had risen to 46, and the weather was quite mild. Seven or eight degrees of latitude had made a surprising difference in the temperature of the air, which we felt with an agreeable satisfaction. We continued to advance to the northeast a good rate, having a brisk gale between the south and east, meeting with seals, port Egmont hens, egg birds, seaweed, etc., and having constantly a very large swell from the southwest. At ten o'clock in the morning of the twenty fifth, the land of New Zealand was seen from the masthead, and at noon from the deck, extending from northeast by east to east, distant ten leagues. As I intended to put into Dusky Bay, or any other port I could find, on the southern part of Tavai Pernanamu, we steered in for the land, under all the sail we could carry, having the advantage of a fresh gale at west and tolerably clear weather. This last was not of long duration, for, at half an hour after four o'clock, the land, which was not above four miles distant, was in a manner wholly obscured in a thick haze. At this time we were before the entrance of a bay, 
which I had mistaken for Dusky Bay, being deceived by some islands that lay in the mouth of it. Fearing to run in thick weather into a place to which we were all strangers, and seeing some breakers and broken ground ahead, I tacked in twenty-five fathom water and stood out to sea with the wind at northwest. This bay lies on the southeast side of Cape West, and may be known by a white cliff on one of the isles which lies in the entrance of the bay. This part of the coast I did not see but at a great distance, in my former voyage, and we now saw it under so many disadvantageous circumstances, that the less I say about it, the fewer mistakes I shall make. We stood out to sea under close-reefed topsails and courses till eleven o'clock at night, when we wore and stood to the northward, having a very high and irregular sea. At five o'clock next morning the gale abated, and we bore up for the land. At eight o'clock the west cape bore east by north a half north, for which we steered, and entered Dusky Bay about noon. In the entrance of it we found forty-four fathoms water, a sandy bottom, the west cape bearing south-south-east, and five fingers point, on the, or the north point of the bay, north. Here we had a great swell rolling in from the south-west. The depth of water decreased to forty fathoms, afterwards we had no ground with sixty. We were, however, too far advanced to return, and therefore stood on, not doubting but that we should find anchorage. For in this bay we were all strangers, in my former voyage having done no more than discover and name it. After running about two leagues up the bay and passing several of the isles which lay in it, I brought two, and hoisted out two boats, one of which I sent away with an officer round a point on the larboard hand to look for anchorage. This he found and signified the same by signal. We then followed with the ship and anchored in fifty fathoms water, so near the shore as to reach it with an hawser. This was on Friday the 26th of March, at three in the afternoon, after having been one hundred and seventeen days at sea, in which time we had sailed three thousand six hundred leagues, without having once sight of land. After such a long continuance at sea in a high southern latitude, it is but reasonable to think that many of my people must be ill of the scurvy. The contrary, however, happened. Mention hath already been made of sweet wort being given to such as were scorbutic. This had so far the desired effect that we had only one man on board that could be called very ill of this disease, occasioned chiefly by a bad habit of body and a complication of other disorders. We did not attribute the general good state of health in the crew wholly to the sweet wort, but to the frequent airing and sweetening the ship by fires, etc. We must also allow portable broth and sauerkraut to have had some share in it. This last can never be enough recommended. My first care after the ship was moored was to send a boat and people a-fishing. In the meantime some of the gentlemen killed a seal, out of many that were upon a rock, which made us a fresh meal. End of chapter 3, part 2 Book 1, chapter 4, part 1 of Volume 1 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Cole. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World. Volume 1 by James Cook. Book 1, Chapter 4, Part 1. Transactions in Dusky Bay, with an account of several interviews with the inhabitants, 1773 March. As I did not like the place we were anchored in, I sent Lieutenant Pickersgill over to the southeast side of the bay to search for a better, and I went myself to the other side for the same purpose, where I met with an exceedingly snug harbour but nothing else worthy of note. Mr. Pickersgill reported, upon his return, 
that he had found a good harbour with every conveniency. As I liked the situation of this better than the other of my own finding, I determined to go there in the morning. The fishing boat was very successful, returning with fish sufficient for all hands for supper, and, in a few hours in the morning, caught as many as served for dinner. This gave us certain hopes of being plentifully supplied with this article. Nor did the shores and woods appear less destitute of wild fowl, so that we hoped to enjoy with ease what in our situation might be called the luxuries of life. This determined me to stay for some time in this bay, in order to examine it thoroughly, as no one had ever landed before on any of the southern parts of this country. On the twenty-seventh at nine o'clock in the morning we got under sail with a light breeze at south-west, and, working over to Pickersgill Harbour, entered it by a channel scarcely twice the width of the ship, and in a small creek moored head and stern, so near the shore as to reach it with a brow or stage, which nature had in the manner prepared for us in a large tree, whose end or top reached our gunwale. Wood, for fuel and other purposes, was here so convenient that our yards were locked in the branches of the trees, and about one hundred yards from our stern was a fine stream of fresh water. Thus situated we began to clear places in the woods, in order to set up the astronomer's observatory, the forge to repair our ironwork, tents for the sailmakers and coopers to repair the sails and casks in, to land our empty casks to fill water and to cut down wood for fuel, all of which were absolutely necessary occupations. We also began to brew beer from the branches or leaves of a tree, which much resembles the American black spruce. From the knowledge I had of this tree and the similarity it bore to the spruce, I judged that, with the addition of inspissated juice of wort and molasses, it would make a very wholesome beer, and supply the want of vegetables which this place did not afford, and the event proved that I was not mistaken. Now I have mentioned the inspissated juice of wort, it will not be amiss in this place to inform the reader that I had made several trials of it since I left the Cape of Good Hope, and found it to answer in a cold climate beyond all expectation. The juice, diluted in warm water, in the proportion of twelve parts water to one part juice, made a very good and well-tasted small beer. Some juice which I had of Mr. Pelham's own preparing would bear sixteen parts water. By making use of warm water, which I think always ought to be done, and keeping it in a warm place if the weather be cold, no difficulty will be found in fermenting it. A little grounds of either small or strong beer will answer as well as yeast. The few sheep and goats we had left were not likely to fare quite so well as ourselves, there being no grass here but what was coarse and harsh. It was, however, not so bad, but that we expected they would devour it with great greediness, and were the more surprised to find that they would not taste it nor did they seem over-fond of the leaves of more tender plants. Upon examination we found their teeth loose, and that many of them had every other symptom of an inveterate sea-scurvy. Out of four ewes and two rams which I brought from the Cape, with an intent to put ashore in this country, I had only been able to preserve one of each, and even these were in so bad a state that it was doubtful if they could recover notwithstanding all the care possible had been taken of them. Some of the officers on the 28th went up the bay in a small boat on a shooting party, but discovering inhabitants they returned before noon to acquaint me therewith, for hitherto we had not seen the least vestige of any. They had but just got aboard when a canoe appeared off a point about a mile from us, and soon after returned behind the point out of sight, probably owing to a shower of rain which then fell, for it was no sooner over than the canoe again appeared and came within musket-shot of the ship. 
There were in it seven or eight people. They remained looking at us for some time, and then returned. All the signs of friendship we could make did not prevail on them to come nearer. After dinner I took two boats and went in search of them, in the cove where they were first seen, accompanied by several of the officers and gentlemen. We found the canoe, at least a canoe, hauled up on the shore near to two small huts, where were several fireplaces, some fishing nets, a few fish lying on the shore, and some in the canoe. But we saw no people. They probably had retired into the woods. After a short stay, and leaving in the canoe some medals, looking-glasses, beads, etc., we embarked and rowed to the head of the cove, where we found nothing remarkable. In turning back, we put ashore at the same place as before, but still saw no people. However, they could not be far off, as we smelled the smoke of fire, though we did not see it. But I did not care to search further, or to force an interview which they seemed to avoid, well knowing that the way to obtain this was to leave the time and place to themselves. It did not appear that anything I had left had been touched. However, I now added a hatchet, and with the night returned on board. On the twenty-ninth were showers till the afternoon, when a party of the officers made an excursion up the bay, and Mr. Forster and his party were out botanizing. Both parties returned in the evening without meeting with anything worthy of notice, and the two following days every one was confined to the ship on account of rainy, stormy weather. 1773 April in the afternoon of the 1st of April, accompanied by several of the gentlemen, I went to see if any of the articles I had left for the Indians were taken away. We found everything remaining in the canoe, nor did it appear that anybody had been there since. After shooting some birds, one of which was a duck, with a blue-gray plumage and soft bill, we in the evening returned on board. The second being a pleasant morning, Lieutenants Clerk and Edgecombe, and the two Mr. Forsters, went in a boat up the bay to search for the productions of nature, and myself, Lieutenant Pickersgill, and Mr. Hodges, went to take a view of the northwest side. In our way we touched at the seal rock, and killed three seals, one of which afforded us much sport. After passing several isles, we at length came to the most northern and western arms of the bay the same as is formed by the land of Five Fingers Point. In the bottom of this arm or cove we found many ducks, wood hens, and other wild fowl, some of which we killed and returned on board at ten o'clock in the evening, where the other party had arrived several hours before us, after having had but indifferent sport. They took with them a black dog we had got at the Cape, who at the first musket they fired, ran into the woods, from whence he would not return. The three following days were rainy, so that no excursions were made. Early in the morning on the 6th a shooting party, made up of the officers, went to Goose Cove, the place where I was on the 2nd, and myself, accompanied by the two Mr. Forsters and Mr. Hodges, set out to continue the survey of the bay. My attention was directed to the north side, where I discovered a fine capacious cove, in the bottom of which is a freshwater river, on the west side several beautiful small cascades, and the shores are so steep that a ship might lie near enough to convey the water into her by a hose. In this cove we shot fourteen ducks besides other birds, which occasioned my calling it Duck Cove. As we returned in the evening, we had a short interview with three of the natives, one man and two women. They were the first that discovered themselves on the north-east point of Indian Island, named so on this occasion. We should have passed without seeing them, had not the man hallooed to us. He stood with his club in his hand upon the point of a rock, and behind him, at the skirts of the wood, stood the two women with each of them a spear. 
the man could not help discovering great signs of fear when we approached the rock with our boat. He, however, stood firm, nor did he move to take up some things we threw him ashore. At length I landed, went up and embraced him, and presented him with such articles as I had about me, which at once dissipated his fears. Presently after we were joined by the two women, the gentlemen that were with me, and some of the seamen. After this we spent about half an hour in chit-chat, little understood on either side, in which the youngest of the two women bore by far the greatest share. This occasioned one of the seamen to say that women do not want tongue in any part of the world. We presented them with fish and fowl which we had in our boat, but these they threw into the boat again, giving us to understand that such things they wanted not. Night approaching obliged us to take leave of them, when the youngest of the two women, whose volubility of tongue exceeded everything I ever met with, gave us a dance, but the man viewed us with great attention. Some hours after we got on board, the other party returned, having had but indifferent sport. Next morning I made the natives another visit, accompanied by Mr. Forster and Mr. Hodges, carrying with me various articles which I presented them with, and which they received with a great deal of indifference, except hatchets and spike-nails. These they most esteemed. This interview was at the same place as last night, and now we saw the whole family. It consisted of the man, his two wives, as we supposed, the young woman before mentioned, a boy about fourteen years old, and three small children, the youngest of which was at the breast. They were all well-looking except one woman, who had a large wen on her upper lip, which made her disagreeable, and she seemed on that account to be in a great measure neglected by the man. They conducted us to their habitation, which was but a little way within the skirts of the wood and consisted of two mean huts made of the bark of trees. Their canoe, which was a small double one, just large enough to transport the whole family from place to place, lay in a small creek near the huts. During our stay, Mr. Hodges made drawings of most of them. This occasioned them to give him the name of Toto, which word, we suppose, signifies marking or painting. When we took leave, the chief presented me with a piece of cloth or garment of their own manufacturing, and some other trifles. I at first thought it was meant as a return for the presents I had made him, but he soon undeceived me by expressing a desire for one of our boat cloaks. I took the hint, and ordered one to be made for him of red bays as soon as I got aboard, where rainy weather detained me the following day. The ninth being fair weather, we paid the natives another visit, and made known our approach by hallooing to them, but they neither answered us nor met us at the shore as usual. The reason of this we soon saw, for we found them at their habitations all dressed and dressing, in their very best, with their hair combed and oiled, tied upon the crowns of their heads and stuck with white feathers. Some wore a fillet of feathers round their heads, and all of them had bunches of white feathers stuck in their ears. Thus dressed and all standing, they had received us with great courtesy. I presented the chief with the cloak I had got made for him, with which he seemed so well pleased that he took his patapatu from his girdle and gave it me. After a short stay we took leave and having spent the remainder of the day in continuing my survey of the bay, with the night returned on board. Very heavy rains falling on the two following days no work was done, but the twelfth proved clear and serene, and afforded us an opportunity to dry our sails and linen, two things very much wanted, not having had fair weather enough for this purpose since we put into this bay. Mr. Forster and his party also profited by the day in botanizing. About ten o'clock the family of the natives paid us a visit. Seeing that they approached the ship with great caution, I met them in a boat, 
which I quitted when I got to them, and went into their canoe. Yet, after all, I could not prevail on them to put alongside the ship, and at last was obliged to leave them to follow their own inclination. At length they put ashore in a little creek hard by us, and afterwards came and sat down on the shore abreast of the ship, near enough to speak with us. I now caused the bagpipes and fife to play and the drum to beat. The two first they did not regard, but the latter caused some little attention in them, Nothing, however, could induce them to come on board. But they entered with great familiarity into conversation, little understood, with such of the officers and seamen as went to them, paying much greater regard to some than to others, and these, we had reason to believe, they took for women. To one man in particular, the young woman showed an extraordinary fondness until she discovered his sex after which she would not suffer him to come near her. Whether it was that she before took him for one of her own sex, or that the man, in order to discover himself, had taken some liberties with her which she thus resented, I know not. In the afternoon I took Mr. Hodges to a large cascade, which falls from a high mountain on the south side of the bay, about a league above the place where we lay. He made a drawing of it on paper, and afterwards painted it in oil colours, which exhibits, at once, a better description of it than any I can give. Huge heaps of stones lay at the foot of this cascade, which had been broken off and brought by the stream from the adjacent mountains. These stones were of different sorts, none, however, according to Mr. Forster's opinion, whom I believe to be a judge containing either minerals or metals. Nevertheless, I brought away specimens of every sort, as the whole country, that is, the rocky part of it, seemed to consist of those stones and no other. This cascade is at the east point of a cove, lying in southwest two miles, which I named Cascade Cove. In it is good anchorage and other necessaries. At the entrance lies an island, on each side of which is a passage, that on the east side is much the widest. A little above the isle and near the southeast shore are two rocks which are covered at high water. It was in this cove we first saw the natives. When I returned aboard in the evening I found our friends the natives had taken up their quarters at about a hundred yards from our watering place a very great mark of the confidence they placed in us. This evening a shooting party of the officers went over to the north side of the bay, having with them the small cutter to convey them from place to place. Next morning, accompanied by Mr. Forster, I went in the pinnace to survey the isles and rocks which lie in the mouth of the bay. I began first with those which lie on the southeast side of Anchor Island, I found here a very snug cove sheltered from all winds, which we called Luncheon Cove, because here we dined on crayfish, on the side of a pleasant brook, shaded by the trees from both wind and sun. After dinner we proceeded, by rowing, out to the outermost isles, where we saw many seals, fourteen of which we killed and brought away with us, and might have got many more if the surf had permitted us to land with safety on all the rocks. The next morning I went out again to continue the survey accompanied by Mr. Forster. I intended to have landed again on the Seal Isles, but there ran such a high sea that I could not come near them. With some difficulty we rowed out to sea and round the southwest point of Anchor Isle. It happened very fortunately that chance directed me to take this course, in which we found the sportsman's boat adrift, and laid hold of her the very moment she would have been dashed against the rocks. I was not long at a loss to guess how she came there, nor was I under any apprehensions for the gentleman that had been in her, and after refreshing ourselves with such as we had to eat and drink, and securing the boat in a small creek, we proceeded to the place where we supposed them to be. This we reached about seven or eight o'clock in the evening, and found them upon a small isle in Goose Cove, 
where, as it was low water, we could not come with our boat until the return of the tide. As this did not happen till three o'clock in the morning, we landed on a naked beach, not knowing where to find a better place, and after some time, having got a fire and broiled some fish, we made a hearty supper, having for sauce a good appetite. This done, we lay down to sleep, having a stony beach for a bed, and the canopy of heaven for a covering. At length the tide permitted us to take off the sportsmen, and with them we embarked and proceeded for the place where we had left their boat, which we saw and reached, having a fresh breeze of wind in our favour attended with rain. When we came to the creek which was on the north-west side of Anchor Isle, we found there an immense number of blue petrels, some on the wing, others in the woods in holes in the ground, under the roots of trees and in the crevices of rocks, where there was no getting them, and where we supposed their young were deposited. As not one was to be seen in the day, the old ones were probably at that time out at sea searching for food, which in the evening they bring to the young. The noise they made was like the croaking of many frogs. They were, I believe, of the broad-bill kind, which are not so commonly seen at sea as the others. Here, however, they were in great numbers, and flying much about in the night, some of our gentlemen at first took them for bats. After restoring the sportsmen to their boat, we all proceeded for the ship, which we reached by seven o'clock in the morning, not a little fatigued with our expedition. I now learned that our friends the natives returned to their habitation at night, probably foreseeing that rain was at hand, which sort of weather continued the whole of this day. On the morning of the 15th, the weather having cleared up and become fair, I set out with two boats to continue the survey of the northwest side of the bay, accompanied by the two Mr. Forsters and several of the officers, whom I detached in one boat to Goose Cove, where we intended to lodge the night, while I proceeded in the other, examining the harbours and isles which lay in my way. In the doing of this, I picked up about a score of wild fowl and caught fish sufficient to serve the whole party, and reaching the place of rendezvous a little before dark, I found all the gentlemen out duck-shooting. They, however, soon returned, not overloaded with game. By this time the cooks had done their parts, in which little art was required, and after a hearty repast, on what the day had produced, we lay down to rest, but took care to rise early the next morning, in order to have the other bout among the ducks, before we left the cove. Accordingly, at daylight, we prepared for the attack. Those who had reconnoitred the place before, chose their stations accordingly, whilst myself and another remained in the boat, and rowed to the head of the cove to start the game, which we did so effectually, that, out of some scores of ducks, we only detained one to ourselves, sending all the rest down to those stationed below. After this I landed at the head of the cove, and walked across the narrow isthmus that disjoins it from the sea, or rather from another cove which runs in from the sea about one mile, and lies open to the north winds. It, however, had all the appearance of a good harbour and safe anchorage. At the head is a fine sandy beach, where I found an immense number of wood-hens, and brought away ten couple of them, which recompensed me for the trouble of costing the isthmus, through the wet woods up to the middle in water. About nine o'clock we all got collected together, when the success of every one was known, which was by no means answerable to our expectations. The morning, indeed, was very unfavourable for shooting, being rainy the most of the time we were out. After breakfast we set out on our return to the ship, which we reached by seven o'clock in the evening, with about seven dozen of wild fowl and two seals, the most of them shot while I was rowing about, exploring the harbours and coves which we found in my way, every place affording something, especially to us, to whom nothing came amiss. It rained all the 17th, but the 18th bringing fair and clear weather. In the evening our friends, the natives before mentioned, paid us another visit. 
and the next morning the chief and his daughter were induced to come on board, while the others went out in the canoe fishing. Before they came on board, I showed them our goats and sheep that were on shore, which they viewed for a moment with a kind of stupid insensibility. After this I conducted them to the brow, but before the chief set his foot upon it to come into the ship, he took a small green branch in his hand, with which he struck the ship's side several times, repeating a speech or prayer. When this was over, he threw the branch into the main chains, and came on board. This manner and custom of making peace, as it were, is practised by all the nations in the South Seas that I have seen. End of Book One, Chapter Four, Part One Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts. Book One, Chapter Four, Part Two of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume One by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole. Chapter Four Transactions in Dusky Bay with an account of several interviews with the inhabitants. Part 2 I took them both down into the cabin where we were to breakfast. They sat at table with us, but would not taste any of our victuals. The chief wanted to know where we slept, and indeed to pry into every corner of the cabin, every part of which he viewed with some surprise but it was not possible to fix his attention to any one thing a single moment. The works of art appeared to him in the same light as those of nature, and were as far removed beyond his comprehension. What seemed to strike them most was the number and strength of our decks and other parts of the ship. The chief, before he came aboard, presented me with a piece of cloth and a green talc hatchet, to Mr. Forster he also gave a piece of, of cloth, and the girl gave another to Mr. Hodges. This custom of making presents before they receive any is common with the natives of the South Sea Isles, but I never saw it practised in New Zealand before. Of all the various articles I gave my guest, hatchets and spike nails were the most valuable in his eyes. These he would never suffer to go out of his hands after he once laid hold of them, whereas many other articles he would lay carelessly down anywhere, and at last leave them behind him. As soon as I could get quit of them, they were conducted into the gun-room where I left them, and set out with two boats to examine the head of the bay, myself in one accompanied by Mr. Forster and Mr. Hodges, and Lieutenant Cooper in the other. We proceeded up the south side, and without meeting with anything remarkable, got to the head of the bay by sunset, where we took up our lodging for the night, at the first place we could land upon, for the flats hindered us from getting quite to the head. At daylight in the morning I took two men in the small boat, and with Mr. Forster went to take a view of the flat land at the head of the bay, near to where we spent the night. We landed on one side and ordered the boat to meet us on the other side, but had not been long on shore before we saw some ducks which, by their creeping through the bushes, we got a shot at and killed one. The moment we had fired, the natives, whom we had not discovered before, set up a most hideous noise in two or three places close by us. We hallooed in our turn and at the same time retired to our boat, which was full half a mile off. The natives kept up their clamouring noise, but did not follow us. Indeed, we found afterwards that they could not, because of a branch of the river between us and them, nor did we find their number as answerable to the noise they made. As soon as we got to our boat, and found that there was a river that would admit us, I rowed in, and was soon after joined by Mr. Cooper in the other boat. With this reinforcement I proceeded up the river, shooting wild ducks, of which there were great numbers, as we went along, now and then, hearing the natives in the woods. 
At length two appeared on the banks of the river, a man and a woman, and the latter kept waving something white in her hand as a sign of friendship. Mr. Cooper being near them, I called to him to land, as I wanted to take the advantage of the tide to get up as high as possible, which did not much exceed half a mile, when I was stopped by the strength of the stream and great stones that lay in the bed of the river. On my return I found that as Mr. Cooper did not land when the natives expected him, they had retired into the woods, but two others now appeared on the opposite bank. I endeavoured to have an interview with them, but this I could not effect, for as I approached the shore they always retired farther into the woods, which was so thick as to cover them from our sight. The falling tide obliged me to retire out of the river to the place where we had spent the night. There we breakfasted, and afterwards embarked, in order to return on board. But, just as we were going, we saw two men on the opposite shore, hallooing to us, which induced me to row over to them. I landed with two others, unarmed, the two natives standing about one hundred yards from the water-side, with each a spear in his hand. When we three advanced they retired, but stood when I advanced alone. It was some little time before I could prevail upon them to lay down their spears. This at last one of them did, and met me with a grass plant in his hand, one end of which he gave me to hold, while he held the other. Standing in this manner he began a speech, not one word of which I understood, and made some long pauses, waiting, as I thought, for me to answer, for when I spoke he proceeded. As soon as this ceremony was over, which was not long, we saluted each other. He then took out his hahu, or coat, from off his own back and put it upon mine, after which peace seemed firmly established. More people joining us did not in the least alarm them, on the contrary they saluted every one as he came up. I gave to each a hatchet and a knife, having nothing else with me. Perhaps these were the most valuable things I could give them, at least they were the most useful. They wanted us to go to their habitation, telling us they would give us something to eat, and I was sorry that the tide and other circumstances would not permit me to accept of their invitation. More people were seen in the skirts of the wood, but none of them joined us. Probably these were their wives and children. When we took leave they followed us to our boat, and seeing the muskets lying across the stern, they made signs for them to be taken away, which being done they came alongside and assisted us to launch her. At this time it was necessary for us to look well after them, for they wanted to take away everything they could lay their hands upon except the muskets. These they took care not to touch, being taught, by the slaughter they had seen us make among the wild fowl, to look upon them as instruments of death. We saw no canoes or other boats with them. Two or three logs of wood tied together served the same purpose, and were indeed sufficient for the navigation of the river, on the banks of which they lived. Their fish and fowl were in such plenty, that they had no occasion to go far for food, and they have but few neighbours to disturb them. The whole number at this place, I believe, does not exceed three families. It was noon when we took leave of these two men, and proceeded down the north side of the bay, which I explored in my way, and the isles that lie in the middle. Night, however, overtook us, and obliged me to leave one arm unlooked into, and hasten to the ship, which we reached by eight o'clock. I then learned that the man and his daughter stayed on board the day before till noon, and that having understood from our people what things were left in Cascade Cove, the place where they were first seen, he sent and took them away. He and his family remained near us till to-day, when they all went off and we saw them no more, which was the more extraordinary, as he never left us empty-handed. From one or another he did not get less than 
nine or ten hatchets, three or four times that number of large spike nails, besides many other articles. So far as these things may be counted riches in New Zealand, he exceeds every man there, being at this time possessed of more hatchets and axes than are in the whole country besides. In the afternoon of the 21st I went with a party out to the isles on seal-hunting. The surf ran so high that we could only land in one place, where we killed ten. These animals served us for three purposes. The skins we made use of for our rigging, the fat gave oil for our lamps, and the flesh we eat. Their haslets are equal to that of a hog, and the flesh of some of them eats little inferior to beefsteaks. The following day nothing worthy of notice was done. On the morning of the 23rd, Mr. Pickersgill, Mr. Gilbert, and two others went to the Cascade Cove in order to ascend one of the mountains, the summit of which they reached by two o'clock in the afternoon, as we could see by the fire they made. In the evening they returned on board and reported that inland nothing was to be seen but barren mountains with huge craggy precipices, disjoined by valleys, or rather chasms, frightful to behold. On the southeast side of Cape West, four miles out at sea, they discovered a ridge of rocks, on which the waves broke very high. I believe these rocks to be the same we saw the evening we first fell in with the land. Having five geese left out of those we brought from the Cape of Good Hope, I went with them next morning to Goose Cove, named so on this account, where I left them. I chose this place for two reasons. First, there are no inhabitants to disturb them, and secondly, here being the most food, I make no doubt that they, they will breed, and may in time spread over the whole country, and fully answer my intention in leaving them. We spent the day shooting in and about the cove, and returned aboard about ten o'clock in the evening. One of the party shot a white hern, which agreed exactly with Mr. Pennant's description, in his British zoology, of the white herns that either now are, or were formerly, in England. The twentieth was the eighth fair day we had had successively, a circumstance, I believe, very uncommon in this place, especially at this season of the year. This fair weather gave us an opportunity to complete our wood and water, to overhaul the rigging, caulk the ship, and put her in a condition for sea. Fair weather was, however, now at an end for it began to rain this evening, and continued without intermission till noon the next day, when we cast off the shore fasts, hove the ship out of the creek to her anchor, and steadied her with an oarsor to the shore. On the twenty-seventh hazy weather with showers of rain. In the morning I set out, accompanied by Mr. Pickersgill and the two Mr. Forsters, to explore the arm or inlet I discovered the day I returned from the head of the bay. After rowing about two leagues up it, or rather down, I found it to communicate with the sea, and to afford a better outlet for ships bound to the north than the one I came in by. After making this discovery and refreshing ourselves on broiled fish and wild fowl, we set out for the ship and got on board at eleven o'clock at night, leaving two arms we had discovered and which ran into the east unexplored. In this expedition we shot forty-four birds, sea-pies, ducks, etc., without going one foot out of our way, or causing any other delay than picking them up. Having got the tents and every other article on board on the twenty-eighth, we only now waited for a wind to carry us out of the harbour, and through a new passage, the way I proposed to go to sea. Everything being removed from the shore, I set fire to the top wood, etc., in order to dry a piece of the ground we had occupied, which next morning I dug up and sowed with several sorts of garden seeds. The soil was such as did not promise success to the planter. It was, however, the best we could find. At two o'clock in the afternoon, 
we weighed with a light breeze at south-west, and stood up the bay for the new passage. Soon after we had got through, between the east end of Indian Island and the west end of Long Island, it fell calm, which obliged us to anchor in forty-three fathom water, under the north side of the latter island. In the morning of the thirtieth we weighed again with a light breeze at west, which, together with all our boats ahead towing, was hardly sufficient to stem the current. For, after struggling till six o'clock in the evening, and not getting more than five miles from our last anchoring place, we anchored under the north side of Long Island, not more than one hundred yards from the shore, to which we fastened a hawser. 1773, May. At daylight next morning, May 1st, we got again under sail and attempted to work to windward, having a light breeze down the bay. At first we gained ground, but at last the breeze died away, when we soon lost more than we had got, and were obliged to bear up for a cove on the north side of Long Island, where we anchored in nineteen fathom water a muddy bottom. In this cove we found two huts not long since inhabited, and near them two very large fireplaces or ovens, such as they have in the Society Isles. In this cove we were detained by calms, attended with continual rain, till the fourth in the afternoon, when, with the assistance of a small breeze at south-west, we got the length of the reach or passage leading to sea. The breeze then left us, and we anchored under the east point, before a sandy beach, in thirty fathoms water. But this anchoring place hath nothing to recommend it, like the one we came from, which hath everything in its favour. In the night we had some very heavy squalls of wind, attended with rain, hail and snow, and some thunder. Daylight exhibited to our view all the hills and mountains covered with snow. At two o'clock in the afternoon, a light breeze sprung up at south-south-west, which, with the help of our boats, carried us down the passage to our intended anchor-place, where, at eight o'clock, we anchored in sixteen fathoms water, and moored with a hawser to the shore, under the first point on the starboard side as you come in from sea, from which we were covered by the point. In the morning on the 6th, I sent Lieutenant Pickersgill, accompanied by the two Mr. Forsters, to explore the second arm which turns into the east, myself being confined on board by a cold. At the same time I had everything got up from between decks, the decks well cleaned and well aired with fires, a thing that ought never to be long neglected in wet, moist weather. The fair weather, which had continued all this day, was succeeded in the night by a storm from north-west, which blew in hard squalls, attended with rain, and obliged us to strike top-gallant and lower yards, and to carry out another hawser to the shore. The bad weather continued the whole day and the succeeding night, after which it fell calm with fair weather. At seven o'clock in the morning on the 8th, Mr. Pickersgill returned, together with his companions, in no very good plight, having been at the head of the arm he was sent to explore, which he judged to extend in to the eastward about eight miles. In it is a good anchoring place, wood, fresh water, wild fowl and fish. At nine o'clock I set out to explore the other inlet, or the one next the sea, and ordered Mr. Gilbert, the master, to go and examine the passage out to sea, while those on board were getting everything in readiness to depart. I proceeded up the inlet till five o'clock in the afternoon, when bad weather obliged me to return before I had seen the end of it. As this inlet lay nearly parallel with the sea coast, I was of opinion that it might communicate with Doubtful Harbour, or some other inlet to the northward. Appearances were, however, against this opinion, and the bad weather hindered me from determining the point, although a few hours would have done it. I was about ten miles up, and thought I saw the end of it. I found on the north side three coves in which, as also on the south side, 
between the main and the isles that lie four miles up the inlet, is good anchorage. Wood, water, and what else can be expected, such as fish and wild fowl. Of the latter we killed in this excursion three dozen. After a very hard row, against both wind and rain, we got on board about nine o'clock at night, without a dry thread on our backs. This bad weather continued no longer than till the next morning when it became fair, and the sky cleared up. But, as we had not wind to carry us to sea, we made up two shooting parties, myself accompanied by the two Mr. Forsters and some others, went to the area I was in the day before, and the other party to the coves and isles Mr. Gilbert had discovered when he was out, and where he found many wild fowl. We had a pleasant day, and the evening brought us all on board. Myself and party met with good sport, but the other party found little. All the forenoon of the tenth we had strong gales from the west, attended with heavy showers of rain, and blowing in such flurries over high land, as made it unsafe for us to get under sail. The afternoon was more moderate and became fair, when myself, Mr. Cooper, and some others, went out in the boat to the rocks, which lie at the entrance of the bay, to kill seals. The weather was rather unfavourable for this sport, and the sea ran high, so as to make landing difficult. We, however, killed ten, but could only wait to bring away five, with which we returned on board. In the morning of the eleventh, while we were getting under sail, I sent a boat for the other five seals. At nine o'clock we weighed with a light breeze at south-east, and stood out to sea, taking up the boat in our way. It was noon before we got clear of the land, at which time we observed in forty-five degrees thirty-four minutes thirty seconds south. The entrance of the bay bore south-east by east, and breaks the isles, the outermost isles that lie at the south point of the entrance of the bay, bore south-south-east, distant three miles. The southernmost point, or that of Five Fingers Point, bore south forty-two degrees west, and the northernmost land north-northeast. In this situation we had a prodigious swell from the south-west, which broke with great violence on all the shores that were exposed to it. End of Book One Chapter Four Part Two Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts Book One Chapter Five of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World Volume One by James Cook This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole Chapter 5 Directions for Sailing In and Out of Dusky Bay With an Account of the Adjacent Country, Its Produce and Inhabitants, Astronomical and Nautical Observations, 1773 May As there are few places where I have been in New Zealand that afford the necessary refreshments, in such plenty as Dusky Bay, a short description of it, and of the adjacent country, may prove of use to some future navigators, as well as acceptable to the curious reader. For although this country be far remote from the present trading part of the world, we can, by no means, tell what use future ages may make of the discoveries made in the present. The reader of this journal must already know that there are two entrances to this bay. The south entrance is situated on the north side of Cape West, in latitude 45 degrees 48 minutes south. It is formed by the land of the Cape to the south, and Five Fingers Point to the north. This point is made remarkable by several pointed rocks lying off it, which, when viewed from certain situations, have some resemblance to the five fingers of a man's hand, from whence it takes its name. The land of this point is still more remarkable by the little similarity it bears to any other of the lands adjacent, being a narrow peninsula lying north and south of a moderate and equal height, and all covered with wood. To sail into the bay by this entrance is by no means difficult, 
as I know of no danger but what shows itself. The worst that attends it is the depth of water, which is too great to admit of anchorage, except in the coves and harbours, and very near the shores. And even in many places this last cannot be done. The anchoring places are, however, numerous enough, and equally safe and commodious. Pickersgill Harbour, where we lay, is not inferior to any other bay for two or three ships. It is situated on the south shore abreast of the west end of Indian Island, which island may be known from the others by its greater proximity to that shore. There is a passage into the harbour on both sides of the isle, which lies before it. The most room is on the upper or east side, having regard to a sunken rock, near the main, abreast this end of the isle. Keep the isle close aboard, and you will not only avoid the rock, but keep in anchoring ground. The next place on this side is Cascade Cove, where there is room for a fleet of ships, and also a passage in on either side of the isle, which lies in the entrance, taking care to avoid a sunken rock which lies near the south, east shore, a little above the isle. This rock, as well as the one in Pickersgill Harbour, may be seen at half ebb. It must be needless to enumerate all the anchoring places in this capacious bay. The north entrance lies in the latitude of 45 degrees 38 minutes south, and five leagues to the north of Five Fingers Point. To make this entrance plain it will be necessary to approach the shore within a few miles, as all the land within and on each side is of considerable height. Its situation may, however, be known at a greater distance, as it lies under the first craggy mountains which rise to the north of the land of Five Fingers Point. The southernmost of these mountains is remarkable, having at its summit two small hillocks. When this mountain bears south-south-east, you will be before the entrance, on the south side of which are several isles. The westernmost and outermost is the most considerable both for height and circuit, and this I have called Breaksea Isle, because it effectually covers this entrance from the violence of the south-west swell, which the other entrance is so much exposed to. In sailing in, you leave this isle, as well as all the others, to the south. The best anchorage is in the first or north arm, which is on the larboard hand going in, either in one of the coves, or between the isles that lie under the south-east shore. The country is exceedingly mountainous, not only about Dusky Bay, but through all the southern part of the western coast of Tavai, Panamu. A prospect more rude and craggy is rarely to be met with, for inland appears nothing but the summits of mountains of a stupendous height, and consisting of rocks that are totally barren and naked, except where they are covered with snow. But the land bordering on the sea coast and all the islands are thickly clothed with wood, almost down to the water's edge. The trees are of various kinds, such as are common to other parts of this country, and are fit for the shipwright, house carpenter, cabinet maker, and many other uses. Except in the river Thames, I have not seen finer timber in all New Zealand, both here and in that river, the most considerable for size is the spruce tree, as we called it. From the similarity of its foliage to the American spruce, though the wood is more ponderous, and bears a greater resemblance to the pitch pine. Many of these trees are from six to eight and ten feet in girth, and from sixty to eighty or one hundred feet in length, large enough to make a mainmast for a fifty-gun ship. Here are, as well as in all other parts of New Zealand, a great number of aromatic trees and shrubs, most of the myrtle kind, but amidst all this variety we met with none which bore fruit fit to eat. In many parts the woods are so overrun with supple jacks that it is scarcely possible to force one's way among them. I have seen several which were fifty or sixty fathoms long. The soil is a deep black mould, evidently composed of decayed vegetables, 
and so loose that it sinks under you at every step. And this may be the reason why we meet with so many large trees as we do, blown down by the wind, even in the thickest part of the woods. All the ground amongst the trees is covered with moss and fern, of both which there is a great variety. But except the flax or hemp plant, and a few other plants, there is very little herbage of any sort, and none that was eatable that we found, except about a handful of watercresses, and about the same quantity of celery. What Dusky Bay most abounds with is fish. A boat with six or eight men, with hooks and lines, caught daily sufficient to serve the whole ship's company. Of this article the variety is almost equal to the plenty, and of such kinds as are common to the more northern coast, but some are superior, and in particular the coal-fish, as we called it, which is both larger and finer flavoured than any I had seen before, and was, in the opinion of most on board, the highest luxury the sea afforded us. The shellfish are mussels, cockles, scallops, crayfish, and many other sorts, all such as are to be found in every other part of the coast. The only amphibious animals are seals. These are to be found in great numbers about this bay, on the small rocks and isles near the sea coasts. We found here five different kinds of ducks, some of which I do not recollect to have anywhere seen before. The largest are as big as a muscovy duck, with a very beautiful variegated plumage, on which account we called it the painted duck, both male and female having a large white spot in each wing. The head and neck of the latter is white, but all the other feathers, as well as those on the head and neck of the drake, are of a dark variegated colour. The second sort have a brown plumage, with bright green feathers in their wings, and are about the size of an English tame duck. The third sort is the blue-grey duck, before mentioned, or the whistling duck, as some call them, from the whistling noise they made. What is most remarkable in these is, that the end of their beaks is soft, and of a skinny, or more properly, cartilaginous substance. The fourth sort is something bigger than a teal, and all black except the drake, which has some white feathers in his wings. There are but few of this sort, and we saw them nowhere but in the river at the head of the bay. The last sort is a good deal like a teal, and very common, I am told, in England. The other fowls, whether belonging to the sea and land, are the same that are to be found in common in other parts of this country, except the brew petrol before mentioned, and the water or wood hens. These last, although they are numerous enough here, are so scarce in other parts that I never saw but one. The reason may be that, as they cannot fly, they inhabit the skirts of the woods and feed on the sea beach, and are so very tame or foolish as to stand and stare at us till we knock them down with a stick. The natives may have, in a manner, wholly destroyed them. They are a sort of rail about the size and a good deal like a common dunghill hen. Most of them are of a dirty black or dark brown colour, and eat very well in a pie or fricassee. Amongst the small birds I must not omit to particularise the wattle bird, poi bird and fantail, on account of their singularity, especially as I find they are not mentioned in the narrative of my former voyage. The wattle bird, so called, because it has two wattles under its beak, as large as those of a small dunghill cock, is larger, particularly in length, than an English blackbird. Its bill is short and thick, and its feathers of a dark lead colour. The colour of its wattles is a dull yellow, almost an orange colour. The poi bird is less than the wattle bird. The feathers of a fine mazarine blue, except those of its neck, which are of a most beautiful silver grey, and two or three short white ones, which are on the pinion joint of the wing. Under its throat hang two little tufts of curled snow-white feathers, called its poise, which being the Otaheitan word for earrings, occasioned our giving that name to the bird, 
which is not more remarkable for the beauty of its plumage than for the sweetness of its note. The flesh is also most delicious, and was the greatest luxury the woods afforded us. Of the fantail there are different sorts, but the body of the most remarkable one is scarcely larger than a good filbert, yet it spreads a tail of most beautiful plumage, full three-quarters of a semicircle, of at least four or five inches radius. For three or four days after we arrived in Pickersgill Harbour, and as we were clearing the woods to set up our tents, etc., a four-footed animal was seen by three or four of our people, but as no two gave the same description of it, I cannot say of what kind it is. All, however, agreed that it was about the size of a cat, with short legs and of a mouse collar. One of the seamen, and he who had the best view of it, said that it had a bushy tail, and was most like a jackal of any animal he knew. The most probable conjecture is that it is of a new species. Be this as it may, we are now certain that this country is not so destitute of quadrupeds as was once thought. The most mischievous animals here are the small black sand-flies, which are very numerous, and so troublesome that they exceed everything of the kind I ever met with. Whenever they bite they cause a swelling, and such an intolerable itching, that it is not possible to refrain from scratching, which at last brings on ulcers like the smallpox. The almost continual rains may be mentioned another evil attending this bay, though perhaps this may only happen at this season of the year. Nevertheless, the situation of the country, the vast height, and the nearness of the mountains, seem to subject it to much rain at all times. Our people, who were daily exposed to the rain, felt no ill effects from it. On the contrary, such as were sick and ailing when we came in, recovered daily, and the whole crew soon became strong and vigorous, which can only be attributed to the healthiness of the place, and the fresh provisions it afforded. The beer certainly contributed not a little. As I have already observed, we at first made it of a decoction of the spruce leaves, but finding that this alone made the beer too astringent, we afterwards mixed it with an equal quantity of the tea plant, a name it obtained in my former voyage, from our using it as tea then, as we also did now, which partly destroyed the astringency of the other, and made the beer exceedingly palatable, and esteemed by every one on board. We brewed it in the same manner as spruce beer, and the process is as follows. First, make a strong decoction of the small branches of the spruce and tea plants, by boiling them three or four hours, or until the bark will strip with ease from off the branches. Then take them out of the copper and put in the proper quantity of molasses, ten gallons of which is sufficient to make a ton, or two hundred and forty gallons of beer. Let this mixture just boil, and pot it into the casks, and to it add an equal quantity of cold water, more or less, according to the strength of the decoction or your taste. When the whole is milk warm, put in a little grounds of beer, or yeast if you have it, or anything else that will cause fermentation, and in a few days the beer will be fit to drink. After the casks have been brewed in two or three times, the beer will generally ferment itself, especially if the weather is warm. As I had inspissated juice of wort on board, and could not apply it to a better purpose, we used it together with molasses or sugar to make these two articles go further. For of the former I had but one cask, and of the latter little to spare for this brewing. Had I known how well this beer would have succeeded, and the great use it was of to the people, I should have come better provided. Indeed, I was partly discouraged by an experiment made during my former voyage, which did not succeed then, owing, as I now believe, to some mismanagement. Any one who is in the least acquainted with spruce pines will find the tree which I have distinguished by that name. There are three sorts of it. That which has the smallest leaves and deepest colour is the sort we brewed with, 
but doubtless all three might safely serve that purpose. The tea plant is a small tree or shrub with five white petals or flower leaves shaped like those of a rose, having smaller ones of the same figure in the intermediate spaces and twenty or more filaments or threads. The tree sometimes grows to a moderate height and is generally bare on the lower part with a number of small branches growing close together towards the top. The leaves are small and pointed, like those of the myrtle. It bears a dry roundish seed case, and grows commonly in dry places near the shores. The leaves, as I have already observed, were used by many of us as tea, which has a very agreeable bitter and flavour when they are recent but loses some of both when they are dried. When the infusion was made strong, it proved emetic to some, in the same manner as green tea. The inhabitants of this bay are of the same race as people with those in the other parts of the country, speak the same language, and observe nearly the same customs. These indeed seem to have a custom of making presents before they receive any, in which they come nearer to the Otaheitans than the rest of their countrymen. What could induce three or four families, for I believe there are not more, to separate themselves so far from the society of the rest of their fellow creatures, is not easy to guess. By our meeting with inhabitants in this place, it seems probable that there are people scattered all over this southern island. But the many vestiges of them in different parts of this bay, compared with the number we actually saw, indicates that they live a wandering life, and if one may judge from appearances and circumstances, few as they are, they live not in perfect amity, one family with another. For if they did, why do they not form themselves into some society, a thing not only natural to man, but observed even by the brute creation? I should conclude this account of Dusky Bay with some observations made and communicated to me by Mr. Wales. He found, by a great variety of observations, that the latitude of his observatory at Pickersgill Harbour was 45 degrees 47 minutes 26 seconds half south, and by the mean of several distances of the moon from the sun, that its longitude was 106 degrees 18 minutes east, which is about half a degree less than it is laid down in my chart, constructed in my former voyage. He found the variation of the needle or compass, by the mean of three different needles, to be 13 degrees 49 minutes east, and the dip of the south end, 70 degrees 5 minutes 3 quarters. The times of high water, on the full and change days, he found to be 10 degrees 57 minutes and the tide to rise and fall at the former eight feet, at the latter time five feet eight inches. This difference in the rise of the tides between the new and full moon is a little extraordinary, and was probably occasioned at this time by some accidental cause, such as winds, etc. But be that as it will, I am well assured there was no error in the observations. Supposing the longitude of the observatory to be as above, the error of Mr. Kendall's watch in longitude will be 1 degree 48 minutes minus, and that of Mr. Arnold's 39 degrees 25 minutes. The former was found to be gaining 6 minutes 0.461 a day on mean time, and the latter losing 99 seconds 0.361. Agreeably to these rates, the longitude by them was to be determined, until an opportunity of trying them again. I must observe that in finding the longitude by Mr. Kendall's watch, we suppose it to have gone mean time from the Cape of Good Hope. Had its Cape rate been allowed, the error would not have been so great. End of Book 1 Chapter 5 Recording by David Cole Medway, Massachusetts. Book One, Chapter Six of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume One by James Cook. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole. Chapter Six. Passage from Dusky Bay to Queen Charlotte's Sound, with an account of some water spouts, and of our joining the adventure. Seventeen seventy three, May. After leaving Dusky Bay, as hath been already mentioned, I directed my course along shore for Queen Charlotte's Sound, where I expected to find the adventure. In this passage we met with nothing remarkable or worthy of notice till the seventeenth at four o'clock in the afternoon. Being then about three leagues to the westward of Cape Stephens, having a gentle gale at west by south and clear weather. The wind at once flattened to a calm, the sky became suddenly obscured by dark dense clouds, and seemed to forebode much wind. This occasioned us to clue up to all our sails, and presently after six water-spouts were seen. Four rose and spent themselves between us and the land, that is, to the south-west of us, the fifth was without us, the sixth first appeared in the south-west, at a distance of two or three miles at least from us. Its progressive motion was to the north-east, not in a straight but in a crooked line, and passed within fifty yards of our stern, without our feeling any of its effects. The diameter of the base of this spout I judged to be about fifty or sixty feet. That is, the sea within this space was much agitated, and foamed up to a great height. From this a tube or round body was formed, by which the water or air or both was carried in a spiral stream up to the clouds. Some of our people said that they saw a bird in the one near us, which was whirled round like the fly of a jack as it was carried upwards. During the time these spouts lasted, we had now and then light puffs of wind from all points of the compass, with some few slight showers of rain, which generally fell in large drops, and the weather continued dark and hazy for some hours after, with variable light breezes of wind. At length the wind fixed in its old point, and the sky resumed its former serenity. Some of these spouts appeared at times to be stationary, and at other times to have a quick but very unequal progressive motion, and always in a crooked line, sometimes one way and sometimes another, so that, once or twice, we observed them to cross each other. From the ascending motion of the bird, and several other circumstances, it was very plain to us that these spouts were caused by whirlwinds, and that the water in them was violently hurried upwards, and did not descend from the clouds, as I have heard some assert. The first appearance of them is by the violent agitation rising up of the water, and presently after you see a round column or tube forming from the clouds above, which apparently descends till it joins the agitated water below. I say apparently because I believe it not to be so in reality, but that the tube is already formed from the agitated water below and ascends, though at first it is either too small or too thin to be seen. When the tube is formed or becomes visible, its apparent diameter increaseth till it is pretty large, after that it decreaseth, and at last it breaks or becomes invisible towards the lower part. Soon after the sea below resumes its natural state, and the tube is drawn, by little and little, up to the clouds where it is dissipated. The same tube would sometimes have a vertical and sometimes a crooked or inclined direction. The most rational account I have read of water spouts is in Mr. Falconer's Marine Dictionary, which is chiefly collected from the philosophical writings of the ingenious Dr. Franklin. I have been told that the firing of a gun will dissipate them, and I am very sorry I did not try the experiment, as we were near enough and had a gun ready for the purpose. But as soon as the danger was past, I thought no more about it, being too attentive to viewing these extraordinary meteors. At the same time this happened, 
the barometer stood at twenty nine seventy five and the thermometer at fifty six in coming from Cape Farewell to Cape Stephens, I had a better view of the coast than I had when I passed in my former voyage, and observed that about six leagues to the east of the first mentioned cape is a spacious bay, which is covered from the sea by a low point of land. This is, I believe, the same that Captain Tasman anchored in on the 18th of December, 1642, and by him called Murderer's Bay, by reason of some of his men being killed by the natives. Blind Bay, so named by me in my former voyage, lies to the south-east of this, and seems to run a long way inland to the south, the site in this direction not being bounded by any land. The wind having returned to the west, as already mentioned, we resumed our course to the east, and at daylight the next morning, being the 18th, we appeared off Queen Charlotte's Sound, where we discovered our consort the adventure, by the signal she made to us, an event which every one felt with an agreeable satisfaction. The fresh westerly wind now died away, and was succeeded by light airs from the south and southwest, so that we had to work in with our boats ahead towing. In the doing of this we discovered a rock, which we did not see in my former voyage, it lies in the direction of south by east to half east, distant four miles from the outermost of the two brothers, and in a line with the white rocks, on with the middle of Long Island. It is just even with the surface of the sea, and hath deep water all round it. At noon, Lieutenant Kemp of the Adventure came on board, from whom I learnt that their ship had been here about six weeks. With the assistance of a light breeze, our boats and the tides, we at six o'clock in the evening got to an anchor in Ship Cove, near the Adventure, when Captain Furneaux came on board, and gave me the following account of his proceedings, from the time we parted to my arrival here. End of Book One, Chapter Six Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts Book One, Chapter Seven of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume One by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole. Chapter Seven Captain Furneaux's Narrative From the Time the Two Ships Were Separated to their joining again in Queen Charlotte's Sound, with some account of Van Diemen's Land. 1773 February On the 7th of February, 1773, in the morning, the resolution then being about two miles ahead, the wind shifting then to the westward, brought on a very thick fog, so that we lost sight of her. We soon after heard a gun, the report of which we imagined to be on the larboard beam. We then hauled up south-east, and kept firing a four-pounder every half-hour, but had no answer nor further sight of her. Then we kept the course we steered on before the fog came on. In the evening it began to blow hard, and was at intervals more clear, but could see nothing of her, which gave us much uneasiness. We then tacked and stood to the westward, to cruise in the place where we last saw her, according to agreement in case of separation. But next day came on a very heavy gale of wind and thick weather, that obliged us to bring to, and thereby prevented us reaching the intended spot. However, the wind coming more moderate, and the fog in some measure clearing away, we cruised as near the place as we could get for three days, when, giving over all hopes of joining company again, we bore away for winter quarters, distant fourteen hundred leagues, through a sea entirely unknown, and reduced the allowance of water to one quart per day. We kept between the latitude of fifty-two and fifty-three degrees south, had much westerly wind, hard gales with squalls, snow and sleet, with a long hollow sea from the southwest, 
so that we judge there is no land in that quarter. After we reached the longitude of ninety-five degrees east, we found the variation decrease very fast. On the twenty-sixth at night we saw a meteor of uncommon brightness in the north-northwest. It directed its course to the southwest, with a very great light in the southern sky, such as is known to the northward by the name of Aurora Borealis or Northern Lights. We saw the light for several nights running, and what is remarkable, we saw but one ice island after we parted company with the resolution, till our making land, though we were most of the time two or three degrees to the southward of the latitude we first saw it in. We were daily attended by great numbers of sea birds and frequently saw porpoises curiously spotted white and black. 1773 March On the 1st of March we were alarmed with a cry of land by the man at the masthead on the larboard beam, which gave us great joy. We immediately hauled our wind and stood for it, but to our mortification were disappointed in a few hours, for what we took to be land proved no more than clouds, which disappeared as we sailed towards them. We then bore away and directed our course towards the land laid down in the charts by the name of Van Diemen's Land, discovered by Tasman in 1642, and laid down in the latitude 44 degrees south and longitude 140 degrees east, and supposed to join to New Holland. On the 9th of March, having little wind and pleasant weather, about 9 a.m., being then in the latitude of 43 degrees 37 minutes south, longitude by lunar observation, 145 degrees 36 minutes east, and by account 143 degrees 10 minutes east from Greenwich, we saw the land bearing north-north-east about eight or nine leagues distant. It appeared moderately high and uneven near the sea. The hills farther back formed a double land and much higher. There seemed to be several islands or broken land to the northwest, as the shore trenched, but by reason of clouds that hung over them, we could not be certain whether they did not join to the main. We hauled immediately up for it, and by noon were within three or four leagues of it. A point much like the ramhead off Plymouth, which I take to be the same that Tasman calls South Cape, bore north four leagues off us. The land from this cape runs directly to the eastward. About four leagues along shore are three islands about two miles long, and several rocks resembling the Mewstone, particularly one which we so named, about four or five leagues east-south-east, half-east, off the above cape, which Tasman has not mentioned, or laid down in his drafts. After you pass these islands, the land lies east by north and west by south by the compass nearly. It is a bold shore, and seems to afford several bays or anchoring places, but believe deep water. From the southwest cape, which is in the latitude of 43 degrees 39 minutes south, and longitude 145 degrees 50 minutes east, to the southeast cape, in the latitude 43 degrees 36 minutes south, longitude 147 degrees east, is nearly sixteen leagues, and sounding from forty-eight to seventy fathoms, sand and broken shells three or four leagues offshore. Here the country is hilly and full of trees, the shore rocky and difficult landing, occasioned by the wind blowing here continually from the westward, which occasions such a surf that the sand cannot lie on the shore. We saw no inhabitants here. The morning on the 10th of March being calm, the ship then about four miles from the land, sent the great cutter on shore with a second lieutenant, to find if there was any harbour or good bay. Soon after, it beginning to blow very hard, made the signal for the boat to return several times, but they did not see or hear anything of it, the ship then three or four leagues off, that we could not see anything of the boat, which gave us great uneasiness, as there was a very great sea. At half-past one p.m., 
To our great satisfaction, the boat returned on board safe. They landed, but with much difficulty, and saw several places where the Indians had been, and one they lately had left, where they had a fire, with a great number of pearl escalop shells round it, which shells they brought on board with some burnt sticks and green boughs. There was a path from this place through the woods, which in all probability leads to their habitations, but by reason of the weather had not time to pursue it. The soil seems to be very rich. The country well clothed with wood, particularly on the lee side of the hills, plenty of water which falls from the rocks in beautiful cascades, for two or three hundred feet perpendicular into the sea but they did not see the least sign of any place to anchor in with safety. Hoisted in the boat, and made sail for Frederick Henry Bay. From noon to 3 p.m., running along shore east by north, at which time we were abreast of the westernmost point of a very deep bay, called by Tasman Stormy Bay. From the west to the east point of this bay there are several small islands and black rocks, which we call the Friars. While crossing this bay, we had very heavy squalls and thick weather. At times when it cleared up, I saw several fires in the bottom of the bay, which is near two or three leagues deep, and has, I doubt not, good places for anchoring. But the weather being so bad, did not think it safe to stand into it. From the Friars the land trenches away about north by east four leagues. We had smooth water and kept in shore, having regular soundings from twenty to fifteen fathoms water. At half past six we hauled round a high bluff point, the rocks whereof were like so many fluted pillars, and had ten fathoms water, fine sand, within half a mile of the shore. At seven, being abreast of a fine bay, and having little wind, we came to, with a small bower in twenty-four fathoms, sandy bottom. Just after we anchored, being a fine clear evening, had a good observation of the star Antares and the moon, which gave the longitude of 147 degrees 34 minutes east, being in the latitude of 43 degrees 20 minutes south. We first took this bay to be that which Tasman called Frederick Henry Bay, but afterwards found that his is laid down five leagues to the northward of this. At daybreak the next morning I sent the master in shore to sound the bay, and to find out a watering place. At eight he returned, having found a most excellent harbour, clear ground from side to side, from eighteen to five fathom water all over the bay, gradually decreasing as you go in shore. We weighed and turned up into the bay, the wind being westerly and very little of it, which baffled us much in getting in. At seven o'clock in the evening we anchored in seven fathoms water with a small bower, and moored with a coasting anchor to the westward, the north point of the bay north-north-east a half-east, which we take to be Tasman's Head, and the easternmost point, which we named Penguin Island, from the curious one we caught there, north-east by east three-quarter east. The watering place west a half north, about one mile from the shore on each side. Maria's Island, which is about five or six leagues off, shut in with both points, so that you are quite landlocked in a most spacious harbour. We lay here five days, which time was employed in wooding and watering, which is easily got, and overhauling the rigging. We found the country very pleasant, the soil a black, rich, though thin one, the sides of the hills covered with large trees and very thick, growing to a great height before they branch off. They are all of the evergreen kind, different from any I ever saw. The wood is very brittle and easily split. There is a very little variety of sorts, having seen but two. The leaves of one are long and narrow, and the seed, of which I got a few, is in the shape of a button, and has a very agreeable smell. The leaves of the other are like the bay, 
and it has a seed like the white thorn, with an agreeable spicy taste and smell. Out of the trees we cut down for firewood, there issued some gum, which the surgeon called gum lac. The trees are mostly burnt or scorched near to the ground, occasioned by the natives setting fire to the underwood, in the most frequented places, and by these means they have rendered it easy walking. The land birds we saw are a bird like a raven, some of the crow kind, black with the tips of the feathers of the tail and wings white, their bill long and very sharp, some paroquets, and several kinds of small birds. The sea-fowl are ducks, teal, and the sheldrake. I forgot to mention a large white bird that one of the gentlemen shot, about the size of a large kite of the eagle kind. As for beasts, we saw but one, which was an opossum, but we observed the dung of some, which we judged to be of the deer kind. The fish in the bay are scarce. Those we caught were mostly sharks, dogfish, and a fish called by the seamen nurses, like the dogfish, only full of small white spots, and some small fish, not unlike sprats. The lagoons, which are brackish, abound with trout, and several other sorts of fish, of which we caught a few with lines, but being much encumbered with stumps of trees, we could not haul the seine. While we lay here, we saw several smokes and large fires, about eight or ten miles inshore to the northward, but did not see any of the natives, though they frequently come into this bay, as there were several wigwams or huts, where we found some bags and nets made of grass, in which I imagine they carry their provisions and other necessaries. In one of them there was the stone they strike fire with, and tinder made of bark, but of what tree could not be distinguished. We found in one of their huts one of their spears, which was made sharp at one end, I suppose with a shell or stone. These things we brought away, leaving in the room of them medals, gunflints, a few nails, and an old empty barrel with the iron hoops on it. They seem to be quite ignorant of every sort of metal. The bows of which their huts are made are either broken or split, and tied together with grass in a circular form, the largest end stuck in the ground, and the smaller parts meeting in a point at the top, and covered with fern and bark, so poorly done, that they will hardly keep out a shower of rain. In the middle is the fireplace, surrounded with heaps of mussel, pearl, scallop, and crayfish shells, which I believe to be their chief food, though we could not find any of them. They lie on the ground, on dried grass, round the fire, and I believe they have no settled place of habitation, as their houses seem built only for a few days, but wander about in small parties from place to place in search of food and are actuated by no other motive. We never found more than three or four huts in a place, capable of containing three or four persons each only. And what is remarkable, we never saw the least marks either of canoe or boat, and it is generally thought they have none, being altogether, from what we could judge, a very ignorant and wretched set of people, though natives of a country, capable of producing every necessary of life, and a climate the finest in the world. We found not the least signs of any minerals or metals. Having completed our wood and water, we sailed from Adventure Bay, intending to coast it up along shore, till we should fall in with the land seen by Captain Cook, and discover whether Van Diemen's land joins with New Holland. On the 16th we passed Maria's Islands, so named by Tasman. They appear to be the same as the mainland. On the 17th, having passed Shouten's Islands, we hauled in for the mainland, and stood along shore at a distance of two or three leagues off. The country here appears to be very thickly inhabited, as there was a continual fire along shore as we sailed. The land hereabouts is much pleasanter, low and even, but no signs of a harbour or bay, 
where a ship might anchor with safety. The weather being bad and blowing hard at south-southeast, we could not send a boat on shore to have any intercourse with the inhabitants. In the latitude of forty degrees fifty minutes south, the land trenches away to the westward, which I believe forms a deep bay, as we saw from the deck several smokes arising aback of the islands that lay before it, when we could not see the least signs of land from the masthead. From the latitude of forty degrees fifty minutes south to the latitude of thirty nine degrees fifty minutes south is nothing but islands and shoals, the land high, rocky, and barren. On the 19th, in the latitude of 40 degrees 30 minutes south, observing breakers about half a mile within shore of us, we sounded, and finding but eight fathoms, immediately hauled off, deepened our water to fifteen fathoms, then bore away and kept along shore again. From the latitude of 39 degrees 50 minutes to 39 degrees south, we saw no land but had regular soundings from fifteen to thirty fathoms. As we stood on to the northward, we made land again in about thirty-nine degrees, after which we discontinued our northerly course, as we found the ground very uneven and shoal water some distance off. I think it is a very dangerous shore to fall in with. The coast from Adventure Bay to the place where we stood away for New Zealand lies in the direction south or half-west and north or half-east, about seventy-five leagues, and it is my opinion that there are no straits between New Holland and Van Diemen's Land, but a very deep bay. I should have stood farther to the northward, but the wind blowing strong at south-south-east, and looking likely to haul round to the eastward, which would have blown right on the land, I therefore thought it more proper to leave the coast and steer for New Zealand. After we left Van Diemen's Land, we had very uncertain weather, with rain and very heavy gusts of wind. On the 24th we were surprised with a very severe squall, which reduced us from top-gallant sails to reefed courses in the space of an hour. The sea rising equally quick, we shipped many waves, one of which stove the large cutter, and drove the small one from her lashing in the waist, and with much difficulty we saved her from being washed overboard. This gale lasted twelve hours, after which we had more moderate weather, intermixed with calms. We frequently hoisted out the boats to try the currents, and in general found a small drift to the west-southwest. We shot many birds, and had, upon the whole, good weather, but as we got near to the land it came on thick and dirty for several days, till we made the coast of New Zealand, in forty degrees thirty minutes south, having made twenty-four degrees of longitude from Adventure Bay, after a passage of fifteen days. We had the winds much southerly in this passage, and I was under some apprehensions of not being able to fetch the straits, which would have obliged us to steer away for George's Island. I would therefore advise any who sail to this part to keep to the southward, particularly in the fall of the year, when the south and southeast winds prevail. 1773 April The land, when we first made it, appeared high, and formed a confused jumble of hills and mountains. We steered along shore to the northward, but were much retarded in our course by reason of the swell from the northeast. At noon on the 3rd of April, Cape Farewell, which is the south point of the entrance of the west side of the straits, bore east by north a half north, by the compass three or four leagues distant. About eight o'clock we entered the straits and steered north-east till midnight, then brought to till daylight, and had soundings from forty-five to fifty-eight fathoms, sand and broken shells. At daylight made sail and steered south-east by east, had light airs, Mount Egmont north-north-east, eleven or twelve leagues, and Point Stevens south-east or half-east, seven leagues. At noon, Mount Egmont north by east, twelve leagues, 
Stevens Island, southeast, five leagues. In the afternoon we put the dredge overboard in sixty-five fathoms, but caught nothing except a few small scallops, two or three oysters and broken shells. Standing to the eastward for Charlotte Sound, with a light breeze at northwest in the morning on the fifth, Stevens Island bearing southwest by west four leagues, we were taken aback with a strong easterly gale, which obliged us to haul our wind to the southeast, and work to windward up under Port Jackson. The course from Stevens Island to Point Jackson is nearly southeast by the compass, eleven leagues distance depth of water from forty to thirty-two fathoms sandy ground. As we stood off and on we fired several guns, but saw no signs of any inhabitants. In the afternoon at half-past two o'clock, finding the tide set the ship to the westward, we anchored with a coasting anchor in thirty-nine fathoms water, muddy ground. Point Jackson, southeast to half-east three leagues, the east point of an inlet, about four leagues to the westward of Point Jackson, and which appears to be a good harbour, southwest by west to half-west. At 8 p.m. the tide slackening, we weighed and made sail, having while at anchor caught several fish with hook and line, and found the tide to run to the westward, at a rate of two and a half knots per hour. Standing to the east, we found no ground at seventy fathoms, off Point Jackson, north-northwest, two leagues. At eight the next morning had the sound open, but the wind being down, it obliged us to work up under the western shore, as the tide sets up strong there when it runs down in mid-channel. At ten the tide being done, was obliged to come to with the best bower in thirty-eight fathoms, close to some white rocks. Point Jackson bearing northwest a half north, the northernmost of the brothers east by south, and the middle of Entry Island, which lies on the north side of the straits northeast. We made fifteen degrees thirty minutes east variation in the straits. As we sailed up the sound, we saw the tops of high mountains covered with snow, which remains all the year. When the tide slackened, we weighed and sailed up the sound and about five o'clock on the seventh anchored in Ship Cove, in ten fathoms water, muddy ground, and moored the best bower to the north-north-east and small to south-south-west. In the night we heard the howling of dogs, and people hallooing on the east shore. The two following days were employed in clearing a place on Motuara Island for erecting our tents for the sick having then several on board much afflicted with the scurvy, the sailmakers and coopers. On the top of the island was a post erected by the Endeavour's people, with her name and time of departure on it. On the ninth we were visited by three canoes with about sixteen of the natives, and to induce them to bring us fish and other provisions, we gave them several things, with which they seemed highly pleased. One of our young gentlemen, seeing something wrapped up in a better manner than common, had the curiosity to examine what it was, and to his great surprise found it to be the head of a man lately killed. They were very apprehensive of its being forced from them, and particularly the man who seemed most interested in it, whose very flesh crept on his bones for fear of being punished by us as Captain Cook had expressed his great abhorrence of this unnatural act. They used every method to conceal the head, by shifting it from one to another, and by signs endeavouring to convince us that there was no such thing amongst them, though we had seen it but a few minutes before. They then took their leave of us and went on shore. They frequently mentioned Tupia, which was the name of the native of George's Island, or Otaheite, brought here by the Endeavour, and who died at Batavia, and when we told them he was dead, some of them seemed to be very much concerned, and, as well as we could understand them, wanted to know whether we killed him, or if he died a natural death. By these questions they are the same tribe Captain Cook saw. 
In the afternoon they returned again with fish and fern roots, which they sold for nails and other trifles, though the nails are what they set the most value on. The man and woman who had the head did not come off again. Having a catalogue of words in their language, we called several things by name, which surprised them greatly. They wanted it much, and offered a great quantity of fish for it. Next morning they returned again, to the number of fifty or sixty, with their chief at their head, as we supposed, in five double canoes. They gave us their implements of war, stone hatchets and clothes, etc., for nails and old bottles, which they put a great value on. A number of the headmen came on board us, and it was with some difficulty we got them out of the ship by a fair means. But on the appearance of a musket with a fixed bayonet, they all went into their canoes very quickly. We were daily visited by more or less who brought us fish in great plenty for nails, beads and other trifles, and behaved very peacefully. We settled the astronomer with his instruments and a sufficient guard on a small island that is joined to Matuara at low water, called the Hippa, where there was an old fortified town that the natives had forsaken. Their houses served our people to live in, and by sinking them about a foot inside we made them very comfortable. Having done this, we struck our tents on the Matuara, and having removed the ship farther into the cove on the west shore, moored her for the winter. We then erected our tents near the river or watering place, and sent ashore all the spars and lumber off the decks, that they might be caulked, and gave her a winter coat to preserve the hull and rigging. 1773 May On the 11th of May we felt two severe shocks of an earthquake, but received no kind of damage. On the 17th we were surprised by the people firing guns on the hipper, and having sent the boat, as soon as she opened the sound, had the pleasure of seeing the resolution off the mouth of it. We immediately sent out the boats to tow her in, it being calm. In the evening she anchored about a mile without us, and next morning weighed and warped within us. Both ships felt uncommon joy at our meeting, after an absence of fourteen weeks. End of Book One, Chapter Seven. Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts. Book One, Chapter Eight of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume One, by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole. Chapter Eight. Transactions in Queen Charlotte Sound, with some remarks on the inhabitants, 1773 May. Knowing that scurvy grass, celery, and other vegetables were to be found in this sound, I went myself the morning after my arrival at daybreak to look for some, and returned on board at breakfast with a boatload. Being now satisfied that enough was to be got for the crews of both ships, I gave orders that they should be boiled with wheat and portable broth every morning for breakfast, and with peas and broth for dinner, knowing from experience that these vegetables thus dressed are extremely beneficial in removing all manner of scorbutic complaints. I have already mentioned a desire I had of visiting Van Diemen's land, in order to inform myself if it made a part of New Holland, and I certainly should have done this had the winds proved favourable. But as Captain Furneaux had now, in a great measure, cleared up that point, I could have no business there, and therefore came to a resolution to continue our researches to the east, between the latitudes of forty-one degrees and forty-six degrees. I acquainted Captain Furneaux therewith, and ordered him to get his ship in readiness to put to sea as soon as possible. In the morning of the twentieth I sent ashore to the watering place near the adventure's tent, the only ewe and ram remaining, of those which I brought from the Cape of Good Hope, with an intent to leave them in this country. 
Soon after I visited the several gardens Captain Furneaux had caused to be made and planted with various articles, all of which were in a flourishing state, and, if attended to by the natives, may prove of great utility to them. The next day I set some men to work to make a garden on Long Island, which I planted with garden seeds, roots, etc. On the twenty-second in the morning, the Ewan Ram, I had with so much care and trouble brought to this place, were both found dead, occasioned, as was supposed, by eating some poisonous plant. Thus my hopes of stocking this country with a breed of sheep were blasted in a moment. About noon we were visited, for the first time since I arrived, by some of the natives who dined with us, and it was not a little they devoured. In the evening they were dismissed with presents. Early in the morning of the 24th I sent Mr. Gilbert the master to sound about the rock we had discovered in the entrance of the sound. Myself, accompanied by Captain Furneaux and Mr. Forster, went in a boat to the West Bay on a shooting party. In our way we met a large canoe in which were fourteen or fifteen people. One of the first questions they asked was for Topia, the person I brought from Otaheite on my former voyage and they seemed to express some concern when we told them he was dead. These people made the same inquiry of Captain Furneaux when he first arrived, and on my return to the ship in the evening I was told that a canoe had been alongside, the people in which seemed to be strangers, and who also inquired for Topia. Late in the evening Mr. Gilbert returned, having sounded all round the rock, which he found to be very small and steep. Nothing worthy of notice happened till the twenty-ninth, when several of the natives made us a visit, and brought with them a quantity of fish, which they exchanged for nails, etc. One of these people I took over to Motuara, and showed him some potatoes planted there by Mr. Fannan, master of the adventure. There seemed to be no doubt of their succeeding, and the man was so well pleased with them that he, of his own accord, began to the hoe the earth up about the plants. We next took him to the other gardens and showed him the turnips, carrots, and parsnips, roots which, together with the potatoes, will be of more real use to them than all the other articles we had planted. It was easy to give them an idea of these roots, by comparing them with such as they knew. Two or three families of these people now took up their abode near us, employing themselves daily in fishing and supplying us with the fruits of their labour, the good effects of which we soon felt. For we were by no means such expert fishers as they are, nor were any of our methods of fishing equal to theirs. 1773 June On the 2nd of June, the ships being nearly ready to put to sea, I sent on shore on the east side of the sound two goats, male and female. The former was something more than a year old, but the latter was much older. She had two fine kids some time before we arrived. In Dusky Bay, which were killed by cold, as hath been already mentioned, Captain Furneaux also put on shore in Cannibal Cove a boar and two breeding sows, so that we have reason to hope this country will in time be stocked with these animals, if they are not destroyed by the natives before they become wild, for afterwards they will be in no danger. But as the natives know nothing of their being left behind, it may be some time before they are discovered. In our excursion to the east we met with the largest seal I had ever seen. It was swimming on the surface of the water, and suffered us to come near enough to fire at it, but without effect, for, after a chase of near an hour, we were obliged to leave it. By the size of this animal, it probably was a sea lioness. It certainly bore much resemblance to the drawing in Lord Anson's voyage. Our seeing a sea lion when we entered this sound in my former voyage increaseth the probability, and I am of opinion they have their abode on some of the rocks which lie in the strait or off Admiralty Bay. 
On the third I sent a boat with a carpenter over to the east side of the sound, to cut down some spars which we were in want of. As she was returning she was chased by a large double canoe full of people, but with what intent is not known. Early the next morning some of our friends brought us a large supply of fish. One of them agreed to go away with us, but afterwards, that is, when it came to the point, he changed his mind as did some others who had promised to go with the adventure. It was even said that some of them offered their children to sail. I, however, found that this was a mistake. The report first took its rise on board the adventure, where they were utter strangers to their language and customs. It was very common for these people to bring their children with them, and present them to us, in expectation that we would make them presents. This happened to me the preceding morning. A man brought his son, a boy about nine or ten years of age, and presented him to me. As the report of selling their children was then current, I thought at first that he wanted me to buy the boy. But at last I found that he wanted me to give him a white shirt, which I accordingly did. The boy was so fond of his new dress that he went all over the ship presenting himself before every one that came in his way. This freedom used by him offended old Will, the ram-goat, who gave him a butt with his horns, and knocked him backward on the deck. Will would have repeated his blow, had not some of the people come to the boy's assistance. The misfortune, however, seemed to him irreparable. The shirt was dirtied, and he was afraid to appear in the cabin before his father until brought in by Mr. Forster, when he told a very lamentable story against Gowrie, the great dog, for so they call all the quadrupeds we had aboard. Nor could he be reconciled till his shirt was washed and dried. This story, though extremely trifling in itself, will show how liable we are to mistake these people's meaning, and to ascribe to them customs they never knew even in thought. About nine o'clock a large double canoe, in which were twenty or thirty people, appeared in sight. Our friends on board seemed much alarmed, telling us that these were their enemies. Two of them, the one with a spear and the other with a stone hatchet in his hand, mounted the arm-chests on the poop, and there, in a kind of bravado, bid those enemies defiance, while the others, who were on board, took to their canoe and went ashore probably to secure the women and children. All I could do, I could not prevail on the two that remained to call these strangers alongside. On the contrary, they were displeased at my doing it, and wanted me to fire upon them. The people in the canoe seemed to pay very little regard to those on board, but kept advancing slowly towards the ship, and after performing the usual ceremonies put alongside. After this the chief was easily prevailed upon to come on board, followed by many others, and peace was immediately established on all sides. Indeed, it did not appear to me that these people had any intention to make war upon their brethren. At least, if they had, they were sensible enough to know that this was neither the time nor place for them to commit hostilities. One of the first questions these strangers asked was for Tupia and when I told them he was dead, one or two expressed their sorrow by a kind of lamentation, which to me appeared more formal than real. A trade soon commenced between our people and them. It was not possible to hinder the former from selling the clothes from off their backs for the merest trifles, things that were neither useful nor curious. This caused me to dismiss the strangers sooner than I would have done. When they departed, they went to Matuara, where, by the help of our glasses, we discovered four or five canoes and several people on the shore. This induced me to go over in my boat, accompanied by Mr. Forster and one of the officers. We were well received by the chief and the whole tribe, which consisted of between ninety and a hundred persons, men, women, and children, having with them six canoes and all their utensils which made it probable that they were come to reside in this sound. But this is only conjecture, for it is very common for them, 
when they go but a little way, to carry their whole property with them, every place being alike if it affords them the necessary subsistence, so that it can hardly be said that they are ever from home. Thus we may easily account for the emigration of those few families we found in Dusky Bay. Living thus dispersed in small parties, knowing no head but the chief of the family or tribe, whose authority may be very little, they feel many inconveniences to which well-regulated societies, united under one head or any other form of government, are not subject. These form laws and regulations for their general good. They are not alarmed at the appearance of every stranger, and, if attacked or invaded by a public enemy, have strongholds to retire to, where they can with advantage defend themselves, their property and their country. This seems to be the state of most of the inhabitants of Eahai Namawe, whereas those of Tavai Ponamu, by living a wandering life in small parties, are destitute of most of these advantages, which subjects them to perpetual alarms. We generally found them upon their guard, travelling and working, as it were with their arms in their hands. Even the women are not exempted from bearing arms, as appeared by the first interview I had with the family in Dusky Bay, where each of the two women was armed with a spear, not less than eighteen feet in length. I was led into these reflections by not being able to recollect the face of any one person I had seen here three years ago, nor did it once appear that any one of them had the least knowledge of me or of any person with me that was here at that time. It was therefore highly probable that the greatest part of the people which inhabited this sound in the beginning of the year 1770 have been since driven out of it, or have, of their own accord, removed somewhere else. Certain it is that not one-third of the inhabitants were here now, that were then. Their stronghold on the point of Matuara hath been long deserted, and we found many forsaken habitations in all parts of the sound. We are not, however, wholly to infer from this that this place hath been once very populous, for each family may, for their own convenience, when they move from place to place, have more huts than one or two. It may be asked if these people had never seen the endeavour, nor any of their crew, how could they become acquainted with the name of Tupia, or have in their possession, which many of them had, such articles, as they could only have got from that ship? To this it may be answered that the name of Tupia was so popular among them when the endeavour was here, that it would be no wonder if, at this time, it was known over great part of New Zealand, and as familiar to those who never saw him, as to those who did. Had ships of any other nation whatever arrived here, they would have equally inquired of them for Tupia. By the same way of reasoning, many of the articles left here by the endeavour may be now in possession of those who never saw her. I got from one of the people now present an ear ornament, made of glass very well formed and polished. The glass they must have got from the endeavour. After passing about an hour on Matuara, with these people, and having distributed among them some presents, and showed to the chief the gardens we have made, I returned on board, and spent the remainder of our royal master's birthday in festivity, having the company of Captain Furneaux and all his officers. Double allowance enabled the seamen to share in the general joy. Both ships being now ready for sea, I gave Captain Furneaux an account in writing, of the route I intended to take, which was to proceed to the east between the latitudes of 41 and 46 degrees south, until I arrived in the longitude of 140 or 135 degrees west, then, provided no land was discovered, to proceed to Otaheite, from thence back to this place by the shortest route, and, after taking in wood and water, to proceed to the south, and explore all the unknown parts of the sea,
between the meridian of New Zealand and Cape Horn. Therefore, in case of separation before we reached Otaheite, I appointed that island for the place of rendezvous, where he was to wait till the 20th of August. If not joined by me before that time, he was then to make the best of his way back to Queen Charlotte's Sound, where he was to wait till the 20th of November. After which, if not joined by me, he was to put to sea, and carry into execution their lordship's instructions. Some may think it an extraordinary step in me to proceed on discoveries as far south as forty-six degrees of latitude in the very depth of winter. But though it must be owned that winter is by no means favourable for discoveries, it nevertheless appeared to me necessary that something should be done in it, in order to lessen the work I was upon, lest I should not be able to finish the discovery of the southern part of the South Pacific Ocean the ensuing summer. Besides, if I should discover any land in my route to the east, I should be ready to begin with the summer to explore it. Setting aside all these considerations I had little to fear, having two good ships well provided and healthy crews. Where then could I spend my time better? If I did nothing more, I was at least in hopes of being able to point out to posterity that these seas may be navigated, and that it is practicable to go on discoveries, even in the very depth of winter. During our stay in the Sound I had observed that this second visit made to this country had not mended the morals of the natives of either sex. I had always looked upon the females of New Zealand to be more chaste than the generality of Indian women. Whatever favours a few of them might have granted to the people in the endeavour, it was generally done in a private manner, and the men did not seem to interest themselves much in it. But now, I was told, they were the chief promoters of a shameful traffic, and that for a spike-nail or any other thing of value, they would oblige the women to prostitute themselves, whether they would or no, and even without any regard to that privacy which decency required. During our stay here, Mr. Wales lost no opportunity to observe equal altitudes of the sun for obtaining the rates of the watches. The result of his labours proved that Mr. Kendall's was gaining nine seconds five per day, and Mr. Arnold's losing ninety-four seconds fifteen per day on mean time. End of Book One, Chapter Eight Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts Book One, Chapter Nine of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume One by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole. Chapter Nine Route from New Zealand to Otaheite with an account of some low islands, supposed to be the same that were seen by Monsieur de Bougainville. 1773 June On the 7th of June at four in the morning, the wind being more favourable, we unmoored, and at seven weighed and put to sea, with the adventure in company. We had no sooner got out of the sound than we found the wind at south, so that we had to ply through the straits. About noon the tide of ebb setting out in our favour made our boards advantageous, so that at five o'clock in the evening Cape Palliser, on the island of Iahai Nom Awe, bore south-south-east a half-south, and Cape Koamaru, or the south-east point of the sound, north by west, three-quarter west. Presently after it fell calm, and the tide of flood now making against us, carried us at a great rate back to the north. A little before high water, the calm was succeeded by a breeze from the north, which soon increased to a brisk gale. This, together with the ebb, carried us by eight o'clock the next morning quite through the strait. Cape Palliser at this time bore east-north-east, and at noon north by west, distant seven leagues. This day at noon, when we attended the winding up of the watches, the fusee of Mr. Arnold's would not go round, 
so that after several unsuccessful trials we were obliged to let it go down. After getting clear of the straits I directed my course southeast by east, having a gentle gale, but variable between the north and west. The late southeast winds having caused a swell from the same quarter, which did not go down for some days, we had little hopes of meeting with land in that direction. We, however, continued to steer to the southeast, and on the eleventh crossed the meridian of one hundred and eighty degrees, and got into the west longitude, according to my way of reckoning. On the sixteenth at seven in the morning, the wind having veered round to southeast, we tacked and stretched to northeast, being at this time in the latitude of forty seven degrees seven minutes, longitude one seventy three degrees west. In this situation, we had a great swell from northeast. The wind continued at southeast and south southeast, blew fresh at intervals, and was attended with sometimes fair and at other times rainy weather till the twentieth, on which day, being in the latitude of forty four degrees thirty minutes, longitude one sixty five degrees forty five minutes west, the wind shifted to the west blew a gentle gale, and was attended with fair weather. With this we steered east by north, east by south, and east, till the twenty-third at noon, when, being in the latitude of forty-four degrees thirty-eight minutes south, longitude one sixty-one degrees twenty-seven minutes west, we had a few hours calm. The calm was succeeded by a wind at east, with which we stood to the north. The wind increased and blew in squalls, attended with rain, which at last brought us under our courses, and at two o'clock in the afternoon of the next day we were obliged to lie to under the foresail, having a very hard gale from east-north-east, and a great sea from the same direction. At seven o'clock in the morning of the twenty-fifth, the gale being more moderate, we made sail under the courses, and in the afternoon set the topsails close-reefed. At midnight, the wind having veered more to the north, we tacked and stretched to the southeast, being at this time in the latitude of forty two degrees fifty three minutes south, longitude one sixty three degrees twenty minutes west. We continued to stretch to the southeast, with a fresh gale and fair weather, till four o'clock in the afternoon of the next day, when we stood again to the northeast, till midnight, between the twenty seventh and twenty eighth. Then we had a few hours calm, which were succeeded by faint breezes from the west. At this time we were in the latitude of 42 degrees 32 minutes, longitude 161 degrees 15 minutes west. The wind remained not long at west, before it veered back to the east by the north, and kept between the southeast and northeast, but never blew strong. 1773 July on July 2nd, being in the latitude of 53 degrees 3 minutes, longitude 156 degrees 17 minutes west, we had again a calm, which brought the wind back to the west. But it was of no longer continuance than before. For the next day it returned to the east and southeast, blew fresh at times and by squalls with rain. On the 7th, being in the latitude of 41 degrees 22 minutes, longitude 156 degrees 12 minutes west, we had two hours calm, in which time Mr. Wales went on board the adventure to compare the watches, and they were found to agree, allowing for the difference of their rates of going, a probable, if not a certain proof, that they had gone well since we had been in this sea. The calm was succeeded by a wind from the south, between which point in the northwest it continued for the six succeeding days, but never blew strong. It was, however, attended with a great hollow swell from the southwest and west, a sure indication that no large land was near in those directions. We now steered east, inclining to the south, and on the tenth, in the latitude of forty three degrees thirty nine minutes, longitude one forty four degrees forty three minutes west, the variation was found by several azimuths to be more than three degrees east, but the next morning it was found to be four degrees five minutes thirty seconds, and in the afternoon five degrees fifty six minutes east. 
The same day at noon we were in the latitude of 43 degrees 44 minutes, longitude 141 degrees 56 minutes west. At nine o'clock in the morning of the 12th, the longitude was observed as follows, viz. Self. First set, 139 degrees 47 minutes 15 seconds. Ditto. Second set, 140 degrees 7 minutes 30 seconds. Mr. Wales, first set, 141 degrees 22 minutes 15 seconds. Mr. Wales, second set, 140 degrees 10 minutes 0 seconds. Mr. Clerk, 140 degrees 56 minutes 45 seconds. Mr. Gilbert, 140 degrees 2 minutes 0 seconds. Median, 140 degrees 24 minutes 17 and a half seconds west. This differed from my reckoning only 2 degrees and a half. The next morning, in the latitude of 43 degrees 3 minutes, longitude 139 degrees 20 minutes west, we had several lunar observations, which were consonant to those made the day before, allowing for the ship's run in the time. In the afternoon we had, for a few hours, variable light airs next to a calm, after which we got a wind from the northeast, blowing fresh and in squalls, attended with dark gloomy weather and some rain. We stretched to the southeast till five o'clock in the afternoon on the 14th, at which time, being in the latitude of 43 degrees 15 minutes, longitude 137 degrees 39 minutes west, we tacked and stood to the north under our courses, having a very hard gale with heavy squalls attended with rain, till near noon the next day, when it ended in a calm. At this time we were in the latitude of 42 degrees 39 minutes, longitude 137 degrees 58 minutes west, in the evening the calm was succeeded by a breeze from south-west, which soon after increased to a fresh gale, and fixing it south-south-west, with it we steered north-east to half-east, in the latitude of 41 degrees 25 minutes, longitude 135 degrees 58 minutes west. We saw floating in the sea a billet of wood, which seemed to be covered with barnacles, so that there was no judging how long it might have been there, or from whence, and or how far it had come. We continued to steer northeast to half east before a very strong gale which blew in squalls, attended with showers of rain and hail, and a very high sea from the same quarter till noon on the seventeenth. Being then in the latitude of thirty nine degrees forty four minutes, longitude one thirty three degrees thirty two minutes west, which was a degree and a half further east than I intended to run nearly in the middle between my track to the north in 1769 and the return to the south in the same year, and seeing no signs of land I steered north-easterly, with a view of exploring that part of the sea lying between the two tracks just mentioned, down as low as the latitude of twenty-seven degrees, a space that had not been visited by any preceding navigator that I knew of, on the 19th, being in the latitude of 36 degrees 34 minutes, longitude 133 degrees 7 minutes west, we steered north a half west, having still the advantage of a hard gale at south, which the next day veered to south, east, and east, blew hardened by squalls attended with rain and thick hazy weather. This continued till the evening of the 21st, when the gale abated, the weather cleared up, and the wind back to the south and southeast. We were now in the latitude of 32 degrees 30 minutes, longitude 133 degrees 40 minutes west. From this situation we steered north-northwest till noon the next day, when we steered a point more to the west, being at this time in the latitude of 31 degrees 6 minutes, longitude 134 degrees 12 minutes west. The weather was now so warm that it was necessary to put on lighter clothes. The mercury in the thermometer at noon rose to 63. It had never been lower than 46, and seldom higher than 54, at the same time of the day since we left New Zealand. The day was remarkable by our not seeing a single bird. Not one had passed since we left the land, without seeing some of the following birds, viz., albatrosses, shearwaters, pintados, blue petrels, 
and Port Egmont hens, but these frequent every part of the southern ocean in the higher latitudes. Not a bird nor any other thing was seen that could induce us to think that we might have ever been in the neighbourhood of any land. The wind kept veering round from the south by the west to north-north-west, with which we stretched north till noon the next day, when, being in the latitude of twenty-nine degrees twenty-two minutes, we tacked and stretched to the westward. The wind soon increased to a very hard gale attended with rain, and blew in such heavy squalls as to split the most of our sails. This weather continued till the morning of the twenty-fifth, when the wind became more moderate and veered to north-west and west-north-west, with which we steered and stretched to north-east being at that time in the latitude of twenty-nine degrees fifty-one minutes, longitude one thirty degrees twenty-eight minutes west. In the afternoon the sky cleared up and the weather became fair and settled. We now met the first tropic bird we had seen in this sea. On the twenty-sixth in the afternoon, being in the latitude of twenty-eight degrees forty-four minutes, we had several observations of the sun and moon, which gave the longitude 135 degrees 30 minutes west. My reckoning at the same time was 135 degrees 27 minutes, and I had no occasion to correct it since I left the land. We continued to stretch to the north with light breezes from the westward till noon the next day, when we were stopped by a calm, our latitude at this time being 27 degrees 53 minutes, longitude 135 degrees 17 minutes west, in the evening the calm was succeeded by a breeze from the north and northwest, with which we plied to the north. On the twenty-ninth, I sent on board the adventure to inquire into the state of her crew, having heard that they were sickly, and this I now found was but too true. Her cook was dead, and about twenty of her best men were down in the scurvy in flux. At this time, we had only three men on the sick list, and only one of them attacked with the scurvy. Several more, however, began to show symptoms of it, and were accordingly put upon the wort, marmalade of carrots, rub of lemons and oranges. I know not how to account for the scurvy raging more in the one ship than the other, unless it was owing to the crew of the adventure being more scorbutic when they arrived in New Zealand than we were and to their eating few or no vegetables while they lay in Queen Charlotte's Sound, partly for want of knowing the right sorts, and partly because it was a new diet, which alone was sufficient for seamen to reject it. To introduce any new article of food among seamen, let it be ever so much for their good, requires both the example and authority of a commander. Without both, of which it will be dropped before the people are sensible of the benefits resulting from it. Were it necessary, I could name fifty instances in support of this remark. Many of my people, officers as well as seamen, at first disliked celery, scurvy grass, etc., being boiled in the peas and wheat, and some refused to eat it. But as this had no effect upon my conduct, this obstinate kind of prejudice by little and little wore off. They began to like it as well as the others, and now I believe there was hardly a man in the ship that did not attribute our being so free from the scurvy to the beer and vegetables we made use of at New Zealand. After this I seldom found it necessary to order any of my people to gather vegetables whenever we came where there were any to be got, and if scarce, Happy was he who could lay hold on them first. I appointed one of my seamen to be cook of the adventure, and wrote to Cavaptain Furneaux, desiring him to make use of every method in his power to stop the spreading of the disease amongst his people, and proposing such as I thought might tend towards it. But I afterwards found all this unnecessary, as every method had been used they could think of. 1773 August the wind continued in the northwest quarter and blew fresh at times, attended with rain, with which we stood to the northeast. On the first of August at noon, we were in the latitude of twenty-five degrees one minute, 
longitude 134 degrees 6 minutes west, and had a great hollow swell from northwest. The situation we were now in was nearly the same as Captain Cataret, a science for Pitcairn's Island, discovered by him in 1767. We therefore looked well out for it, but saw nothing. According to the longitude in which he has placed it, we must have passed about fifteen leagues to the west of it. But as this was uncertain, I did not think it prudent, considering the situation of the adventurous people, to lose any time in looking for it. A sight of it would, however, have been of use in verifying or correcting not only the longitude of this isle, but of the others that Captain Cataret discovered in this neighbourhood. His longitude not being confirmed, I think, by astronomical observations, and therefore liable to errors, which he could have no method to correct. As we had now got to the northward of Captain Cataret's tracks, all hopes of discovering a continent vanished. Islands were all we were to expect to find, until we returned again to the south. I had now, that is, on this and my former voyage, crossed this ocean in the latitude of forty degrees and upwards, without meeting anything that in the least induced me to think I should find what I was in search after. On the contrary, everything conspired to make me believe there is no southern continent between the meridian of America and New Zealand. At least, this passage did not produce any indubitable signs of any, as will appear by the following remarks. After leaving the coast of New Zealand, we daily saw floating on the sea rockweed, for the space of eighteen degrees of longitude. In my passage to New Zealand in 1769, we also saw this weed, for the space of twelve or fourteen degrees of longitude, before we made the land. The weed is undoubtedly the produce of New Zealand, because the nearer the coast, the greater the quantity you see. At the greatest distance from the coast, we saw it only in small pieces, generally more rotten and covered with barnacles, an indubitable sign that it had been long at sea. Were it not for this, one might be led to conjecture that some other large land lay in the neighbourhood. For it cannot be a small extent of coast to produce such a quantity of weed as to cover so large a space of sea. It hath been already mentioned that we were no sooner clear of the straits than we met with a large hollow swell from the south-east, which continued till we arrived in the longitude of 177 degrees west, and latitude 46 degrees. There we had large billows from the north and northeast for five days successively, and until we got five degrees of longitude more to the east, although the wind, great part of the time, blew from different directions. This was a strong indication that there was no land between us and my track to the west in 1769. After this we had, as is usual in all great oceans, large billows from every direction in which the wind blew a fresh gale, but more especially from the south-west. These billows never ceased with the cause that first put them in motion, a sure indication that we were not near any large land and that there is no continent to the south, unless in a very high latitude. But this was too important a point to be left to opinions and conjectures. Facts were to determine it, and these could only be obtained by visiting the southern parts, which was to be the work of the ensuing summer, agreeable to the plan I had laid down. As the winds continued to blow from the north-west and west, we had no other choice but to stand to the north, inclining more or less every day to the east. In the latitude of twenty-one degrees we saw flying fish, gannets, and egg-birds. On the sixth I hoisted a boat out and sent for Captain Furno to dinner, from whom I learnt that his people were much better, the flocks having left them, and the scurvy was at a stand. Some cider, which he happened to have, and which he gave to the scorbutic people, contributed not a little to this happy change. The weather to-day was cloudy and the wind very unsettled. This seemed to announce the approach of the so much wished-for trade wind, which at eight o'clock in the evening, after two hours calm, 
and some heavy showers of rain, we actually got at southeast. We were, at this time, in the latitude of 19 degrees 36 minutes south, longitude 131 degrees 32 minutes west. The not meeting with a southeast trade wind sooner is no new thing in this sea. As we had now got it, I directed my course to the west-northwest, as well to keep in the strength of it as to get to the north of the islands discovered in my former voyage, that if any other islands lay in the way I might have a chance to discover them. During the daytime we made all the sail we could, but in the night either run an easy sail or lay to. We daily saw flying fish, albacores, dolphins, etc., but neither by striking nor with hook and line could we catch any of them. This required some art, which none of my people were masters of. On the eleventh at daybreak land was seen to the south. This, upon a nearer approach, was found to be an island of about two leagues in extent, in the direction of north-west and south-east, and clothed with wood, above which the coconut trees showed their lofty heads. I judged it to be one of those isles discovered by Mr. Bougainville. It lies in the latitude of 70 degrees 24 minutes, longitude 141 degrees 39 minutes west, and I called it after the name of the ship Resolution Island. The sickly state of the adventure's crew made it necessary for me to make the best of my way to Otaheite, where I was sure of finding refreshments. Consequently, I did not wait to examine this island, which appeared too small to supply our wants, but continued our course to the west, and at six o'clock in the evening, land was seen from the masthead bearing west by south. Probably this was another of Bougainville's discoveries. I named it Doubtful Island, and it lies in the latitude of 17 degrees 20 minutes, longitude 141 degrees 38 minutes west. I was sorry I could not spare time to haul to the north of Mr. Bougainville's track, but the getting to a place where we could procure refreshments was more an object at this time than discovery. During the night we steered west by north in order to pass the north of the island above mentioned. At daybreak the next morning we discovered land right ahead, distant about two miles, so that daylight advised us of our danger but just in time. This proved another of these low or half-drowned islands, or rather a large coral shoal of about twenty leagues in circuit. A very small part of it was land, which consisted of little islets ranged along the north side, and connected by sandbanks and breakers. These islets were clothed with wood, among which the coconut trees were only distinguishable. We arranged the south side of this isle or shoal, at a distance of one or two miles from the coral bank, against which the sea broke in a dreadful surf. In the middle is a large lake or inland sea, in which was a canoe under sail. This island, which I named after Captain Furneaux, lies in the latitude of 17 degrees 5 minutes, longitude 143 degrees 16 minutes west. The situation is nearly the same that is assigned for one of those discovered by Bougainville, I must here observe that amongst these low and half-drowned isles, which are numerous in this part of the ocean, Mr. Bougainville's discoveries cannot be known to that degree of accuracy which is necessary to distinguish them from others. We were obliged to have recourse to his chart for the latitudes and longitudes of the islands he discovered, as neither the one nor the other is mentioned in his narrative. Without waiting to examine this island, we continued to steer to the west, all sails set, till six o'clock in the evening, when we shortened sail to three topsails, and at nine brought two. The next morning at four a.m. we made sail, and at daybreak saw another of these low islands, situated in the latitude of seventeen degrees four minutes, longitude one forty-four degrees thirty minutes west, which obtained the name of Adventure Island. Monsieur de Bougainville, very properly calls this cluster of low, overflowed islands the dangerous archipelago. The smoothness of the sea sufficiently convinced us that we were surrounded by them, and how necessary it was to proceed with the utmost caution, especially in the night. 
At five o'clock p.m. we again saw land bearing southwest by south, which we afterwards found to be Chain Island, discovered in my former voyage. But as I was not sure of it at this time, and being desirous of avoiding the delay, which lying by in the night occasioned, I hoisted out the cutter, and manned her with an officer and seven men, with orders to keep as far ahead of the ships, with a light at her masthead, as a signal could be distinguished, which she was to make in case she met with any danger. In this manner we continued to run all night, and at six o'clock the next morning I called her on board and hoisted her in, for it did not appear she would be wanted again for this purpose, as we now had a large swell from the south, a sure sign we were clear of the low islands. Therefore I steered for Otaheite, without being apprehensive of meeting with any danger. End of Book One, Chapter Nine. Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts. Book One, Chapter Ten of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume One by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole. Chapter Ten. Arrival of the ships at Otaheite, with an account of the critical situation they were in, and of several incidents that happened while they lay in Oati Piha Bay, 1773 August. On the 15th at five o'clock in the morning, we saw Osnaburg Island, or Maitea, discovered by Captain Wallace, bearing south by west or half west. Soon after I brought to, and waited for the adventure to come up with us, to acquaint Captain Furneaux that it was my intention to put into Oatihi Piha Bay, near the south-east end of Otaheite, in order to get what refreshments we could from that part of the island, before we went down to Matavia. This done, we made sail, and at six in the evening, saw the land bearing west. We continued to stand on till midnight, when we brought to, till four o'clock in the morning, and then made sail for the land, with a fine breeze at east. At daybreak we found ourselves not more than half a league from the reef. The breeze now began to fail us, and at last fell to a calm. This made it necessary to hoist out our boats to tow the ships off, but all their efforts were not sufficient to keep them from being carried near the reef. A number of the inhabitants came off in canoes from different parts, bringing with them a little fish, a few coconuts, and other fruits, which they exchanged for nails, beads, etc. The most of them knew me again, and many inquired for Mr. Banks and others who were with me before, but not one asked for Tupia. As the calm continued, our situation became still more dangerous. We were, however, not without hopes of getting round the western point of the reef and into the bay, till about two o'clock in the afternoon, when we came before an opening or break in the reef, through which I hoped to get with the ships. But on sending to examine it, I found there was not a sufficient depth of water, though it caused such an indraft of the tide of flood through it, as was very near proving fatal to the resolution, for as soon as the ships got into the stream, they were carried with great impetuosity towards the reef. The moment I perceived this, I ordered one of the warping machines, which we had in readiness, to be carried out with about four hundred fathoms of rope, but it had not the least effect. The horrors of shipwreck now stared us in the face. We were not more than two cables length from the breakers, and yet we could find no bottom to anchor, the only probable means we had left to save the ships. We, however, dropped an anchor, but before it took hold and brought us up, the ship was in less than three fathom water, and struck at every fall of the sea, which broke close under our stem in a dreadful surf, and threatened us every moment with shipwreck. The adventure very luckily, 
brought up close upon our bow, without striking. We presently carried out two kedge anchors with hawsers to each. These found ground a little without the bower, but in what depth we never knew. By heaving upon them, and cutting away the bower anchor, we got the ship afloat, where we lay some time in the greatest anxiety, expecting every minute that either the kedges would come home, or the horses be cut in two by the rocks. At length the tide ceased to act in the same direction. I ordered all the boats to try to tow off the resolution, and when I saw this was practicable, we hove up the two kedges. At that moment a light air came off from the land, which so much assisted the boats, that we soon got clear of all danger. Then I ordered all the boats to assist the adventure, but before they reached her, she was under sail with the land breeze, and soon after joined us, leaving behind her three anchors, her coasting cable and two hawsers, which were never recovered. Thus we were once more safe at sea, after narrowly escaping being wrecked on the very island we but a few days before so ardently wished to be at. The calm, after bringing us into this dangerous situation, very fortunately continued, for had the sea breeze, as is usual, set in, the resolution must inevitably have been lost, and probably the adventure too. During the time we were in this critical situation, a number of the natives were on board and about the ships. They seemed to be insensible of our danger, showing not the least surprise, joy or fear, when we were striking, and left us a little before sunset, quite unconcerned. We spent the night which proved squally and rainy, making short boards, and the next morning being the 17th, we anchored in Oatihi Piha Bay in twelve fathoms water, about two cables length from the shore, both ships being by this time crowded with a great number of the natives, who brought with them coconuts, plantains, bananas, apples, yams and other roots, which they exchanged for nails and beads. To several who call themselves chiefs, I made presents of shirts, axes, and several other articles, and in return they promised to bring me hogs and fowls, a promise they never did, nor ever intended to perform. In the afternoon I landed in company with Captain Furneaux, in order to view the watering place and to sound the disposition of the natives. I also sent a boat to get in some water for present use having scarcely any left on board. We found this article as convenient as could be expected, and the natives to behave with great civility. Early in the morning I sent the two launches and the resolution's cutter, under the command of Mr. Gilbert, to endeavour to recover the anchors we had left behind us. They returned about noon, with the resolution's bower anchor, but could not recover any of the adventures. The natives came off again with fruit as the day before, but in no great quantity. I also had a party on shore trading under the protection of a guard. Nothing, however, was brought to market but fruit and roots, though many hogs were seen, I was told, about the houses of the natives. The cry was that they belonged to Wahitun, the Iredihi, or king and him we had not yet seen, nor, I believe, any other chief of note. Many, however, who called themselves Eries, came on board, partly with a view of getting presents, and partly to pilfer whatever came in their way. One of this sort of Eries I had most of the day in the cabin, and made presents to him and all his friends, which were not few, at length he was caught taking things which did not belong to him, and handing them out of the quarter gallery. Many complaints of a like nature were made to me against those on deck, which occasioned my turning them all out of the ship. My cabin guest made good haste to be gone. I was so much exasperated at his behaviour that after he had gone some distance from the ship, 
I fired two muskets over his head, which made him quit the canoe and take to the water. I then sent a boat to take up the canoe, but as she came near the shore, the people from thence began to pelt her with stones. Being in some pain for her safety, as she was unarmed, I went myself in another boat to protect her, and ordered a great gun, loaded with ball, to be fired along the coast, which made them all retire from the shore, and I was suffered to bring away two canoes without the least show of opposition. In one of the canoes was a little boy, who was much frightened, but I soon dissipated his fears by giving him beads and putting him on shore. A few hours later we were all good friends again, and the canoes were returned to the first person who came for them. It was not till the evening of this day that any one inquired after Tupia, and then but two or three. As soon as they learnt the cause of his death, they were quite satisfied. Indeed, it did not appear to me that it would have caused a moment's uneasiness in the breast of any one had his death been occasioned by any other means than by sickness. As little inquiry was made after Oturu, the man who went away with Monsieur de Bougainville, but they were continually asking for Mr. Banks and several others who were with me in my former voyage. These people informed us that Tu Taha, the regent of the greater peninsula of Otaheite, had been killed in a battle which was fought between the two kingdoms about five months before, and that Otu was the reigning prince. Tubore Tamede and several more of our principal friends about Amatavai fell in this battle, as also a great number of common people. But at present a peace subsisted between the two kingdoms. On the 19th we had gentle breezes easterly with some smart showers of rain. Early in the morning the boats were again sent to recover the adventure's anchors, but returned with the same ill success as the day before, so that we ceased to look for them any longer, thinking ourselves very happy in having come off so well, considering the situation we had been in. In an excursion which Captain Furneaux and I made along the coast, we met with a chief who entertained us with excellent fish, fruit, etc., in return for his hospitality, I made him a present of an axe and other things, and he afterwards accompanied us back to the ships, where he made but a short stay. Nothing worthy of note happened on the 20th, till the dusk of the evening, when one of the natives made off with a musket belonging to the guard on shore. I was present when this happened, and sent some of our people after him, which would have been to little purpose had not some of the natives, of their own accord, pursued the thief. They knocked him down, took from him the musket, and brought it to us. Fear, on this occasion, certainly operated more with them than principle. They deserve, however, to be applauded for this act of justice, for, if they had not given their immediate assistance, it would hardly have been in my power to have recovered the musket, by any gentle means whatever, and by making use of any other, I was sure to lose more than ten times its value. The twenty-first the wind was at north a fresh breeze. This morning a chief made me a visit, and presented me with a quantity of fruit, among which were a number of coconuts we had drawn the water from, and afterwards thrown overboard. These he had picked up and tied in bundles so artfully that we did not at first perceive the cheat. When he was told of it, without betraying the least emotion, and as if he knew nothing of the matter, he opened two or three of them himself, signified to us that he was satisfied it was so, and then went ashore and sent off a quantity of plantains and bananas. Having got on board a supply of water, fruit and roots, I determined to sail in the morning to Matavai, as I found it was not likely that I should get an interview with Wahitua, without which it was very improbable we should get any hogs. 
Two of the natives who knew my intention slept on board, with a view of going with us to Matavai, but in the morning the wind blew fresh at northwest, and as we could not sail, I sent the trading party on shore as usual. In the evening I was informed that Wahitua was come into the neighbourhood and wanted to see me. In consequence of this information I determined to wait one day longer in order to have an interview with this prince. Accordingly, early the next morning, I set out in company with Captain Furneaux, Mr. Forster, and several of the natives. We met the chief about a mile from the landing-place, towards which he was advancing to meet us, but as soon as he saw us he stopped with his numerous train in the open air. I found him seated upon a stool, with a circle of people round him, and knew him at first sight and he me, having seen each other several times in 1769. At that time he was but a boy, and went by the name of Thierry, but, upon the death of his father, Wahitoun, he took upon him that name. After the first salutation was over, having seated me on the same stool with himself, and the other gentlemen on the ground by us, he began to inquire after several by name who were with me on my former voyage. He next inquired how long I would stay, and when I told him no longer the next day he seemed sorry, asked me to stay some months, and at last came down to five days, promising that in that time I should have hogs in plenty. But as I had been here already a week, without so much as getting one, I could not put any faith in this promise, and yet, I believe, if I had stayed, we should have fared much better than at Matavai. The present I made him consisted of a shirt, a sheet, a broad axe, spike nails, knives, looking-glasses, medals, beads, etc. In return he ordered a pretty good hog to be carried to our boat. We stayed with him all the morning, during which time he never suffered me to go from his side, where I was seated. I was also seated on the same stool, which was carried from place to place by one of his attendants, whom he called stool-bearer. At length we took leave, in order to return on board to dinner, after which we visited him again, and made him more presents, and he, in return, gave Captain Furneaux and me, each of us, an hog. Some others were got by exchanges at the trading places, so that we got in for the whole to-day as much fresh pork as gave the crews of both the ships a meal and this in consequence of our having had this interview with the chief. The twenty-fourth early in the morning we put to sea with a light land breeze. Soon after we were out we got the wind at west which blew in squalls, attended with heavy showers of rain. Many canoes accompanied us out to sea, with coconuts and other fruits, and did not leave us till they had disposed of their cargoes. The fruits we got here greatly contributed towards the recovery of the adventure's sick people, many of them, who had been so ill as not to be able to move without assistance, were, in this short time, so far recovered, that they could walk about of themselves. When we put in here, the Resolution had but one scorbutic man on board, an marine, who had been long sick, and who died the second day after our arrival of a complication of disorders, without the least mixture of the scurvy. I left Lieutenant Pickersgill, with the cutter, behind the bay to purchase hogs, as several had promised to bring some down to-day, and I was not willing to lose them. On the twenty-fifth about noon, Mr. Pickersgill returned with eight hogs, which he had got at Oatipiha. He spent the night at Ohidea, and was well entertained by Ereti, the chief of that district. It was remarkable that this chief never once asked about Uturu, nor did he take the least notice when Mr. Pickersgill mentioned his name. And yet Monsieur de Bougainville tells us this is the very chief who presented Uturu to him, 
which makes it the more extraordinary that he should neither inquire after him now, nor, when he was with us at Matavai, especially as they believed that we and Monsieur de Bougainville came from the same country, that is, from Pretane, for so they called our country. They had not the least knowledge of any other European nation, nor probably will they, unless some of their men should return, who had lately gone from the isle, of which mention shall be made by and by. We told several of them that Monsieur de Bougainville came from France, a name they could by no means pronounce, nor could they pronounce that of Paris much better, so that it is not likely that they will remember either the one or the other lung, whereas Pretane is in every child's mouth, and will hardly ever be forgotten. It was not till the evening of this day that we arrived in Matavai Bay. End of Book One, Chapter Ten Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts Book One, Chapter Eleven Of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume One, by James Cook This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Recording by David Cole Chapter Eleven an account of several visits to and from Otu, of goats being left on the island, and many other particulars which happened while the ships lay in Matavai Bay. 1773 August Before we got to an anchor, our decks were crowded with the natives, many of whom I knew, and almost all of them knew me. A great crowd were gotten together upon the shore, amongst whom was Otu, their king. I was just going to pay him a visit, when I was told that he was Matawad, and gone to Opari. I could not conceive the reason of his going off in a fright, as every one seemed pleased to see me. A chief, whose name was Maritata, was at this time on board, and advised me to put off my visit till the next morning, when he would accompany me, which I accordingly did. After having given directions to pitch tents for the reception of the sick, coopers, sailmakers, and the guard, I set out on the 26th for Opari, accompanied by Captain Furneaux, Mr. Forster, and others, Maritata, and his wife. As soon as we landed we were conducted to O2, whom we found seated on the ground under the shade of a tree, with an immense crowd around him. After the first compliments were over, I presented him with such articles as I guessed were most valuable in his eyes, well knowing that it was my interest to gain the friendship of this man. I also made presents to several of his attendants, and in return they offered me cloth, which I refused to accept, telling them that what I had given was for Tio friendship. The king inquired for Tupia, and all the gentlemen that were with me in my former voyage by name, although I do not remember that he was personally acquainted with any of us. He promised that I should have some hogs the next day, but I had much ado to obtain a promise from him to visit me on board. He said he was Matau no to Popui, that is, afraid of the guns. Indeed, all his actions showed him to be a timorous prince. He was about thirty years of age, six feet high, and a fine, personable, well-made man as one can see. All his subjects appeared uncovered before him, his father not excepted. What is meant by uncovering is the making bare the head and shoulders, or wearing no sort of clothing above the breast. When I returned from Opari, I found the tents and the astronomers' observatories set up on the same spot where we observed the transit of Venus in 1769. In the afternoon I had the sick landed, twenty from the adventure, all ill of the scurvy, and one from the resolution. I also landed some marines for a guard, and left the command to Lieutenant Edgecombe of the marines. On the 27th, early in the morning, O2, 
attended by a numerous train, paid me a visit. He first sent into the ship a large quantity of cloth, fruits, a hog, and two large fish, and after some persuasion came aboard himself with his sister, a younger brother, and several more of his attendants. To all of these I made presents, and, after breakfast, took the king, his sister, and as many more as I had room for, into my boat, and carried them home to Opari. I had no sooner landed than I was met by a venerable old lady, the mother of the late Tutaha. She seized me by both hands, and burst into a flood of tears, saying, Tutaha tio no tute mati tuatata. Tutaha, your friend, or the friend of Cook, is dead. I was so much affected with her behaviour, that it would have been impossible for me to have refrained mingling my tears with hers, had not Otu come and taken me from her. I, with some difficulty, prevailed on him to let me see her again, when I gave her an axe and some other things. Captain Furneaux, who was with me, presented the king with two fine goats, male and female, which, if taken care of, or rather if no care at all is taken, of them, will no doubt multiply. After a short stay we took leave and returned on board. Very early in the morning on the 28th I sent Mr. Pickersgill with the cutter as far as Atahuru to procure hogs. A little after sunrise I had another visit from Otu, who brought me more cloth, a pig, and some fruit. His sister, who was with him, and some of the attendants came on board, but he and others went to the adventure with the like present to Captain Furneaux. It was not long before he returned with Captain Furneaux on board the Resolution, when I made him a handsome return for the present he had brought me, and dressed his sister out in the best manner I could. She, the king's brother, and one or two more, were covered before him to-day. When Otu came into the cabin, Ereti and some of his friends were sitting there. The moment they saw the king enter, they stripped themselves in great haste, being covered before. Seeing I took notice of it, they said, Eerie, eerie, giving me to understand that it was on account of Otu being present. This was all the respect they paid him, for they never rose from their seats, nor made him any other obeisance. When the king thought proper to depart, I carried him again to Opari in my boat, where I entertained him and his people, with the bagpipes, of which music they are very fond, and dancing by the seamen. He then ordered some of the people to dance also, which consisted chiefly of contortions. There were some, however, who could imitate the seamen pretty well, both in country dances and hornpipes. While we were here I had a present of cloth from the late Tutaha's mother. This good old lady could not look upon me without shedding tears. However, she was far more composed than before. When we took leave, the king promised to visit me again the next day, but said that I must first come to him. In the evening Mr. Pickersgill came back empty, but with a promise of having some hogs, if he would return in a few days. Next morning after breakfast I took a trip to Opari, to visit Otu, as he had requested, accompanied by Captain Furneaux and some of the officers. We made him up a present of such things as he had not seen before. One article was a broadsword, at the sight of which he was so intimidated that I had much ado to persuade him to accept of it, and to have it buckled upon him, where it remained but a short time before he desired leave to take it off, and send it out of his sight. Soon after we were conducted to the theatre, where we were entertained with a dramatic huiva, or play, in which were both dancing and comedy. The performers were five men and one woman, who was no less a person than the king's sister. The music consisted of three drums only, it lasted about an hour and a half or two hours, and upon the whole was well conducted. It was not possible for us to find out the meaning of the play. 
some part seemed adapted to the present time, as my name was frequently mentioned. Other parts were certainly wholly unconnected with us. It apparently differed in nothing, that is, in the manner of acting it, from those we saw at Ulilea in my former voyage. The dancing dress of the lady was more elegant than any I saw there, by being decorated with long tassels made of feathers hanging from the waist downward. As soon as all was over, the king himself desired me to depart, and sent into the boat different kinds of fruit and fish, ready dressed. With this we returned on board, and the next morning he sent me more fruit and several small parcels of fish. Nothing farther remarkable happened till ten o'clock in the evening, when we were alarmed with a cry of murder and a great noise on shore near the bottom of the bay at some distance from our encampment. I suspected that it was occasioned by some of our own people, and immediately armed a boat and sent on shore, to know the occasion of this disturbance, and to bring off such of our people as should be found there. I also sent to the adventure and to the post on shore to know who was missing, for none were absent from the resolution but those who were upon duty. The boat soon returned with three marines and a seaman. Some others belonging to the adventure were also taken, and being all put under confinement, the next morning I ordered them to be punished according to their deserts. I did not find that any mischief was done, and our people would confess nothing. I believe this disturbance was occasioned by their making too free with the women. Be this as it will, the natives were so much alarmed that they fled from their habitations in the dead of the night, and the alarm spread many miles along the coast. For when we went to visit Otu in the morning by appointment, I found him removed, or rather fled, many miles from the place of his abode. Even there I was obliged to wait some hours before I could see him at all, and when I did, he complained of the last night's riot. As this was intended to be my last visit, I had taken with me a present suitable to the occasion. Among other things were three cave sheep, which he had seen before and asked for, for these people never lose a thing by not asking for it. He was much pleased with them, though he could be but little benefited, as they were all weathers, a thing he was made acquainted with. The presence he got at this interview entirely removed his fears and opened his heart so much that he sent for three hogs, one for me, one for Captain Furnow, and one for Mr. Forster. This last was small, of which we complained, calling it Itty Itty. Presently after a man came into the circle, and spoke to the king with some warmth, and in a very peremptory manner, saying something or other about hogs. We at first thought he was angry with the king for giving us so many, especially as he took the little pig away with him. The contrary, however, appeared to be the true cause of his displeasure, for presently, after he was gone, a hog, larger than either of the other two, was brought us in lieu of the little one. When we took leave I acquainted him that I should sail from the island the next day, at which he seemed much moved and embraced me several times. We embarked to return on board, and he, with his numerous train, directed his march back to Opari. 1773 September The sick being all pretty well recovered, our water casks repaired and water completed, as well as the necessary repairs of the ships, I determined to put to sea without farther delay. Accordingly, on the 1st of September, I ordered everything to be got off from the shore, and the ships to be unmoored. On this work we were employed the most of the day. In the afternoon Mr. Pickersgill returned from Atahuru, to which place I had sent him two days before, for the hogs he had been promised. My old friend Patatu, the chief of the district, his wife or mistress, I know not which, and some more of his friends came along with Mr. Pickersgill in order to visit me. They brought me a present of two hogs and some fish, and Mr. Pickersgill got two more hogs, 
by exchange for Mao Amu, for he went into the boat as far as Papara, where he saw old Oberia. She seemed much altered for the worst, poor and of little consequence. The first words she said to Mr. Pickersgill were, Iri Matau in a boa. Iri is frightened. You can have no hogs. By this it appeared that she had little or no property, and was herself subject to the Iri, which I believe was not the case when I was here before. The wind which had blown westerly all day, having shifted at once to the east we put to sea, and I was obliged to dismiss my friends sooner than they wished to go, but well satisfied with the reception they had met with. Some hours before we got under sail, a young man, whose name was Poria, came and desired I would take him with me. I consented, thinking he might be of service to us on some occasion. Many more offered themselves, but I refused to take them. This youth asked me for an axe and a spike-nail for his father, who was then on board. He had them accordingly, and they parted just as we were getting under sail, more like two strangers than father and son. This raised a doubt in me whether it was so, which was farther confirmed by a canoe conducted by two men, coming alongside as we were standing out in the bay, and demanding the young man in the name of Otu. I now saw that the whole was a trick to get something from me, well knowing that Otu was not in the neighbourhood, and could know nothing of the matter. Poria seemed, however, at first undetermined, whether he should go or stay, but he soon inclined to the former. I told him to return me the axe and nails, and that he should go, and so he really should, but they said they were on shore, and so departed. Though the youth seemed pretty well satisfied, he could not refrain from weeping when he viewed the land astern. End of Book One Chapter Eleven Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts. Book One, Chapter Twelve of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume One by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole. Chapter Twelve An Account of the Reception We Met With at Wahine, with the Incidents That Happened While the Ships Lay There and of Omai, one of the natives, coming away in the adventure. 1773 September As soon as we were clear of the bay and our boats in, I directed my course for the island of Wahene, where I intended to touch. We made it the next day and spent the night, making short boards under the north end of the island. At daylight in the morning of the third, we made sail for the harbour of Wahare, in which the resolution anchored about nine o'clock in twenty-four fathoms water. As the wind blew out of the harbour I chose to turn in by the southern channel, it being the widest. The resolution turned in very well, but the adventure, missing stays, got ashore on the north side of the channel. I had the resolution's launch in the water ready, in case of an accident of this kind, and sent her immediately to the adventure. By this time the assistance she was got off again without receiving any damage. Several of the natives by this time had come off to us, bringing with them some of the productions of the island, and as soon as the ships were both in safety I landed with Captain Furneaux, and was received by the natives with the utmost cordiality. I distributed some presents among them, and they presently after brought down hogs, fowls, dogs, and fruits, which they willingly exchanged for hatchets, nails, beads, etc. The like trade was soon opened on board the ships, so that we had a fair prospect of being plentifully supplied with fresh pork and fowls, and to people in our situation this was no unwelcome thing. I learned that my old friend Ori, chief of the isle, was still living, and that he was hastening to this part to see me. Early next morning Lieutenant Pickersgill sailed with the cutter on a trading party towards the south end of the isle. I also sent another trading party on shore near the ships, 
with which I went myself, to see that it was properly conducted at the first setting out, a very necessary point to be attended to. Everything being settled in my mind, I went, accompanied by Captain Furneaux and Mr. Forster, to pay my first visit to Orry, who, I was told, was waiting for me. We were conducted to the place by one of the natives, but were not permitted to go out of our boat till we had gone through some part of the following ceremony, usually performed at this isle on such like occasions. The boat in which we were desired to remain, being landed before the chief's house, which stood close to the shore, five young plantain trees, which are their emblems of peace, were brought on board separately and with some ceremony. Three young pigs, with their ears ornamented with coconut fibres, accompanied the first three, and a dog the fourth. Each had his particular name and purpose, rather too mysterious for us to understand. Lastly, the chief sent for me the inscription engraved on a small piece of pewter, which I left with him in July 1769. It was in the same bag I had made for it, together with a piece of counterfeit English coin and a few beads, put in at the same time, which shows how well he had taken care of the whole. When they had made an end of putting into the boat the things just mentioned, our guide, who still remained with us, desired us to decorate the young plantain trees with looking-glasses, nails, medals, beads, etc., etc. This being accordingly done, we landed with these in our hands, and were conducted towards the chief through the multitude, they making a lane, as it were, for us to pass through. We were made to sit down a few paces short of the chief, and our plantains were then taken from us, and one by one laid before him, as the others had been laid before us. One was for Itoe, or God, the second for the Iri, or King, and the third for Tio, or Friendship. This being done, I wanted to go to the king, but was told that he would come to me, which he accordingly did, fell upon my neck, and embraced me. This was by no means ceremonious. The tears which trickled plentifully down his venerable old cheeks sufficiently bespoke the language of his heart. The whole ceremony being over, all his friends were introduced to us, to whom we made presents. Mine to the chief consisted of the most valuable articles I had, for I regarded this man as a father. In return he gave me a hog and a quantity of cloth, promising that all our wants should be supplied, and it will soon appear how well he kept his word. At length we took leave and returned on board, and some time after Mr. Pickersgill returned also with fourteen hogs. Many more were got by exchanges on shore and alongside the ships, besides fowl and fruit in abundance. The good old chief made me a visit early in the morning on the 5th, together with some of his friends, bringing me a hog and some fruit, for which I made him a suitable return. He carried his kindness so far as not to fail to send me every day for my table, the very best of ready-dressed fruit and roots, and in great plenty. Lieutenant Pickersgill, being again sent with the two boats in search of hogs, returned in the evening with twenty-eight, and about four times that number were purchased on shore and alongside the ships. The next morning the trading party, consisting of only two or three people, were sent on shore as usual, and after breakfast I went to the place myself, when I learnt that one of the inhabitants had been very troublesome and insolent, this man being pointed out to me, completely equipped in the war habit, with a club in each hand, as he seemed bent on mischief, I took these from him, broke them before his eyes, and, with some difficulty, forced him to retire from the place. As they told me that he was a chief, this made me the more suspicious of him, and occasioned me to send for a guard, which till now I had thought unnecessary. About this time Mr. Sparman, having imprudently gone out alone botanizing, was set upon by two men, who stripped him of everything he had about him, except his trousers, and struck him several times with his own hanger, but happily did him no harm. 
As soon as they had accomplished their end, they made off, after which another of the natives brought a piece of cloth to cover him, and conducted him to the trading place, where there were a great number of the inhabitants. The very instant Mr. Sparman appeared in the condition I have just mentioned, they all fled with the utmost precipitation. I at first conjectured they had stolen something, but we were soon undeceived upon Mr. Sparman's relating the affair to us. As soon as I could recall a few of the natives, and made them sensible that I should take no step to injure those who were innocent, I went to Oree to complain of this outrage, taking with us the man who came back with Mr. Sparman to confirm the complaint. As soon as the chief heard the whole affair related, he wept aloud, as did many others. After the first transports of his grief were over, he began to expostulate with his people, telling them, as far as we could understand, how well I had treated them, both in this and my former voyage, and how base it was in them to commit such actions. He then took a very minute account of the things Mr. Sparman had been robbed of, promised to do all in his power to recover them, and, rising up, desired me to follow him to my boat. When the people saw this, being, as I supposed, apprehensive of his safety, they used every argument to dissuade him from what they, no doubt, thought a rash step. He hastened into the boat, notwithstanding all that they could do or say. As soon as they saw their beloved chief wholly in my power, they set up a great outcry. The grief they showed was inexpressible. Every face was bedewed with tears. They prayed, entreated, nay, attempted to pull him out of the boat. I even joined my entreaties to theirs, for I could not bear to see them in such distress. All that could be said or done availed nothing. He insisted on my coming into the boat, which was no sooner done than he ordered it to be put off. His sister, with a spirit equal to that of her royal brother, was the only person who did not oppose his going. As his intention in coming into our boat was to go with us in search of the robbers, we proceeded accordingly as far as was convenient by water, then landed, entered the country, and travelled some miles inland, the chief leading the way, inquiring of every one he saw. At length he stepped into a house by the roadside, ordered some coconuts for us, and after we were a little refreshed, wanted to proceed still farther. But this I opposed, thinking that we might be carried to the very farthest end of the island, after things, the most of which, before they came into our hands again, might not be worth the bringing home. The chief used many arguments to persuade me to proceed, telling me that I might send my boat round to meet us, or that he would get a canoe to bring us home, if I thought it too far to travel. But I was resolved to return, and he was obliged to comply and return with me, when he saw I would follow him no farther. I only desired he would send somebody for the things, for I found that the thieves had got so much start of us, that we might follow them to the remotest parts of the isle, without so much as seeing them. Besides, as I intended to sail the next morning, this occasioned a great loss to us, by putting a stop to all manner of trade, for the natives were so much alarmed that none came near us, but those that were about the chief. It therefore became the more necessary for me to return, to restore things to their former state. When we got back to our boat, we there found Ori's sister, and several more persons, who had travelled by land to the place. We immediately stepped into the boat in order to return on board, without so much as asking the chief to accompany us. He, however, insisted on going also, and followed us into the boat in spite of the opposition and entreaties of those about him. His sister followed his example, and the tears and prayers of her daughter, who was about sixteen or eighteen years of age, had no weight with her on this occasion. The chief sat at table with us, and made a hearty dinner. His sister, according to custom, ate nothing. After dinner I sufficiently rewarded them for the confidence they had put in me, 
and soon after carried them both on shore, where some hundreds of people waited to receive them, many of whom embraced their chief with tears of joy. All was now joy and peace. The people crowded in from every part, with hogs, fowls, and fruit, so that we presently filled two boats. Ari himself presented me with a large hog and a quantity of fruit. The hanger, the only thing of value Mr. Sparman had lost, with part of his coat, were brought us, and we were told we should have the others the next day. Some of the officers who were out on a shooting party had some things stolen from them, which were returned in like manner. Thus ended the troublesome transactions of this day, which I have been the more particular in relating, because it shows what great confidence this brave old chief put in us. It also in some degree shows that friendship is sacred with them. Ari and I were professed friends in all the forms customary among them, and he seemed to think that this could not be broken by the act of any other persons. Indeed, this seemed to be the great argument he made use of to his people, when they opposed his going into my boat. His words were to this effect, Ari, meaning me, for so I was always called, and I are friends. I have done nothing to forfeit his friendship. Why then should I not go with him? We, however, may never find another chief who will act in the same manner, under similar circumstances. It may be asked, what had he to fear? To which I answer nothing for it was not my intention to hurt a hair of his head, or to detain him a moment longer than he desired. But how was he or the people to know this? They were not ignorant that if he was once in my power, the whole force of the island could not take him from me, and that, let my demands for his ransom have been ever so high, they must have complied with them. Thus far their fears, both for his and their own safety, were founded in reason. On the seventh, early in the morning, while the ships were unmooring, I went to pay my farewell visit to Ari, accompanied by Captain Furneaux and Mr. Forster. We took with us, for a present, such things as were not only valuable but useful. I also left with him the inscription plate he had before in keeping, and another small copper plate, on which were engraved these words, Anchored here, His Britannic Majesty's ships Resolution and Adventure, September 1773, together with some medals, all put up in a bag, of which the chief promised to take care, and to produce to the first ship or ships that should arrive at the island. He then gave me a hog, and after trading for six or eight more, and loading the boat with fruit, we took leave when the good old chief embraced me with tears in his eyes. At this interview nothing was said about the remainder of Mr. Sparman's clothes. I judged they were not brought in, and for that reason did not mention them, lest I should give the chief pain about things I did not give him time to recover, for this was early in the morning. When we returned to the ships we found them crowded round with canoes full of hogs, fowls and fruit, as at our first arrival. I had not been long on board before Ori himself came to inform me, as we understood, that the robbers were taken, and to desire us to go on shore, either to punish, or to see them punished. But this could not be done, as the resolution was just under sail, and the adventure already out of the harbour. The chief stayed on board till we were a full half-league out at sea, then took a most affectionate leave of me, and went away in a canoe, conducted by one man and himself, all the others having gone long before. I was sorry that it was not convenient for me to go on shore with him, to see in what manner these people would have been punished, for I am satisfied this was what brought him on board. During our short stay at the small but fertile island of Huahene, we procured to both ships not less than three hundred hogs, besides fowls and fruits, and had we stayed longer, might have got many more. For none of these articles of refreshment were seemingly diminished, 
but appeared everywhere in as great abundance as ever. Before we quitted this island, Captain Furneaux agreed to receive on board his ship a young man named Omai, a native of Ulitea, where he had some property, of which he had been dispossessed by the people of Bola Bola. I at first rather wondered that Captain Furneaux would encumber himself with this man, who, in my opinion, was not a proper sample of the inhabitants of these happy islands, not having any advantage of birth or acquired rank, nor being eminent in shape, figure, or complexion. For their people of the first rank are much fairer, and usually better behaved and more intelligent, than the middling class of people, among whom Omai is to be ranked. I have, however, since my arrival in England, been convinced of my error. For excepting his complexion, which is undoubtedly of a deeper hue than that of the Eries or gentry, who, as in other countries, live a more luxurious life, and are less exposed to the heat of the sun, I have much doubt whether any other of the natives would have given more general satisfaction by his behaviour among us. Omai has most certainly a very good understanding, quick parts and honest principles. He has a natural good behaviour, which rendered him acceptable to the best company, and a proper degree of pride, which taught him to avoid the society of persons of inferior rank. He has passions of the same kind as other young men, but has judgment enough not to indulge them in any improper excess. I do not imagine that he has any dislike to liquor, and if he had fallen into company, where the person who drank the most met with the most approbation, I have no doubt but that he would have endeavoured to gain the applause of those with whom he associated. But, fortunately for him, he perceived that drinking was very little in use but among inferior people, and as he was very watchful into the manners and conduct of the persons of rank who honoured him with their protection, he was sober and modest, and I never heard that, during the whole time of his stay in England, which was two years, he ever once was disguised with wine, or even showed an inclination to go beyond the strictest rules of moderation. Soon after his arrival in London, the Earl of Sandwich, the First Lord of the Admiralty, introduced him to His Majesty at Kew, where he met with the most gracious reception, and imbibed the strongest impression of duty and gratitude to that great and amiable prince, which I am persuaded he will preserve to the latest moment of his life. During his stay among us he was caressed by many of the principal nobility, and did nothing to forfeit the esteem of any one of them. But his principal patrons were the Earl of Sandwich, Mr. Banks, and Dr. Solander. The former probably thought it a duty of his office to protect and countenance an inhabitant of that hospitable country, where the wants and distresses of those in his department had been alleviated and supplied in the most ample manner. The others, as a testimony of their gratitude, for the generous reception they had met with during their residence in his country. It is to be observed that though Omai lived in the midst of amusements during his residence in England, his return to his native country was always in his thoughts, and though he was not impatient to go, he expressed a satisfaction as the time of his return approached. He embarked with me in the resolution when she was fitted out for another voyage, loaded with presents from his several friends, and full of gratitude for the kind reception and treatment he had experienced among us. End of Book One, Chapter Twelve Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts Book One, Chapter Thirteen of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World Volume One by James Cook this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole Chapter 13 Arrival at and departure of the ships from Ulitea, with an account of what happened there, and of Oididi, 
one of the natives coming away in the resolution. 1773 September. The chief was no sooner gone than we made sail for Ulitea, where I intended to stop a few days. Arriving off the harbour of Oha Maneno, at the close of the day we spent the night making short boards. It was dark, but we were sufficiently guided by the fishers' lights on the reefs and shoals of the isles. The next morning, after making a few trips, we gained the entrance of the harbour, and as the wind blew directly out I sent a boat to lie in soundings, that we might know when to anchor. As soon as the signal was made by her, we borrowed close to the south point of the channel, and with our sail set, shooting within the boat, we anchored in seventeen fathoms water. We then carried out anchors and hawsers to warp in by, and as soon as the resolution was out of the way, the adventure came up in like manner, and warped in by the resolution. The warping in and mooring the ships took up the whole day. We were no sooner at anchor at the entrance of the harbour than the natives crowded round us in their canoes with hogs and fruit. The latter they exchanged for nails and beads. The former we refused as yet, having already as many on board as we could manage. Several we were, however, obliged to take. As many of the principal people brought off little pigs, pepper, or avoa root, and young plantain trees, and handed them into the ship, or put them into the boats alongside, whether we would or no. For if we refused to take them on board, they would throw them into the boats. In this manner did these good people welcome us to their country. I had forgot to mention that Tupia was much inquired after at Oahene, but at this place every one asked about him and the occasion of his death and, like true philosophers, were perfectly satisfied with the answers we gave them. Indeed, as we had nothing but the truth to tell, the story was the same, by whomsoever told. Next morning we paid a formal visit to Oreo, the chief of this part of the isle, carrying with us the necessary presents. We went through no sort of ceremony at landing, but were at once conducted to him. He was seated in his own house, which stood near the waterside, where he and his friends received us with great cordiality. He expressed much satisfaction at seeing me again, and desired that we might exchange names, which I accordingly agreed to. I believe this is the strongest mark of friendship they can show to a stranger. He inquired after Tupia, and all the gentlemen by name, who were with me when I first visited the island. After we had made the chief and his friends the necessary presents, we went on board with a hog and some fruit, received from him in return, and in the afternoon he gave me another hog, still larger, without asking for the least acknowledgment. Exchanges for fruit, etc., were mostly carried on alongside the ships. I attempted to trade for these articles on shore, but did not succeed, as the most of them were brought in canoes, from distant parts and carried directly to the ships. After breakfast on the 10th, Captain Furneaux and I paid the chief a visit, and were entertained by him with such a comedy or dramatic heva as is generally acted in these isles. The music consisted of three drums, the actors were seven men and one woman, the chief's daughter. The only entertaining part in the drama was a theft committed by a man and his accomplice, in such a masterly manner, as sufficiently displayed the genius of the people in this vice. The theft is discovered before the thief has time to carry off his prize. Then a scuffle ensues with those said to guard it, who, though four to two, are beat off the stage, and the thief and his accomplices bear away their plunder in triumph. I was very attentive to the whole of this part, being in full expectation that it would have ended very differently. For I had before been informed that Tito, that is the thief, was to be acted, and had understood that the theft was to be punished with death, or a good tiparahaying, or beating, a punishment, we are told, they inflict on such as are guilty of this crime. 
Be this as it may, strangers are certainly excluded from the protection of this law. Them they rob with impunity on every occasion that offers. After the play was over we returned on board to dinner, and in the cool of the evening took a walk on shore, where we learnt from one of the natives that nine small islands, two of which were uninhabited, lay to the westward, at no great distance from hence. In the eleventh, early in the morning, I had a visit from Oreo and his son, a youth about twelve years of age. The latter brought me a hog and some fruit, for which I made him a present of an axe, and dressed him in a shirt and other things, which made him not a little proud of himself. Having stayed some hours, they went on shore, as I also did soon after, but to another part. The chief, hearing I was on shore, came to the place where he found the boat, into which he put a hog and a quantity of fruit, without saying a word to anybody, and, with some of his friends, came on board and dined with us. After supper I had a visit from Uru, the principal chief of the isle. He was introduced to us by Oreo, and brought with him, as a present, a large hog, for which I made him a handsome return. Oreo employed himself in buying hogs for me, for we now began to take of them, and he made such bargains as I had reason to be satisfied with. At length they all took leave, after making me promise to visit them next morning, which I accordingly did, in company with several of the officers and gentlemen. Oreo ordered a heaver to be acted for our entertainment, in which two very pretty young women were the actresses. This heaver was somewhat different from the one I saw before, and not so entertaining. Oreo, after it was over, accompanied us on board, together with two of his friends. The next day was spent much in the same manner, and early in the morning on the 14th I sent Mr. Pickersgill, with the Resolution's launch and Adventure's cutter, to Otaha, to procure an additional supply of bananas and plantains for a sea-store, for we could get little more of these articles at Ulitea than were sufficient for present consumption. Oreo and some of his friends paid me a pretty early visit this morning. I acquainted the chief that I would dine with him, and desired he would order two pigs to be dressed after their manner, which he accordingly did, and, about one o'clock, I, and the officers and gentlemen of both ships, went to partake of them. When we came to the chief's house we found the cloth laid, that is, green leaves were strewed thick on the floor. Round them we seated ourselves. Presently one of the pigs came over my head, sous upon the leaves, and immediately after the other, both so hot as hardly to be touched. The table was garnished round with hot bread, fruit and plantains, and a quantity of coconuts brought for drink. Each man being ready, with his knife in his hand, we turned to without ceremony, and it must be owned in favour of their cookery, that victuals were never cleaner, nor better dressed. For, though the pigs were served up whole, and one weighed between fifty and sixty pounds, and the other about half as much, yet all the parts were equally well done, and eat much sweeter than if dressed in any of our methods. The chief and his son and some other of his male friends eat with us, and pieces were handed to others who sat behind for we had a vast crowd about us, so that it might be truly said we dined in public. The chief never failed to drink his glass of Madeira whenever it came to his turn, not only now, but at all other times when he dined with us, without ever being once affected by it. As soon as we had dined the boat's crew took the remainder, and by them and those about them the whole was consumed. When we rose up many of the common people rushed in, to pick up the crumbs which had fallen, and for which they searched the leaves very narrowly. This leads me to believe that though there is plenty of pork at these isles, but little falls to their share. Some of our gentlemen being present when these pigs were killed and dressed, observed the chief to divide the entrails, lard, etc., into ten or twelve equal parts, and serve it out to certain people. 
Several daily attended the ships, and assisted the butchers, for the sake of the entrails of the hogs we killed. Probably little else falls to the share of the common people. It, however, must be owned that they are exceedingly careful of every kind of provision, and waste nothing that can be eaten by man, flesh and fish especially. In the afternoon we were entertained with a play. Plays, indeed, had been acted almost every day since we had been here, either to entertain us, or for their own amusement, or perhaps both. Next morning produced some circumstances which fully prove the timorous disposition of these people. We were surprised to find that none of them came off to the ships as usual. Two men belonging to the adventure having stayed on shore all night, contrary to orders, my first conjectures were that the natives had stripped them, and were now afraid to come near us, lest we should take some step to revenge the insult. But in order to be better satisfied, Captain Furneaux and I went ashore to Orio's house, which we found quite empty, he and all his family gone, and the whole neighbourhood in a manner quite deserted. The two men belonging to the adventure made their appearance, and informed us that they had been very civilly treated by the natives, but could give no account of the cause of their precipitate flight. All that we could learn from the very few that durst come near us was that severals were killed, others wounded by our guns, pointing out to us where the balls went in and out of the body, etc. This relation gave me a good deal of uneasiness, for the safety of our people gone to Otaha, fearing that some disturbance had happened at that island. However, in order to be better informed, I determined, if possible, to see the chief himself. Accordingly, we embarked in our boat, having one of the natives with us, and rowed along shore to the northward, the way we were told he was gone. We soon came in sight of the canoe in which he was, but before we could come up with her, he had gone on shore. We landed presently after, and found he was gone still further. An immense crowd, however, waited our landing, who entreated me to follow him. One man offered to carry me on his back, but the whole story appearing rather more mysterious than ever, and being all unarmed, I did not choose to separate myself from the boat, but embarked again and rowed after him. We soon came before the place where our guide told us he was, and put in the boat accordingly. It grounded at some distance from the shore, where we were met by a venerable old lady, wife to the chief. She threw herself into my arms and wept bitterly, insomuch that it was not possible to get one plain word from her. With this old lady in my hand I went ashore, contrary to the advice of my young man from Otaheite, who was more afraid than any of us, probably believing every word the people had told us. I found the chief seated under the shade of a house, before which was a large area, and surrounded by a vast number of people. As soon as I came to him he threw his arms about me, and burst into tears, in which he was accompanied by all the women, and some of the men, so that the lamentation became general. Astonishment alone kept me from joining with them. It was some time before I could get a word from any one. At last all my inquiries gave me no other information than that they were alarmed on account of our boats being absent, thinking that the people in them had deserted from us, and that I should take some violent means to recover them. For when we assured them that the boats would return back, they seemed cheerful and satisfied, and to a man denied that any one was hurt, either of their own or our people, and so it afterwards proved. Nor did it appear that there was the least foundation for these alarms, nor could we ever find out by what means this general consternation first took its rise. After a stay of about an hour I returned on board, three of the natives coming along with us, who proclaimed the peace as we rowed along shore to all they saw. Thus matters were again restored to their former footing, and the next morning they came off to the ships as usual. 
After breakfast, Captain Furneaux and I paid the chief a visit. We found him in his own house perfectly easy, insomuch that he and some of his friends came on board and dined with us. I was now told that my Otaheitan young man, Porio, had taken a resolution to leave me. I have just mentioned before his being with us when I followed Orio, and his advising me not to go on shore. He was so much afraid at that time that he remained in the boat till he heard all matters were reconciled. Then he came out, and presently after met with a young woman, for whom he had contracted a friendship. Having my powder horn in keeping, he came and gave it to one of my people, who was by me, and then went away with her, and I saw him no more. In the afternoon our boats returned from Otaha, pretty well laden with plantains, an article we were most in want of. They made the circuit of the island, conducted by one of the Eries, whose name was Boba, and were hospitably entertained by the people, who provided them with victuals and lodging. The first night they were entertained with a play, the second their repose was disturbed by the natives stealing their military chest. This put them on making reprisals, by which means they recovered the most of what they had lost. Having now got on board a large supply of refreshments, I determined to put to sea the next morning, and made the same known to the chief, who promised to see me again before we departed. At four o'clock we began to unmoor, and as soon as it was light, Orio, his son, and some of his friends came aboard. Many canoes also came off with fruit and hogs, the latter they even begged of us to take from them, calling them Tia Boa Ato. I am your friend, take my hog and give me an axe. But our decks were already so full of them that we could hardly move, having on board both ships between three and four hundred. By the increase of our stock, together with what we had salted and consumed, I judge that we got at this island four hundred upwards. Many, indeed, were only roasters. Others again weighed one hundred pounds or upwards, but the general run was from forty to sixty. It is not easy to say how many we might have got, could we have found room for all that were offered us. The chief and his friends, who did not leave me till we were under sail, and before he went away, pressed me much to know if I would not return and when. Questions which were daily put to me by many of these islanders. My Otaheitan's youths, leaving me, proved of no consequence, as many young men of this island voluntarily offered to come away with us. I thought proper to take on board one, who was about seventeen or eighteen years of age, named Odidi, a native of Bola Bola, and a near relation of the great Oponi, chief of that island. Soon after we were out of the harbour, and had made sail, we observed a canoe following us conducted by two men, whereupon I brought two, and they presently came alongside, having brought me a present of roasted fruit and roots from Orio. I made them a proper return before I dismissed them, and then set sail to the west with the adventure in company. End of Book 1, Chapter 13 Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts. Book 1, Chapter 14 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 1 by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole. Chapter 14 An Account of a Spanish Ship Visiting Otaheite. The Present State of the Islands with some observations on the diseases and customs of the inhabitants, and some mistakes concerning the women corrected. 1773 September I shall now give some farther account of these islands, for although I have been pretty minute in relating the daily transactions, some things which are rather interesting have been omitted. Soon after our arrival at Otaheite, we were informed that a ship about the size of the Resolution had been at Awahuahua Harbour, near the south-east end of the island, 
where she remained about three weeks, and had been gone about three months before we arrived. We were told that four of the natives were gone away with her, whose names were Debe De Bea, Pa'au-Dau, Tana Dui, and Ofahaya. At this time we conjectured this was a French ship, but on our arrival at the Cape of Good Hope, we learned she was a Spaniard, which had been sent out from America. The Otaheitans complained of a disease communicated to them by the people in this ship, which they said affected the head, throat, and stomach, and at length killed them. They seemed to dread it much, and were continually inquiring if we had it. This ship they distinguished by the name of Pahai no Pepe, ship of Pepe, and called the disease Apa no Pepe, just as they call the venereal disease Apa no Pratane, English disease, although they, to a man, say it was brought to the isle by Monsieur de Bougainville. But I have already observed that they thought Monsieur de Bougainville came from Pretana, as well as every other ship which has touched at the isle. Were it not for this assertion of the natives, and none of Captain Wallace's people being afflicted with the venereal disease, either while they were at Otaheite or after they left it, I should have concluded that long before these islanders were visited by Europeans, this or some disease which is near akin to it had existed among them. For I have heard them speak of people dying of a disorder which we interpreted to be the pox before that period. But, be this as it will, it is now far less common amongst them than it was in the year 1769 when I first visited these isles. They say they can cure it, and so it fully appears, for, notwithstanding most of my people had made pretty free with the women, very few of them were afterwards afflicted with the disorder, and those who were had it in so slight a manner that it is easily removed. But among the natives, whenever it turns to a pox, they tell us it is incurable. Some of our people to pretend to have seen some of them who had this last disorder in a high degree, but the surgeon who made it his business to inquire could never satisfy himself in this point. These people are and were, before Europeans visited them, very subject to scrofulous diseases, so that a seaman might easily mistake one disorder for another. The island of Otaheite, which in the years 1767 and 1768, as it were, swarmed with hogs and fowls, was now so ill-supplied with these animals that hardly anything could induce the owners to part with them. The few they had at this time among them seemed to be at the disposal of the kings, for while we lay at Oatipihi Bay in the kingdom of Tiarabu, or lesser peninsula, every hog and fowl we saw, we were told, belonged to Wahiatua, and all we saw in the kingdom of Opurenu, or the greater peninsula, belonged to Otu. During the seventeen days we were at this island, we got but twenty-four hogs, the half of which came from the two kings themselves, and I believe the other half were sold to us by their permission or order. We were, however, abundantly supplied with all the fruits the island produces, except breadfruit, which was not in season either at this or the other isles. Coconuts and plantains were what we got the most of, the latter, together with a few yams and other roots, were to us a succademian for bread. At Otaheite we got great plenty of apples, and a fruit like a nectarine, called by them ahiva. This fruit is common to all the isles, but apples we got only at Otaheite, and found them of infinite use to the scorbotic people. Of all the seeds that have been brought to these islands by Europeans, None have succeeded but pumpkins, and these they do not like, which is not to be wondered at. The scarcity of hogs at Otaheite may be owing to two causes. First, to the number which have been consumed and carried off by the shipping, which have touched here of late years, 
and secondly to the frequent wars between the two kingdoms. We know of two since the year 1767. At present a peace subsists between them, though they do not seem to entertain much friendship for each other. I never could learn the cause of the late war, nor who got the better in the conflict. In the battle, which put an end to the dispute, many were killed on both sides. On the part of Opurennu fell Tutaha and several other chiefs who were mentioned to me by name. Tutaha lies interred in the family Marai at Opari, and his mother and several other women, who were of his household, are now taken care of by Otu, the reigning prince, a man who, at first, did not appear to us to much advantage. I know but little of Wahi Atua of Tiarabu. This prince, who is not above twenty years of age, appeared with all the gravity of a man of fifty. His subjects do not uncover before him, or pay him any outward obeisance, as is done to Otu. Nevertheless, they seem to show him full as much respect, and he appeared in rather more state. He was attended by a few middle-aged or elderly men, who seemed to be his counsellors. This is what appeared to me to be the then state of Otahiti. The other islands, that is Wahahine, Ulitea, and Otaha, were in a more flourishing state than they were when I was there before. Since that time they had enjoyed the blessing of peace. The people seem to be as happy as any under heaven, and well they may, for they possess not only the necessaries, but many of the luxuries of life in the greatest profusion. And my young man told me that hogs, fowls, and fruits are in equal plenty at Bola Bola, a thing which Tupia would never allow. To clear up this seeming contradiction I must observe that the one was prejudiced against, and the other in favour of, this isle. The produce of the islands, the manners and customs of the natives, etc., having been treated at large in the narrative of my former voyage, it will be unnecessary to take notice of these subjects in this, unless where I can add new matter, or clear up any mistakes which may have been committed. As I had some reason to believe that, amongst their religious customs, human sacrifices were sometimes considered as necessary, I went one day to a marae in Mataivai, in company with Captain Furneaux, having with us, as I had upon all other occasions, one of my men who spoke their language tolerably well, and several of the natives, one of whom appeared to be an intelligent, sensible man. In the marae was a tupapau, on which lay a corpse and some viands, so that everything promised success to my inquiries. I began with asking questions relating to the several objects before me, if the plantains, etc., were for the Iatua. If they sacrificed the Iatua, hogs, dogs, fowls, etc., to all of which he answered the affirmative. I then asked if they sacrificed men to the Iatua. He answered Tata, Ino, that is, bad men, they first did, Tiparehe, or beating them till they were dead. I then asked him if good men were put to death in this manner. His answer was, No, only Tata, Ino. I asked him if any Ires were. He said, they had hogs to give to the Iatua, and again repeated Tatu Ino. I next asked if Tautaus, that is servants or slaves, who had no hogs, dogs or fowls, but yet were good men, if they were sacrificed to the Iatua. His answer was no, only bad men. I asked him several more questions, and all his answers seemed to tend to this one point, that men for certain crimes were condemned to be sacrificed to the gods, provided they had not wherewithal to redeem themselves. This, I think, implies that on some occasions human sacrifices are considered as necessary, particularly when they take such men as have, by the laws of their country, forfeited their lives, and have nothing to redeem them, and such will generally be found among the lower class of people. 
The man of whom I made these inquiries, as well as some others, took some pains to explain the whole of this custom to us, but we were not masters enough of their language to understand them. I have since learned from Omai that they offer human sacrifices to the Supreme Being. According to his account, what men shall be so sacrificed depends on the caprice of the high priest who, when they are assembled on any solemn occasion, retires alone into the house of God and stays there some time. When he comes out he informs them that he has seen and conversed with their great God, the high priest alone having that privilege, and that he has asked for a human sacrifice, and tells them that he has desired such a person, naming a man present, whom, most probably, the priest has an antipathy against. He is immediately killed, and so falls a victim to the priest's resentment, who, no doubt, if necessary, has address enough to persuade the people that he was a bad man. If I accept their funeral ceremonies, all the knowledge that has been obtained of their religion has been from information, and as their language is but imperfectly understood, even by those who pretend to the greatest knowledge of it, very little on this head is yet known with certainty. The liquor which they make from the plant called Ava Ava is expressed from the root and not from the leaves, as mentioned in the narrative of my former voyage. The manner of preparing this liquor is as simple as it is disgusting to a European. It is thus. Several people take some of the root and chew it till it is soft and pulpy. Then they spit it out into a platter or other vessel, every one into the same. When a sufficient quantity is chewed, more or less water is put to it, according as it is to be strong or weak. The juice thus diluted is strained through some fibrous stuff like fine shavings, after which it is fit for drinking, and this is always done immediately. It has a pepperish taste, drinks flat and rather insipid. But though it is intoxicating, I only saw one instance where it had that effect, as they generally drink it with great moderation, and but little at a time. Sometimes they chew this root in their mouths, as Europeans do tobacco, and swallow their spittle, and sometimes I have seen them eat it wholly. At Ulitea they cultivate great quantities of this plant, at Otaheite but very little. I believe there are but few islands in this sea that do not produce more or less of it, and the natives apply it to the same use as appears by Lemaire's account of Horn Island, in which he speaks of the natives making a liquor from a plant in the same manner as above mentioned. Great injustice has been done the women of Otaheite and the Society Isles, by those who have represented them, without exception, as ready to grant the last favour to any man who will come up to their price. But this is by no means the case. The favours of married women, and also the unmarried of the better sort, are as difficult to be obtained here as in any other country whatsoever. Neither can the charge be understood indiscriminately of the unmarried of the lower class, for many of these admit of no such familiarities. That there are prostitutes here, as well as in other countries, is very true, perhaps more in proportion, and such were those who came on board the ships to our people and frequented the post we had on shore. By seeing these mix indiscriminately with those of a different turn, even of the first rank, one is at first inclined to think that they are all disposed the same way, and that the only difference is in the price. But the truth is, the woman who becomes a prostitute does not seem, in their opinion, to have committed a crime of so deep a dye as to exclude her from the esteem and society of the community in general. On the whole, a stranger who visits England might, with equal justice, draw the characters of the women there, from those which he might meet with on board the ships in one of the naval ports, or in the purlieus of Covent Garden and Drury Lane. I must, however, allow that they are all completely versed in the art of coquetry, 
and that very few of them fix any bounds to their conversation. It is therefore no wonder that they have obtained the character of libertines. To what has been said of the geography of these isles, in the narrative of my former voyage, I shall now only add that we found the latitude of Oatihipiha Bay in Otaheite to be 17 degrees 43 minutes 26 seconds south, and the longitude 0 degrees 21 minutes 25 and a half seconds east from Point Venus, or 149 degrees 30 minutes 24 seconds west from Greenwich. The difference both of latitude and longitude between Point Venus and Otaheite Piha is greater than I supposed it to be when I made the circuit of the island in 1769 by two miles and four and three quarter miles respectively. It is therefore highly probable that the whole island is of a greater extent than I at that time estimated it to be. The astronomers set up their observatory and made their observations on Point Venus, the latitude of which they found to be 17 degrees 29 minutes 13 seconds south. This differs but two seconds from that which Mr. Green and I found, and its longitude, viz., 149 degrees 34 minutes 49 and a half seconds west, for anything that is yet known to the contrary is as exact. Mr. Kendall's watch was found to be gaining on mean time 8 seconds 8.63 per day, which is only 0 seconds 142, less than a Queen Charlotte sound. Consequently, its error in longitude was trifling. End of Book 1, Chapter 14 Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts Book 2, Chapter 1 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World Volume 1 by James Cook This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole Book 2 from our departure from the Society Isles, to our return to and leaving them the second time. CHAPTER One, Passage from Ulitea to the Friendly Islands, with an account of the discovery of Hervey's Island, and the incidents that happened at Middleburg. 1773, September after leaving Ulitea, as before mentioned, I steered to the west, inclining to the south, to get clear of the tracts of former navigators, and to get into the latitude of the islands of Middleborough and Amsterdam. For I intended to run as far west as these islands, and to touch there if I found it convenient, before I hauled up for New Zealand. I generally lay to every night, lest we might pass any land in the dark. Part of the twenty-first and twenty-second the wind blew from north-west, attended with thunder, lightning, and rain, having a large swell from south-south-east and south, which kept up for several days, an indication that no land was near us in that direction. On the twenty-third, at ten o'clock in the morning, land was seen from the topmast head, and at noon from the deck, extending from south by west to south-west by south. We hauled up for it with a wind at south-east, and found it to consist of two or three small islets, connected together by breakers like most of the low isles in the sea, lying in a triangular form and about six leagues in circuit. These were clothed with wood, among which were many coconut trees. We saw no people or signs of inhabitants, and had reason to think there were none. The situation of this isle, which is in the latitude of 19 degrees 18 minutes south, longitude 158 degrees 54 minutes west, is not very different from that assigned by Mr. Dalrymple to La Dezena, but as this is a point not easily determined, I named it Hervey's Island, in honour of the Honourable Captain Hervey of the Navy, one of the Lords of the Admiralty, and afterwards Earl of Bristol. As the landing on this isle, if practicable, would have caused a delay which I could ill spare at this time, we resumed our course to the west, and on the 25th we again began to use our sea-biscuits, 
the fruit which had served as succadanaeum being all but consumed, but our stock of fresh pork still continued, each man having as much every day as was needful. In our route to the west we now and then saw men of war and tropic birds and a small sea bird which is seldom seen but near the shores of the isles. We therefore conjectured that we had passed some land at no great distance. As we advanced to the west, the variation of the compass gradually increased, so that on the twenty-ninth, being in the latitude of twenty-one degrees twenty-six minutes south, longitude one seventy degrees forty minutes west, it was ten degrees forty-five minutes east. 1773 October At two o'clock p.m. on the 1st of October, we made the island of Middleburg, bearing west-south-west. At six o'clock it extended from south-west by west to north-west, distant four leagues, at which time another land was seen in the direction of north-north-west. The wind being at south-south-east, I hauled to the south in order to get round the south end of the island before the morning but at eight o'clock a small island was seen lying off it, and not knowing but that they might be connected by a reef, the extent of which we must be ignorant of, I resolved to spend the night where we were. At daybreak the next morning we bore up for the south-west side of Middleburg, passing between it and the little isle above mentioned, where we found a clear channel two miles broad. After ranging the south-west side of the greater isle to about two-thirds of its length, at a distance of half a mile from the shore, without seeing the least prospect of either anchorage or landing-place, we bore away for Amsterdam, which we had in sight. We had scarcely turned our sails before we observed the shores of Middleburg to assume another aspect, seeming to offer both anchorage and landing. Upon this we hauled the wind and plied in under the island. In the meantime two canoes, each conducted by two or three men, came boldly alongside, and some of them entered the ship without hesitation. This mark of confidence gave me a good opinion of these islanders, and determined me to visit them if possible. After making a few trips, we found good anchorage, and came to in twenty-five fathoms water and gravel bottom, a three cables length from the shore. The highest land on the island bore southeast by east, the north point northeast a half east, and the west south by west a half west, and the island of Amsterdam extending from north by west a half west to northwest a half west. We had scarcely got to an anchor before we were surrounded by a great number of canoes full of people, who had brought with them cloth and other curiosities which they exchanged for nails, etc. Several came on board. Among them was one whom, by the authority he seemed to have over the others, I found was a chief, and accordingly made him a present of a hatchet, spike nails, and several other articles, with which he was highly pleased. Thus I obtained the friendship of this chief, whose name was Tiuni. Soon after, a party of us embarked in two boats, in company with Tiuni, who conducted us to a little creek formed by the rocks, right abreast of the ships, where landing was extremely easy, and the boat secure against the surf. Here we found an immense crowd of people, who welcomed us on shore with loud acclamations. Not one of them had so much as a stick or any other weapon in their hands, an indubitable sign of their pacific intentions. They thronged so thick round the boats with cloth, matting, etc., to exchange for nails, that it was some time before we could get room to land. They seemed to be more as desirous to give than receive, for many who could not get near the boats threw into them, over the others' heads, whole bales of cloth, and then retired without either asking or waiting for anything in return. At length the chief caused them to open to the right and left, and make room for us to land. He then conducted us up to his house, which was situated about three hundred yards from the sea, at the head of a fine lawn, and under the shade of some shaddock trees. The situation was most delightful. 
In front was the sea, and the ships at anchor. Behind and on each side were plantations, in which were some of the richest productions of nature. The floor was laid with mats, on which we were seated, and the people seated themselves in a circle round us on the outside. Having the bagpipes with us, I ordered them to be played, and in return the chief directed three young women to sing a song, which they did with a very good grace. And having made each of them a present, this immediately set all the women in the circle a singing. Their songs were musical and harmonious, and no wise harsh or disagreeable. After sitting here some time we were, at our own request, conducted into one of the adjoining plantations, where the chief had another house, into which we were introduced. Bananos and coconuts were set before us to eat, and a bowl of liquor prepared in our presence of the juice of Iava for us to drink. Pieces of the root were first offered to us to chew, but as we excused ourselves from assisting in the operation, this was performed by others. When sufficiently chewed, it was put into a large wooden bowl, then mixed with water, in the manner already related, and as soon as it was properly strained for drinking, they made cups by folding of green leaves, which held near half a pint, and presented it to each of us, one of these filled with the liquor. But I was the only one who tasted it, the manner of brewing it having quenched the thirst of every one else. The bowl was, however, soon emptied of its contents, of which both men and women partook. I observed that they never filled the same cup twice, nor did two persons drink out of the same, each had a fresh cup and fresh liquor. This house was seated at one corner of the plantation, and had an area before it on which we were seated. The whole was planted round with fruit and other trees, whose spreading branches afforded an agreeable shade, and whose fragrance diffused a pleasing odour through the air. Before we had well viewed the plantation it was noon, and we returned on board to dinner, with the chief in our company. He sat at table but ate nothing, which, as we had fresh pork roasted, was a little extraordinary. After dinner we landed again, and were received by the crowd as before, Mr. Forster with his botanic party, and some of the officers and gentlemen walked into the country. Captain Furneaux and myself were conducted to the chief's house, where fruit and some greens, which had been stewed, were set before us to eat. As we had but just dined, it cannot be supposed we ate much, but Oedidi and Omai, the man on board the adventure, did honour to the feast. After this we signified our desire of seeing the country. Tiuni very readily assented, and conducted us through several plantations, which were laid out with great judgment, and enclosed with very neat fences made of reeds. They were all in very good order and well planted with various fruit trees, roots, etc. The chief took some pains to let us know the most of them belonged to himself. Near some of the houses and in the lanes that divided the plantations were running about some hogs and very large fowls, which were the only domestic animals we saw, and these they did not seem willing to part with, nor did any one, during the whole day, offer in exchange any fruit or roots worth mentioning, which determined me to leave this island and to visit that of Amsterdam. The evening brought every one on board, highly delighted with the country, and the very obliging behaviour of the inhabitants, who seemed to vie with each other in doing what they thought would give us pleasure. The ships were crowded with people the whole day trafficking with those on board, in which the greatest good order was observed and I was sorry that the season of the year would not admit of my making a longer stay with them. Early the next morning, while the ships were getting under sail, I went on shore with Captain Furneaux and Mr. Forster to take leave of the chief. He met us at the landing-place and would have conducted us to his house had we not excused ourselves. We therefore were seated on the grass where we spent about half an hour in the midst of a vast crowd of people. After making the chief a present, consisting of various articles and an assortment of garden seeds, 
I gave him to understand that we were going away, at which he seemed not at all moved. He and two or three more came into our boat in order to accompany us on board, but seeing the resolution under sail, he called to a canoe to put alongside, into which he and his friends went and returned on shore. While he remained in our boat, he continued to exchange fish-hooks for nails, and engross the trade in a manner wholly to himself, but when on shore, I never saw him make the least exchange. End of Book Two, Chapter One Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts Book Two, Chapter Two of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World Volume One by James Cook This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole Book Two, Chapter Two The Arrival of the Ships at Amsterdam a description of a place of worship, and an account of the incidents which happened while we remained at that island. 1773 October As soon as I was on board we made sail down to Amsterdam. The people of this isle were so little afraid of us that some met us in three canoes about midway between the two isles. They used their utmost efforts to get on board, but without effect as we did not shorten sail for them, and the rope which we gave them broke. They then attempted to board the adventure, and met with the same disappointment. We ran along the southwest coast of Amsterdam at half a mile from shore, on which the sea broke in a great surf. We had an opportunity, by the help of our glasses, to view the face of the island, every part of which seemed to be laid out in plantations. We observed the natives running along the shore, displaying small white flags, which we took for ensigns of peace, and answered them by hoisting a St. George's ensign. Three men belonging to Middleburg, who, by some means or other, had been left on board the adventure, now quitted her and swam to the shore, not knowing that we intended to stop at this isle, and having no inclination as may be supposed, to go away with us. As soon as we opened the west side of the isle, we were met by several canoes, each conducted by three or four men. They came boldly alongside, presented us with some yava root, and then came on board without further ceremony, inviting us, by all the friendly signs they could make, to go to their island, and pointing to the place where we should anchor, at least we so understood them. After a few boards we anchored in Van Diemen's Road, in eighteen fathoms water, little more than a cable's length from the breakers, which line the coast. We carried out the coasting anchor and cable to seaward, to keep the ship from tailing on the rocks, in case of a shift of wind or a calm. This last anchor lay in forty-seven fathoms water, so steep was the bank, on which we anchored. By this time we were crowded with people. Some came off in canoes and others swam, but like those of the other isle brought nothing with them but cloth, matting, etc., for which the seamen only bartered away their clothes. As it was probable they would soon feel the effects of this kind of traffic, with a view to put a stop to it and to obtain the necessary refreshments, I gave orders that no sort of curiosities should be purchased by any person whatsoever. The good effect of this order was found in the morning, for, when the natives saw we would purchase nothing but eatables, they brought off bananas and coconuts in abundance, some fowls and pigs, all of which they exchanged for small nails and pieces of cloth. Even old rags of any sort was enough for a pig or a fowl. Matters being thus established, and proper persons appointed to trade under the direction of the officers to present disputes, after breakfast I landed, accompanied by Captain Furneaux, Mr. Forster, and several of the officers, having along with us a chief or person of some note, whose name was Otago, who had attached himself to me from the first moment of his coming on board, which was before we anchored. 
I know not how he came to discover that I was the commander, but certain it is that he was not long on deck before he singled me out from all the gentlemen, making me a present of some cloth and other things he had about him, and as a greater testimony of friendship we now exchanged names, a custom which is practised over Otaheite and the Society Isles. We were lucky, or rather we may thank the natives, for having anchored before a narrow creek in the rocks which line the shore. To this creek we were conducted by my friend Otago, and there we landed dry on the beach and within the breakers, in the face of a vast crowd of people, who received us in the same friendly manner that those of Middleburg had done. As soon as we were landed, all the gentlemen set out into the country, accompanied by some of the natives, but the most of them remained with Captain Furneaux and me, who amused ourselves some time distributing presents amongst them, especially to such as Otago pointed out, which were not many, but who I afterwards found, were of superior rank to himself. At this time, however, he seemed to be the principal person, and to be obeyed as such. After we had spent some time on the beach, as we complained of the heat, Otago immediately conducted and seated us under the shade of a tree, ordering the people to form a circle round us. This they did, and never once attempted to push themselves upon us, like the Otahitans. After sitting here some time, and distributing some presents to those about us, we signified our desire to see the country. The chief immediately took the hint, and conducted us along a lane that led to an open green, on the one side of which was a house of worship, built on a mount that had been raised by the hand of man about sixteen or eighteen feet above the common level. It had an oblong figure, and was enclosed by a wall or parapet of stone, about three feet in height. From this wall the mount rose with a gentle slope, and was covered with a green turf. On the top of it stood the house, which had the same figure as the mount, about twenty feet in length, and fourteen or sixteen broad. As soon as we came before the place, Every one seated himself on the green, about fifty or sixty yards from the front of the house. Presently came three elderly men, who seated themselves between us and it, and began a speech, which I understood to be a prayer, it being wholly directed to the house. This lasted about ten minutes, and then the priests, for such I took them to be, came and sat down along with us when we made them presents of such things as were about us. Having then made signs to them that we wanted to view the premises, my friend Otago immediately got up, and going with us, without showing the least backwardness, gave us full liberty to examine every part of it. In the front were two stone steps leading to the top of the wall. From this the ascent to the house was easy, round which was a fine gravel walk. The house was built in all respects like to their common dwelling-houses, that is, with posts and rafters and covered with palm thatch. The eaves came down within about three feet of the ground, which space was filled up with strong matting, made of palm leaves, as a wall. The floor of the house was laid with fine gravel, except in the middle, where there was an oblong square of blue pebbles raised about six inches higher than the floor. At one corner of the house stood an image rudely carved in wood, and on one side lay another, each about two feet in length. I, who had no intention to offend either them or their gods, did not so much as touch them, but asked Otago as well as I could, if they were Iatuas or gods. Whether he understood me or no, I cannot say but he immediately turned them over and over, in as rough a manner as he would have done any other log of wood, which convinced me that they were not there as representatives of the divinity. I was curious to know if the dead were interred there, and asked Otago several questions relative there, there too. But I was not sure that he understood me, at least I did not understand the answers he made well enough to satisfy my inquiries. For the reader must know 
that our first coming among these people, we hardly could understand a word they said. Even my Otaheathen youth, and the men on board the adventure, were equally at a loss, but more of this by and by. Before we quitted the house we thought it necessary to make an offering at the altar. Accordingly we laid down upon the blue pebbles some medals, nails, and several other things, which we had no sooner done than my friend Otago took them up and put them in his pocket. The stones with which the walls were made that enclosed this mount were some of them nine or ten feet by four and about six inches thick. It is difficult to conceive how they can cut such stones out of the coral rocks. This mount stood in a kind of grove, open only on the side which fronted the high road, and the green on which the people were seated. At this green or open place was a junction of five roads, two or three of which appeared to be very public ones. The groves were composed of several sorts of trees. Among others was the Etoa tree, as it is called on Otaheite, of which are made clubs, etc., and a kind of low palm, which is very common in the northern parts of New Holland. After we had done examining this place of worship, which in their language is called Afia Tuaka, we desired to return, but instead of conducting us to the waterside as we expected, they struck into a road leading into the country. This road, which was about sixteen feet broad and as level as a bowling green, seemed to be a very public one, there being many other roads from different parts leading into it, all enclosed on each side with neat fences made of reeds, and shaded from the scorching sun by fruit trees. I thought I was transported into the most fertile plains in Europe. There was not an inch of waste ground. The roads occupied no more space than was absolutely necessary. The fences did not take up above four inches each, and even this was not wholly lost, for in many were planted some useful trees or plants. It was everywhere the same. Change of place altered not the scene. Nature, assisted by a little art, nowhere appears in more splendour than at this isle. In these delightful walks we met numbers of people, some travelling down to the ships with their burdens of fruit, others returning back empty. They all gave us the road by turning either to the right or left, and sitting down or standing, with their backs to the fences, till we had passed. At several of the crossroads, or at the meeting of two or more roads, were generally afikatuakas, such as already described, with this difference, the mounts were palisadoed around, instead of a stone wall. At length, after walking several miles, we came to one larger than common, near to which was a large house belonging to an old chief in our company. At this house we were desired to stop, which we accordingly did, and were treated with fruit, etc. We were no sooner seated in the house then the eldest of the priests began a speech or prayer, which was first directed to the Afik Tuka, and then to me, and alternately. When he addressed me he paused at every sentence, till I gave a nod of approbation. I, however, did not understand one single word he said. At times the old gentleman seemed to be at a loss what to say, or perhaps his memory failed him, for, every now and then, he was prompted by one of the other priests who sat by him. Both during this prayer and the former one the people were silent but not attentive. At this last place we made but a short stay. Our guides conducted us down to our boat, and we returned with a targo to our ship for dinner. We had no sooner got on board than an old gentleman came alongside, who, I understood from a targo, was some king or great man. He was accordingly ushered on board, when I presented him with such things as he most valued, being the only method to make him my friend, and seated him at table to dinner. We now saw that he was a man of consequence, for a targo would not sit down and eat before him, but got to the other end of the table, 
and as the old chief was almost blind, he sat there, and ate with his back towards him. After the old man had eaten a bit of fish, and drunk two glasses of wine, he returned ashore. As soon as Otago had seen him out of the ship, he came and took his place at table, finished his dinner, and drank two glasses of wine. When dinner was over, we all went ashore, where we found the old chief, who presented me with a hog, and he and some others took a walk with us into the country. Before we set out, I happened to go down with Otago to the landing-place, and there found Mr. Wales in a laughable, though distressed situation. The boats which brought us on shore, not being able to get near the landing-place for want of a sufficient depth of water, he pulled off his shoes and stockings to walk through, and as soon as he got on dry land he put them down betwixt his legs to put on again, but they were instantly snatched away by a person behind him, who immediately mixed with the crowd. It was impossible for him to follow the man barefooted over the sharp coral rocks which composed the shore, without having his feet cut to pieces. The boat was put back to the ship. His companions had each made his way through the crowd, and he left in this condition alone. Otago soon found out the thief, recovered his shoes and stockings, and set him at liberty. Our route into the country was by the first-mentioned Afietuka, before which we again seated ourselves, but had no prayers, although the old priest was with us. Our stay here was but short, the old chief probably thinking that we might want water on board, conducted us to a plantation hard by, and showed us a pool of fresh water, though we had not made the least inquiry after any. I believe this to be the same that Tasman calls the washing place for the king and his nobles. From hence we were conducted down to the shore of Maria Bay, or northeast side of the isle, where, in the boathouse, was shown to us a fine large double canoe not yet launched. The old chief did not fail to make us sensible it belonged to himself. Night now approaching, we took leave of him, and returned on board, being conducted by Otago down to the water-side. Mr. Forster and his party spent the day in the country botanizing, and several of the officers were out shooting. All of them were very civilly treated by the natives. We had also a brisk trade for bananas, coconuts, yams, pigs, and fowls, all of which were procured for nails and pieces of cloth. A boat from each ship was employed in trading ashore, and bringing off their cargoes as soon as they were laden which was generally in a short time. By this method we got cheaper, and with less trouble, a good quantity of fruit as well as other refreshments, from people who had no canoes to carry them off to the ships. Pretty early in the morning on the 5th, my friend brought me a hog and some fruit, which I gave him a hatchet, a sheet, and some red cloth. The pinnace was sent ashore to trade as usual, but soon returned. The officer informed me that the natives were for taking everything out of the boat, and in other respects were very troublesome. The day before they stole the grappling at the time the boat was riding by it, and carried it off undiscovered. I now judged it necessary to have a guard on shore, to protect the boats and people whose business required their being there, and accordingly sent the marines under the command of Lieutenant Edgecombe. Soon after, I went myself with my friend Otago and Captain Furneaux and several of the gentlemen. At landing we found the chief who presented me with a pig. After this Captain Furneaux and I took a walk into the country with Mr. Hodges to make drawings of such places and things as were most interesting. When this was done we returned on board to dinner with my friend and two other chiefs one of which sent a hog on board the adventure for Captain Furneaux, some hours before, without stipulating for any return, the only instance of this kind. My friend took care to put me in mind of the pig the old king gave me in the morning, for which I now gave a checked shirt and a piece of red cloth. 
I had tied them up for him to carry ashore, but with this he was not satisfied. He wanted to have them put on him, which was no sooner done than he went on deck and showed himself to all his countrymen. He had done the same thing in the morning with the sheet I gave him. In the evening we all went on shore again, where we found the old king, who took to himself everything my friend and the others had got. The different trading parties were so successful to-day as to procure for both ships a tolerably good supply of refreshments, in consequence of which I, the next morning, gave every one leave to purchase what curiosities and other things they please. After this, it was astonishing to see with what eagerness every one courted everything he saw. It even went so far as to become the ridicule of the natives, who offered pieces of sticks and stones to exchange. One waggish boy took a piece of human excrement on the end of a stick, and held it out to every one he met with. This day a man got into the master's cabin, through the outside scuttle, and took out some books and other things. He was discovered just as he was getting out into his canoe, and pursued by one of our boats, which obliged him to quit the canoe and take to the water. The people in the boat made several attempts to lay hold of him, but he as often dived under the boat, and at last having unshipped the rudder, which rendered her ungovernable, by this means he got clear off. Some other very daring thefts were committed at the landing-place. One fellow took a seaman's jacket out of the boat and carried it off, in spite of all that our people in her could do. Till he was both pursued and fired at by them, he would not part with it, nor would he have done it then, had not his landing been intercepted by some of us who were on shore. The rest of the natives, who were very numerous, took very little notice of the whole transaction, nor were they the least alarmed when the man was fired at. My friend Otago, having visited me again next morning as usual, brought with him a, a hog, and assisted me in purchasing several more. Afterwards we went ashore, visited the old king with whom we stayed till noon, then returned on board to dinner with Otago, who never once left me. Intending to sail next morning, I made up a present for the old king, and carried it on shore in the evening. As soon as I landed I was told by the officers who were on shore that a far greater man than any we had yet seen was come to pay us a visit. Mr. Pickersgill informed me that he had seen him in the country, and found that he was a man of some consequence, by the extraordinary respect paid him by the people. Some, when they approached him, fell on their faces, and put their head between their feet, and no one durst pass him without permission. Mr. Pickersgill, and another of the gentlemen, took hold of his arms, and conducted him down to the landing-place, where I found him seated with so much sullen and stupid gravity, that notwithstanding what had been told me, I really took him for an idiot, whom the people, from some superstitious notions, were ready to worship. I saluted and spoke to him, but he neither answered nor took the least notice of me, nor did he alter a single feature of his countenance. This confirmed me in my opinion, and I was just going to leave him, when one of the natives, an intelligent youth, undertook to undeceive me, which he did in such a manner as left me no room to doubt that he was the king, or principal man on the island. Accordingly I made him the presents I intended for the old chief, which consisted of a shirt and axe, a piece of red cloth, a looking-glass, some nails, medals, and beads. He received these things, or rather suffered them to be put upon him, and laid down by him, without losing a bit of his gravity, speaking one word, or turning his head either to the right or left, sitting the whole time like a statue, in which situation I left him to return on board, and he soon after retired. I had not been long on board before a word was brought me that a quantity of provisions had come from this chief. 
a boat was sent to bring it from the shore, and it consisted of about twenty baskets of roasted bananos, sour bread and yams, and a roasted pig of about twenty pounds weight. Mr. Edgecombe and his party were just re-embarking, when these were brought to the waterside, and the bearer said it was a present from the Ariki, that is, the king of the island, to the Ariki of the ship. After this I was no longer to doubt the dignity of this sullen chief. Early in the morning of the 7th, while the ships were unmooring, I went ashore with Captain Furneaux and Mr. Forster, in order to make some return to the king for the, his last night's present. We no sooner landed than we found Otago, of whom we inquired for the king, whose name was Kohaji To Falangu, he accordingly undertook to conduct us to him, but whether he mistook the man we wanted, or was ignorant where he was, I know not. Certain it is that he took us a wrong road, in which he had not gone far before he stopped, and after some little conversation between him and another man, we returned back, and presently after the king appeared, with very few attendants. As soon as Otago saw him coming, he sat down under a tree and desired us to do the same. The king seated himself on a rising ground, about twelve or fifteen yards from us. Here we sat facing one another for some minutes. I waited for Otago to show us the way, but seeing he did not rise, Captain Furneaux and I got up, went and saluted the king, and sat down by him. We then presented him with a white shirt, which we put on his back, a few yards of red cloth, a brass kettle, a saw, two large spikes, three looking-glasses, a dozen of medals, and some strings of beads. All this time he sat with the same sullen, stupid gravity as the day before. He even did not seem to see or know what we were about. His arms appeared immovable at his sides. He did not so much as raise them when we put on the shirt. I told him, both by words and signs, that we were going to leave his island. He scarcely made the least answer to this, or any other thing we either said or did. We therefore got up and took leave, but I yet remained near him to observe his actions. Soon after he entered into conversation with a Targo and an old woman, whom we took to be his mother. I did not understand any part of the conversation. It, however, made him laugh, in spite of his assumed gravity. I say assumed because it exceeded everything of the kind I ever saw, and therefore think it could not be his real disposition, unless he was an idiot, indeed as these islanders, like all the others we had lately visited, have a great deal of levity, and he was in the prime of life. At last he rose up, and retired with his mother and two or three more. Atago conducted us to another circle, where were seated the aged chief and several respectable old persons of both sexes, among whom was the priest, who was generally in company with his chief. We observed that his reverend father, could walk very well in a morning, but in the evening was obliged to be led home by two people. By this we concluded that the juice of the pepper-root had the same effect upon him that wine and other strong liquors have on Europeans who drink a large portion of them. It is very certain that these old people seldom sat down without preparing a bowl of this liquor, which is done in the same manner as at Ulitia. We, however, must do them the justice to believe that it was meant to treat us. Nevertheless, the greatest part, if not the whole, generally fell to their share. I was not well prepared to take leave of this chief, having exhausted almost all our store on the other. However, after rummaging our pockets and treasury bag, which was always carried with me wherever I went, we made up a tolerable present both for him and his friends. This old chief had an air of dignity about him that commanded respect, which the other had not. He was grave but not sullen, 
would crack a joke, talk on indifferent subjects, and endeavour to understand us and be understood himself. During this visit the old priest repeated a short prayer or speech, the purport of which we did not understand. Indeed he would frequently at other times break out in prayer, but I never saw any attention paid to him by any one present. After a stay of near two hours we took leave and returned on board, with Otago and two or three more friends, who stayed and breakfasted with us, after which they were dismissed, loaded with presents. Otago was very importunate with me to return again to this isle, and bring with me cloth, axes, nails, etc., etc., telling me that I should have hogs, fowls, fruit and roots in abundance. He particularly desired me, more than once, to bring him such a suit of clothes as I had on, which was my uniform. This good-natured islander was very serviceable to me on many occasions during our short stay. He constantly came on board every morning soon after it was light, and never quitted us till the evening. He was always ready, either on board or on shore, to do me all the service in his power. His fidelity was rewarded at a small expense, and I find my account in having such a friend. In heaving in the coasting cable, it parted in the middle of its length, being chafed by the rocks. By this accident we lost the other half, together with the anchor, which lay in forty fathoms water, without any buoy to it. The best bower cable suffered also by the rocks, by which a judgment may be formed of this anchorage. At ten o'clock we got under sail, but as our decks were much encumbered with fruit, etc., we kept plying under the land till they were cleared. The supplies we got at this isle were about one hundred and fifty pigs, twice that number of fowls, as many bananos and coconuts as we could find room for, with a few yams, and had our stay been longer, we no doubt might have got a great deal more. This in some degree shows the fertility of the island, of which, together with the neighbouring one of Middleburg, I shall now give a more particular account. End of Book 2, Chapter 2 Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts Book 2, Chapter 3 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 1 by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole. Chapter 3 A Description of the Islands and Their Produce, with the Cultivation, Houses, Canoes, Navigation, Manufactures, Weapons, Customs, Government, religion and language of the inhabitants. 1773 October These islands were first discovered by Captain Tasman in January 1642-3, and by him called Amsterdam and Middleburg. But the former is called by the natives Tonga Tabu, and the latter Iowi, they are situated between the latitude of 21 degrees 29 minutes and 21 degrees 3 minutes south, and between the longitude of 174 degrees 40 minutes and 175 degrees 15 minutes west, deduced from observations made on the spot. Middleburg, or Iuwi, which is the southernmost, is about 10 leagues in circuit, and of a height sufficient to be seen twelve leagues. The skirts of this isle are mostly taken up in the plantations, the south-west and north-west sides especially. The interior parts are but little cultivated, though very fit for cultivation. However, the want of it added greatly to the beauty of the isle, for here are, agreeably dispersed, groves of coconut and other trees, lawns covered with thick grass, here and there plantations, and paths leading to every part of the island, in such beautiful disorder as greatly enlivens the prospect. The anchorage which I named English Road, being the first who anchored there, is on the northwest side in latitude 21 degrees 20 minutes 30 seconds south. 
the bank is of a coarse sand it extends two miles from the land and on it there is from twenty to forty fathoms water the small creek before it affords convenient landing for boats at all times of the tide which here as well as at the other islands rises about four or five feet and is high water on the full and change days about seven o'clock the island of tonga tabu is shaped something like an isosceles triangle the longest sides whereof are seven leagues each and the shortest four it lies nearly in the direction of east south east and west north west is nearly all of an equal height rather low not exceeding sixty or eighty feet above the level of the sea this island and also that of Iui, is guarded from the sea by a reef of coral rocks extending out from the shore one hundred fathoms more or less on this reef the force of the sea is spent before it reaches the land or shore indeed this is in some measure the situation of all the tropical isles in this sea that i have seen and thus nature has effectually secured them from the encroachments of the sea though many of them are mere points when compared to this vast ocean van diemen's road where we anchored is under the northwest part of the island between the most northern and western points there lies a reef of rocks without it bearing northwest by west over which the sea breaks continually the bank does not extend more than three cables length from the shore without that is an unfathomable depth the loss of an anchor and the damage our cable sustained are sufficient proofs that the bottom is none of the best on the east side of the north point of the island as mr gilbert whom i sent to survey the parts informed me is a very snug harbour of one mile or more in extent wherein is seven eight and ten fathoms water with a clean sandy bottom the channel by which he went in and out lies close to the point and has only three fathoms water but he believes that farther to the north-east is a channel with a much greater depth which he had not time to examine indeed it would have taken up far more time than i could spare to have surveyed these parts minutely as there lies a number of small islets and reefs of rocks along the north-east side of the island which seem to extend to the north-east farther than the eye could reach the island of amsterdam or tonga tabu is wholly laid out in plantations in which are planted some of the richest productions of nature such as breadfruit coconut trees plantains bananas shaddocks yams and some other roots sugar cane and a fruit like a nectarine called by them figheia and a dotahiti ahuya in short here are most of the articles which the society islands produce besides some which they have not mr forster tells me that he not only found the same plants here that are at otaheite and at the neighbouring isles but several others which are not to be met with there and i probably have added to their stock of vegetables by leaving with them an assortment of garden seeds pulses etc breadfruit here as well as at all the other isles was not in season nor was this the time for roots and shaddocks we got the latter only at Middleburg. The produce and cultivation of this isle is the same as at Amsterdam, with this difference that a part only of the former is cultivated, whereas the whole of the latter is. The lanes or roads necessary for travelling are laid out in so judicious a manner as to open a free and easy communication from one part of the island to the other here are no towns or villages most of the houses are built in the plantations with no other order than what conveniency requires they are neatly constructed but do not exceed those in the other isles the materials of which they are built are the same and some little variation in the disposition of the framing is all the difference in their construction the floor is a little raised and covered with thick strung mats 
The same sort of matting serves to enclose them on the windward side, the other being open. They have little areas before the most of them, which are generally planted round with trees or shrubs of ornament, whose fragrancy perfumes the very air in which they breathe. Their household furniture consists of a few wooden platters, coconut shells, and some neat wooden pillows shaped like four-footed stools or forms. Their common clothing, with the addition of a mat, serves them for bedding. We got from them two or three earthen vessels, which were all we saw among them. One was in the shape of a bombshell, with two bowls in it, opposite one another. The others were like pipkins, containing about five or six pints, and had been in use on the fire. I am of opinion they are the manufacture of some other isle, for if they were of their own, we ought to have seen more of them. Nor am I to suppose they came from Tasman ships. The time is too long for brittle vessels like these to be preserved. We saw no other domestic animals amongst them but hogs and fowls. The former are of the same sort as at the other isles in this sea, but the latter are far superior, being as large as any we have in Europe, and their flesh equally good if not better. We saw no dogs and believe they have none, as they were exceedingly desirous of those we had on board. My friend Otago was complimented with a dog and a bitch, the one from New Zealand, the other from Ulitea. The name of the dog with them is Kuri or Guri, the same as at New Zealand, which shows that they are not wholly strangers to them. We saw no rats in these isles, nor any other wild quadrupeds except small lizards. The land birds are pigeons, turtle doves, parrots, parroquets, owls, bald coots with a blue plumage, a variety of small birds, and large bats in abundance. The produce of the sea we know but little of. It is reasonable to suppose that the same sorts of fish are found here as at the other isles. Their fishing instruments are the same, that is, hooks made of mother of pearl, gigs with two, three, or more prongs, and nets made of a very fine thread, with the meshes wrought exactly like ours. But nothing can be a more demonstrative evidence of their ingenuity than the construction and make of their canoes, which in point of neatness and workmanship exceed everything of this kind we saw in the sea. They are built of several pieces sewn together with bandage, in so neat a manner that on the outside it is difficult to see the joints. All the fastenings are on the inside and pass through cants or ridges, which are wrought on the edges and ends of the several boards which compose the vessel for that purpose. They are of two kinds, viz. double and single. The single ones are from twenty to thirty feet long, and about twenty or twenty-two inches broad in the middle. The stern terminates in a point, and the head something like the point of a wedge. At either end is a kind of deck for about one-third part of the whole length, and open in the middle. In some the middle of the deck is decorated with a row of white shells, stuck on little pegs wrought out of the same piece which composes it. These single canoes have all outriggers, and are sometimes navigated with sails, but more generally with paddles, the blades of which are short and broadest in the middle. The two vessels which compose the double canoe are each about sixty or seventy feet long and four or five broad in the middle, and each end terminates nearly in a point, so that the body or hull differs a little in construction from the single canoe, but is put together exactly in the same manner. These have a rising in the middle round the open part in the form of a long trough, which is made of boards closely fitted together and well secured to the body of the vessel. Two such vessels are fastened to, and parallel to each other, about six or seven feet asunder, by strong cross beams secured by bandages to the upper part of the risings above mentioned. 
Over these beams and others which are supported by stanchions fixed on the bodies of the canoes is laid a boarded platform. All the parts which compose the double canoe are made as strong and light as the nature of the work will admit, and may be immersed in water to the very platform without being in danger of filling. Nor is it possible, under any circumstances whatever, for them to sink so long as they hold together. Thus they are not only vessels of burden, but fit for distant navigation. They are rigged with one mast, which steps upon the platform, and can easily be raised or taken down, and are sailed with a latin sail, or triangular one, extended by a long yard, which is a little bent or crooked. The sail is made of mats, the rope they make use of is exactly like ours, and some of it is four or five inch. On the platform is built a little shed or hut, which screens the crew from the sun and weather, and serves for other purposes. They also carry a movable fire hearth, which is a square but shallow trough of wood filled with stones. The way into the hold of the canoe is from off the platform, down a sort of uncovered hatchway in which they stand to bail out the water. I think these vessels are navigated either end foremost, and that, in changing tacks, they have only occasion to shift or jib round the sail. But of this I was not certain, as I had not then seen any under sail, or with a mast and sail an end but what were a considerable distance from us. Their working tools are made of stone, bone, shells, etc., as at the other islands. When we view the work which is performed with these tools, we are struck with admiration at the ingenuity and patience of the workmen. Their knowledge of the utility of iron was no more than sufficient to teach them to prefer nails to beads and such trifles. Some, but very few, would exchange a pig for a large nail or a hatchet. Old jackets, shirts, cloth, and even rags were in more esteem than the best edge tool we could give them. Consequently, they got but few axes from us, but what were given as presents. But if we include the nails which were given by the officers and crews of both ships for curiosities, etc., with those given for refreshments, they cannot have got less than five hundred weight, great and small. The only piece of iron we saw among them was a small broad awl, which had been made of a nail. Both men and women are of a common size with Europeans, and their colour is that of a lightish copper, and more uniformly so than amongst the inhabitants of Otaheite and the Society Isles. Some of our gentlemen were of opinion these were a much handsomer race. Others maintained a contrary opinion, of which number I was one. Be this as it may, they have a good shape and regular features, and are active, brisk, and lively. The women, in particular, are the merriest creatures I ever met with, and will keep chattering by one side, without the least invitation or considering whether they are understood, provided one does but seem pleased with them. In general they appeared to be modest, although there was no want of those of a different stamp, and as we had yet some venereal complaints on board, I took all possible care to prevent the disorder being communicated to them. On most occasions they showed a strong propensity to pilfering, in which they were full as expert as the Otaheitans. Their hair in general is black, but more especially that of the women. Different colours were found among the men, sometimes on the same head, caused by something they put upon it, which stains it white, red, and blue. Both sexes wear it short, I saw but two exceptions to this custom, and the most of them combed it upwards. Many of the boys had it cut very close, except a single lock on the top of the head, and a small quantity on each side. The men cut or shaved their beards quite close, which operation is performed with two shells. They had fine eyes and in general good teeth, even to an advanced age. 
the custom of tattooing or puncturing the skin prevails the men are tattooed from the middle of the thigh to above the hips the women have it only on their arms and fingers and there but very slightly the dress of both sexes consists of a piece of cloth or matting wrapped around the waist and hanging down below the knees from the waist upwards they are generally naked and it seemed to be a custom to anoint these parts every morning my friend otago never failed to do it but whether out of respect to his friend or from custom i will not pretend to say although i rather think the latter as he was not singular in the practice their ornaments are amulets necklaces and bracelets of bones shells and beads of mother of pearl tortoise shell etc which are worn by both sexes the women also wear on their fingers neat rings made of tortoise shell and pieces in their ears about the size of a small quill but ear ornaments are not commonly worn though all have their ears pierced they have also a curious apron made of the outside fibres of the coconut shell and composed of a number of small pieces sewed together in such a manner as to form stars half moons little squares etc it is studded with beads of shells and covered with red feathers so as to have a pleasing effect they make the same kind of cloth and of the same materials as at otaheite though they have not such a variety nor do they make any so fine but as they have a method of glazing it it is more durable and will resist rain for some time which otaheite cloth will not their colours are black brown purple yellow and red all made from vegetables they make various sorts of matting some of a very fine texture which is generally used for clothing and the thick and stronger sort serves to sleep on and to make sails for their canoes etc among other useful utensils they have various sorts of baskets some are made of the same materials as their mats and others of the twisted fibres of coconuts these are not only durable but beautiful being generally composed of different colours and studded with beads made of shells or bones they have many little knack-knacks amongst them which shows that they neither want taste to design nor skill to execute whatever they take in hand how these people amuse themselves in their leisure hours i cannot say as we are but little acquainted with their diversions the women frequently entertained us with songs in a manner which was agreeable enough they accompany the music by snapping their fingers so as to keep time to it not only their voices but their music was very harmonious and they have a considerable compass in their notes i saw but two musical instruments amongst them one was a large flute made of a piece of bamboo which they fill with their noses as at otaheite but these have four holes or stops whereas those of otaheite have only two the other was composed of ten or eleven small reeds of unequal lengths bound together side by side as the doric pipe of the ancients is said to have been and the open ends of the reeds into which they blow with their mouths are of equal height or in a line they have also a drum which without any impropriety may be compared to a hollow log of wood the one i saw was five feet six inches long and thirty inches in girth and had a slit in it from the one end to the other about three inches wide by means of which it had been hollowed out they beat on the side of this log with two drumsticks and produce a hollow sound not quite so musical as that of an empty cask the common method of saluting one another is by touching or meeting noses as is done in new zealand and their sign of peace to strangers is the displaying a white flag or flags at least such were displayed to us when we first drew near the shore but the people who came first on board brought with them some of a pepper plant 
and sent it before them into the ship, a stronger sign of friendship than which one could not wish for. From their unsuspicious manner of coming on board, and of receiving us at first on shore, I am of opinion they are seldom disturbed by either foreign or domestic troubles. They are, however, not unprovided with very formidable weapons, such as clubs and spears, made of hard wood, or so bows and arrows. The clubs are from three to five feet in length, and of various shapes. Their bows and arrows are but indifferent, the former being very slight, and the latter made only of a slender reed, pointed with hard wood. Some of their spears have many barbs, and must be very dangerous weapons, where they take effect. On the inside of the bow is a groove, in which is put the arrow, from which it would seem that they use but one. They have a singular custom of putting everything you give them to their heads, by way of thanks, as we conjectured. This manner of paying a compliment is taught them from their very infancy, for when we gave things to little children, the mother lifted up the child's hand to its head. They also used this custom in their exchanges with us. Whatever we gave them for their goods was always applied to the head, just as if it had been given them for nothing. Sometimes they would look at our goods, and if not approved, return them back. But whenever they applied them to the head, the bargain was infallibly struck. When I had made a present to the chief of anything curious, I frequently saw it handed from one to another, and every one, into his, whose hands it came, put it to the head. Very often the women would take hold of my hand, kiss it, and lift it to their heads. From all this it would seem that this custom, which they call faga feti, has various significations according as it is applied all, however, complimentary. It must be observed that the sullen chief or king did not pay me any of these compliments for the presents I made him. A still more singular custom prevails in these isles. We observed that the greater part of the people, both men and women, had lost one or both their little fingers. We endeavoured, but in vain, to find out the reason of this mutilation for no one would take any pains to inform us. It was neither peculiar to rank, age, or sex, nor is it done at any certain age, as we saw those of all ages on whom the amputation had been just made, and, except some young children, we found few who had both hands perfect. As it was more common among the aged than the young, some of us were of opinion that it was occasioned by the death of their parents, or some other near relations. But Mr. Wales one day met with a man, whose hands were both perfect, of such an advanced age, that it was hardly possible his parents could be living. They also burn or make incisions in their cheeks near the cheekbone. The reason of this was equally unknown to us. In some the wounds were quite fresh, in others they could only be known by the scars or colour of the skin. I saw neither sick nor lame amongst them. All appeared healthy, strong, and vigorous, a proof of the goodness of the climate in which they live. I have frequently mentioned a king which implies the government being in a single person, without knowing for certain whether it is so or no. Such a one was, however, pointed out to us, and we had no reason to doubt it. From this and other circumstances, I am of opinion that the government is much like that of Otaheite, that is, in a king or great chief, who is here called Ariki, with other chiefs under him, who are lords of certain districts, and perhaps sole proprietors, to whom the people seem to pay great obedience. I also observed a third rank, which had not a little authority over the common people. My friend Otago was one of these. I am of opinion that all, that all the land on Tonga Tabu is private property, and that there are here, as at Otaheite, 
a set of people who are servants or slaves and have no property in land. It is unreasonable to suppose everything in common in a country so highly cultivated as this. Interest being the greatest spring which animates the hand of industry, few would toil in cultivating and planting the land if they did not expect to reap the fruit of their labour. Were it otherwise, the industrious man would be in a worse state than the idle sluggard. I frequently saw parties of six, eight, or ten people bring down to the landing-place fruit and other things to dispose of, where one person, a man or woman, superintended the sale of the whole. No exchanges were made but with his or her consent, and whatever we gave in exchange was always given them, which I think plainly showed them to be the owners of the goods, and the others no more than servants. Though benevolent nature has been very bountiful to these isles, it cannot be said that the inhabitants are wholly exempt from the curse of our forefathers. Part of their bread must be earned by the sweat of their brows. The high state of cultivation their lands are in must have cost them immense labour. This is now amply rewarded by the great produce of which every one seems to partake. No one wants the common necessaries of life. Joy and contentment are painted in every face. Indeed, it can hardly be otherwise. An easy freedom prevails among all ranks of people. They feel no wants which they do not enjoy the means of gratifying, and they live in a clime where the painful extremes of heat and cold are equally unknown. If nature has been wanting in anything, it is in the article of fresh water, which, as it is shut up in the bowels of the earth, they are obliged to dig for. A running stream was not seen, and but one well at Amsterdam. At Middleburg we saw no water but what the natives had in vessels. But as it was sweet and cool, I have no doubt of its being taken up upon the island, and probably not far from the spot where I saw it. So little do we know of their religion that I hardly dare mention it. The buildings called Afiatukas before mentioned are undoubtedly set apart for this purpose. Some of our gentlemen were of opinion that they were merely burying-places. I can only say from my own knowledge that they are places to which particular persons directed set speeches, which I understood to be prayers, as hath been already related, joining my opinion with that of others. I was inclined to think that they are set apart to be both temples and burying-places, as at Otaheite or even in Europe but I have no idea of the images being idols, not only from what I saw myself, but from Mr. Wales's informing me that they set one of them up for him and others to shoot at. One circumstance showed that these afiatukas were frequently resorted to for one purpose or another, the areas or open places before them being covered with the green sod, the grass on which was very short. This did not appear to have been cut or reduced by the hand of man, but to have been prevented in its growth by being often trod or sat upon. It cannot be supposed that we could know much either of their civil or religious policy in so short a time as four or five days, especially as we understood but little of their language. Even the two islanders we had on board could not at first understand them, and yet as we became the more acquainted with them, we found their language was nearly the same spoken at Otaheite and the Society Isles, the difference not being greater than what we find betwixt the most northern and western parts of England, as will more fully appear by the vocabulary. End of Book 2 Chapter 3 Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts Book 2, Chapter 4 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 1 by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole, 
Chapter Four Passage from Amsterdam to Queen Charlotte Sound with an account of an interview with the inhabitants and the final separation of the two ships. 1773 October About the time we were in a condition to make sail, a canoe, conducted by four men, came alongside, with one of those drums already mentioned, on which one man kept continually beating, thinking, no doubt, the music would charm us. I gave them a piece of cloth and a nail for the drum, and took an opportunity to send to my friend Otago some wheat, peas, and beans, which I had forgot to give him when he had the other seeds. As soon as this canoe was gone, we made sail to the southward, having a gentle gale at south-east by east, it being my intention to proceed directly to Queen Charlotte's Sound in New Zealand, there to take in wood and water, and then to go on farther discoveries to the south and east. In the afternoon on the 8th, we made the island of Pilstart, bearing southwest by west a half west, distant seven or eight leagues. This island, which was also discovered by Tasman, is situated in the latitude of 22 degrees 26 minutes south, longitude 175 degrees 59 minutes west, and lies in the direction of south 52 degrees west, distant 32 leagues from the south end of Middleburg. It is more conspicuous in height than circuit, having in it two considerable hills, seemingly disjoined from each other by a low valley. After a few hours calm the wind came to south-west, with which we stretched to the south-east, but on the tenth it veered round by the south to the south-east and east-south-east, and then we resumed our course to the south-south-west. At five o'clock in the morning of the twenty-first we made the land of New Zealand, extending from north-west by north to west-south-west. At noon, Table Cape bore west, distant eight or ten leagues. I was very desirous of having some intercourse with the natives of this country, as far to the north as possible, that is, about poverty or Tolago Bays, where I apprehended they were more civilized than at Queen Charlotte's Sound. In order to give them some hogs, fowls, seeds, roots, etc., which I had provided for the purpose, the wind veering to the north-west and north enabled us to fetch in with the land a little to the north of Portland, and we stood as near the shore as we could with safety. We observed several people upon it, but none attempted to come off to us. Seeing this, we bore away under Portland, where we lay to some time, as well to give time for the natives to come off, as to wait for the adventure. There were several people on Portland, but none seemed inclined to come to us. Indeed, the wind at this time blew rather too fresh for them to make the attempt. Therefore, as soon as the adventure was up with us, we made sail for Cape Kidnappers, which we passed at five o'clock in the morning, and continued our course alongshore till nine, when, being about three leagues short off Blackhead, we saw some canoes put off from the shore. Upon this I brought two, in order to give them time to come on board, but ordered the adventure, by signal, to stand on, as I was willing to lose as little time as possible. Those in the first canoe which came alongside were fishers, and exchanged some fish for pieces of cloth and nails. In the next were two men, whom, by their dress and behaviour, I took to be chiefs. These two were easily prevailed on to come on board, when they were presented with nails and other articles. They were so fond of nails as to seize on all they could find, and with such eagerness as plainly showed, they were the most valuable things we could give them. To the principal of these two men I gave the pigs, fowls, seeds, and roots. I believe at first he did not think I meant to give them to him, for he took but little notice of them, till he was satisfied they were for himself nor was he then in such a rapture as when I gave him a spike-nail, half the length of his arm. However, at his going away I took notice that he very well remembered how many pigs and fowls had been given him, 
as he took care to have them all collected together, and kept a watchful eye over them, lest any should be taken away. He made me a promise not to kill any, and if he keeps his word and proper care is taken of them, there were enough to stock the whole island in due time, being two boars, two sows, four hens, and two cocks. The seeds were such as are most useful, viz. wheat, French and kidney beans, peas, cabbage, turnips, onions, carrots, parsnips, and yams, etc. With these articles they were dismissed. It was evident that these people had not forgot the endeavour, being on their coast, for the first words they spoke to us were, Mata ao, no te pau pau, we are afraid of the guns. As they could be no strangers to the affair which happened off Cape Kidnappers in my former voyage, experience had taught them to have some regard to these instruments of death. As soon as they were gone, we stretched off to the southward, the wind having now veered to the west-south-west. In the afternoon it increased to a fresh gale and blew in squalls, in one of which we lost our foretop gallant mast, having carried the sail a little too long. The fear of losing the land induced me to carry as much sail as possible. At seven in the morning we tacked and stretched inshore. Cape Turn again, at this time bore about north-west a half-north, distant six or seven leagues. The adventure being a good way to leeward, we supposed did not observe the signal, but stood on, consequently was separated from us. During the night, which was spent in plying, the wind increased in such a manner as to bring us under our courses. It also veered to south-west and south-south-west, and was attended with rain. At nine o'clock in the morning on the twenty-third, the sky began to clear up and the gale to abate, so that we could carry close-leafed topsails. At eleven o'clock we were close in with Cape Turn again, when we tacked and stood off. At noon, the said cape bore west a little northerly, distance six or seven miles. Latitude observed forty-one degrees thirty minutes south. Soon after, the wind falling almost to a calm, and flattering ourselves that it would be succeeded by one more favourable, we got up another top-gallant mast, rigged top-gallant yards, and loosed all the reefs out of the topsails. The event was not equal to our wishes. The wind indeed came something more favourable, that is, at west by north, with which we stretched along shore to the southward, but it soon increased in such a manner as to undo what we had but just done, and at last stripped us to our courses, and two close-reefed topsails, under which sails we continued all night. About daylight the next morning, the gale abating, we were again tempted to loose out the reefs and rig top-gallant yards, which proved all lost labour, for by nine o'clock we were reduced to the same sail as before. Soon after the adventure joined us, and at noon Cape Palliser bore west, distant eight or nine leagues. This cape is at the northern point of Iahainemowe. We continued to stretch to the southward till midnight, when the wind abated and shifted to south-east. Three hours after it fell calm, during which we loosed the reefs out, with the vain hopes that the next wind which came would be favourable. We were mistaken. The wind only took this short repose in order to gain strength and fall the heavier upon us. For, at five o'clock in the morning, being the twenty-fifth, a gale sprung up at north-west, with which we stretched to south-west. Cape Palliser at this time bore north-north-west, distant eight or nine leagues. The wind increased to such a manner as obliged us to take in one reef after another, and at last it came on with such fury as made it necessary to take in all our sails with the utmost expedition, and to lie to under bare poles. The sea rose in proportion with the wind, so that we had a terrible gale and a mountainous sea to encounter. Thus, after beating up against a hard gale for two days, and arriving just in sight of our port, we had the mortification to be driven off from the land by a furious storm. Two favourable circumstances attended it, which gave us some consolation. It was fair overhead, 
and we were not apprehensive of a lee shore. The storm continued all the day without the least intermission. In the evening we bore down to look for the adventure, she being out of sight to leeward, and after running the distance we supposed her to be off, brought to again without seeing her, it being so very hazy and thick in the horizon that we could not see a mile round us, occasioned by the spray of the sea being lifted up to a great height by the force of the wind. At midnight the gale abated. Soon after fell little wind, and at last shifted to south-west, when we wore, set the courses and topsails close reefed, and stood in for the land. Soon after the wind freshened and fixed at south. But as the adventure was some distance astern, we lay by for her till eight o'clock, when we both made all sail, and steered north by west or half-west, for the strait, at noon observed in forty two degrees twenty seven minutes south, Cape Palliser by judgment bore north, distant seventeen leagues. This favourable wind was not of sufficient duration. In the afternoon it fell by little and little, and at length to a calm. This at ten o'clock was succeeded by a fresh breeze from the north, with which we stretched to the westward. At three o'clock next morning, we were pretty well in with Cape Campbell, on the west side of the strait, when we tacked and stretched over for Cape Palliser, under courses and close-reefed topsails, having the wind at north-west a very strong gale and fair weather. At noon we tacked and stretched to south-west, with the last-mentioned Cape bearing west, distant four or five leagues. In the afternoon the gale increased in such a manner as brought us under our courses. We continued to stretch to the south-west till midnight, when we wore and set close-reefed topsails. On the twenty-eighth at eight o'clock in the morning we wore, and stood again to the south-west till noon, when we were obliged to lie to under the foresail. At this time the high land over Cape Campbell bore west, distant t ten or twelve leagues. The adventure four or five miles to leeward. In the afternoon the fury of the gale began to abate. When we set the mainsail, close reef main topsail, and stood to the windward with a wind at west-north-west and west by north, a strong gale attended with heavy squalls. In the morning of the twenty-ninth the wind abated and shifted to south-west a gentle gale. Of this we took immediate advantage, set all our sails, and stood for Cape Palliser, which at noon bore west by north a half north, distant about six leagues. The wind continued between the south-west and south till five in the evening, when it fell calm. At this time we were about three leagues from the Cape. At seven o'clock the calm was succeeded by a gentle breeze from north-north-east, as fair as we could wish, so that we began to reckon what time we should reach the sound the next day but at nine the wind shifted to its old quarter north-west and blew a fresh gale, with which we stretched to the south-west under single reef topsails and courses, with the adventure in company. She was seen until midnight, at which time she was two or three miles astern, and presently after she disappeared, nor was she to be seen at daylight. We supposed she had tacked and stood to the north-east, by which manoeuvre we lost sight of her. We continued to stretch to the westward with a wind at north-north-west, which increased in such a manner as to bring us under our two courses after splitting a new main topsail. At noon Cape Campbell bore west by north distant seven or eight leagues. At three in the afternoon the gale began to abate and to veer more to the north, so that we fetched in with the land under the snowy mountains about four or five leagues to windward of the lookers-on, where there was the appearance of a large bay. I now regretted the loss of the adventure, for had she been with me, I should have given up all thoughts of going to Queen Charlotte's Sound to wood and water, and to have sought for a place to get these articles farther south, as the wind was now favourable for ranging along the coast. But our separation made it necessary for me to repair to the Sound, that being the place of rendezvous. As we approached the land, we saw smoke in several places along the shore, a sure sign that the coast was inhabited. 
Our soundings were from forty-seven to twenty-five fathoms, that is, at the distance of three miles from the shore, forty-seven fathoms, and twenty-five fathoms at a distance of one mile, where we tacked and stood to the eastward, under the two courses and close-reefed topsails. But the latter we could not carry long before we were obliged to hand them. We continued to stand to the eastward all night, in hopes of meeting with the adventure in the morning. Seeing nothing of her then, we wore and brought two under the foresail and mizzen staysail, the wind having increased to a perfect storm, but we had not been long in this situation before it abated, so as to permit us to carry the two courses, under which we stood to the west, and at noon the snowy mountains bore west-north-west, distant twelve or fourteen leagues. At six o'clock in the evening the wind quite ceased, but this proved only a momentary repose, for presently after it began to blow with redoubled fury, and obliged us to lie to under the mizzen staysail, in which situation we continued till midnight, when the storm lessened, and two hours after it fell calm. 1773 November On the 1st of November, at four o'clock in the morning, the calm was succeeded by a breeze from the south. This soon after increased to a fresh gale, attended with hazy rainy weather, which gave us hopes that the northwest winds were done, for it must be observed that they were attended with clear and fair weather. We were not wanting in taking immediate advantage of this favourable wind by setting all our sails and steering for Cape Campbell, which at noon bore north, distant three or four leagues. At two o'clock we passed the Cape, and entered the strait, with a brisk gale astern, and so likely to continue, that we thought of nothing less than reaching our fort the next morning. Once more we were to be deceived. At six o'clock, being off Cloudy Bay, our favourable wind was succeeded by one from the north, which soon after veered to north-west and increased to a fresh gale. We spent the night plying, our tacks proved disadvantageous, and we lost more on the ebb than we gained on the flood. Next morning we stretched over for the shore of Ihainamoe. At sunrise, the horizon being extraordinarily clear to leeward, we looked well out for the adventure, but as we saw nothing of her, judged that she had got into the sound. As we approached the above-mentioned shore, we discovered on the east side of Cape Tarawite, a new inlet I had never observed before. Being tired with beating against the northwest winds, I resolved to put into this place if I found it practicable, or to anchor in the bay which lies before it. The flood being favourable, after making a stretch off, we fetched under the cape, and stretched into the bay along the western shore, having from thirty-five to twelve fathoms, the bottom everywhere good anchorage. At one o'clock, we reached the entrance of the inlet, just as the tide of ebb was making out. The wind being likewise against us, we anchored in twelve fathoms water, the bottom of fine sand. The easternmost of the black rocks, which lie on the larboard side of the entrance of the inlet, bore north by east one mile distance. Cape Tirawite, or the west point of the bay, west, distant about two leagues and the east point of the bay, north by east, four or five miles. Soon after we had anchored, several of the natives came off in their canoes, two from one shore and one from the other. It required but little address to get three or four of them on board. These people were extravagantly fond of nails above every other thing. To one man I gave two cocks and two hens, which he received with so much indifference as gave me little hopes that he would take proper care of them. We had not been at anchor here above two hours before the wind veered to north-east, with which we weighed, but the anchor was hardly at the bows before it shifted to the south. With this we could but just lead out of the bay, and then bore away from the sound under all the sail we could set, having the advantage, or rather disadvantage, of an increasing gale, which already blew too hard. We hauled up into the sound just at dark, after making two boards, in which most of our sails were split, 
and anchored in eighteen fathoms water between the white rocks and the northwest shore. The next morning the gale abated and was succeeded by a few hours calm. After that a breeze sprang up at northwest, with which we weighed and ran up into Ship Cove, where we did not find the adventure as was expected. End of Book Two, Chapter Four. Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts. Book Two, Chapter Five of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume One by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole. Chapter Five: Transactions at Queen Charlotte Sound, with an account of the inhabitants being cannibals and various other incidents departure from the sound and our endeavours to find the adventure and some description of the coast seventeen seventy three november the first thing we did after mooring the ship was to unbend all the sails there not being one but what wanted repair Indeed, both our sails and rigging had sustained much damage in beating off the strait's mouth. We had no sooner anchored than we were visited by the natives, several of whom I remember to have seen when I was here in the endeavour, particularly an old man named Gubaya. In the afternoon, I gave orders for all the empty water casks to be landed, in order to be repaired, cleaned and filled, tents to be set up for the sailmakers, coopers and others, whose business made it necessary for them to be on shore. The next day we began to cork the ship's sides and decks, to overhaul her rigging, repair the sails, cut wood for fuel, and set up the smith's forge to repair the iron work, all of which were absolutely necessary. We also made some hauls with the Seine, but caught no fish, which deficiency the natives in some measure made up, by bringing us a good quantity, and exchanging them for pieces of Otaheitan cloth, etc. On the fifth, the most part of our bread being in casks, I ordered some to be opened, when, to our mortification, we found a good deal of it damaged. To repair this loss in the best manner we could, all the casks were opened, the bread was picked, and the copper oven set up, to bake such parcels of it as, by that means, could be recovered. Some time this morning the natives stole, out of one of the tents, a bag of clothes belonging to one of the seamen. As soon as I was informed of it, I went to them in an adjoining cove, demanded the clothes again, and, after some time spent in friendly application, recovered them. Since we were among thieves, and had come off so well, I was not sorry for what had happened, as it taught our people to keep a better lookout for the future. With these people I saw the youngest of the two sows Captain Furneaux had put on shore in Cannibal Cove when we were last here. It was lame of one of its hind legs, otherwise in good case and very tame. If we understood these people right, the boar and other sow were also taken away and separated, but not killed. We were likewise told that the two goats I had put on shore up the sound had been killed by that old rascal Gubaya. Thus all our endeavours to stock this country with useful animals were likely to be frustrated by the very people we meant to serve. Our gardens had fared somewhat better. Everything in them except the potatoes they had left entirely to nature who had acted her part so well, that we found most articles in a flourishing state, a proof that the winter must have been mild. The potatoes had most of them been dug up. Some, however, still remained, and were growing, though I think it probable that they will never be got out of the ground. Next morning I sent over to the cove where the natives reside to haul the Seine, and took with me a boar and a young sow, two cocks and two hens, 
we had brought from the isles. These I gave to the natives, being persuaded they would take proper care of them, by their keeping Captain Furneaux's sow near five months, for I am to suppose it was caught soon after we sailed. We had no better success with the Seine than before. Nevertheless we did not return on board quite empty, having purchased a large quantity from the natives. When we were upon this traffic, they showed a great inclination to pick my pockets, and to take away the fish with one hand, which they had just given me with the other. This evil one of the chiefs undertook to remove, and with fury in his eyes made a show of keeping the people at a proper distance. I applauded his conduct, but at the same time kept so good a lookout as to detect him in picking my pocket of a handkerchief which I suffered him to put in his bosom, before I seemed to know anything of the matter, and then told him what I had lost. He seemed quite ignorant and innocent, till I took it from him, and then he put it off with a laugh, acting his part with so much address, that it was hardly possible for me to be angry with him, so that we remained good friends, and he accompanied me on board to dinner. About that time we were visited by several strangers, in four or five canoes, who brought with them fish and other articles, which they exchanged for cloth, etc. These newcomers took up their quarters in a cove near us, but very early the next morning moved off with six of our small water-casks, and with them all the people we found here on our arrival. The precipitate retreat of these last we supposed was owing to the theft the others had committed. They left behind them some of their dogs, and the boar I had given them the day before, which I now took back again, as I had not another. Our casks were the least loss we felt by these people leaving us. While they remained we were generally well supplied with fish at a small expense. We had fair weather, with a wind at north-east on the ninth which gave us some hopes of seeing the adventure, but these hopes vanished in the afternoon, when the wind shifted to the westward. The next morning our friends the natives returned again, and brought with them a quantity of fish, which they exchanged for two hatchets. Fair weather on the twelfth enabled us to finish picking, airing, and baking our biscuit, four thousand two hundred and ninety-two pounds of which we found totally unfit to eat, and about three thousand pounds more could only be eaten by people in our situation. On the thirteenth, clear and pleasant weather, early in the morning the natives brought us a quantity of fish, which they exchanged as usual. But their greatest branch of trade was the green talc or stone, called by them po nam -mu, a thing of no great value. Nevertheless it was so much sought after by our people that there was hardly a thing they would not give for a piece of it. The fifteenth being a pleasant morning, a party of us went over to the east bay and climbed one of the hills which overlooked the eastern part of the strait, in order to look for the adventure. We had a fatiguing walk to little purpose, for when we came to the summit we found the eastern horizon so foggy that we could not see above two miles. Mr. Forster, who was one of the party, profited by this excursion in collecting some new plants. I now began to despair of seeing the adventure any more, but was totally at a loss to conceive what was become of her. Till now I thought she had put into some port in the strait, when the wind came to northwest the day we anchored in the cove and waited to complete her water. This conjecture was reasonable enough at first, but it was now hardly probable that she could be twelve days in our neighbourhood, without our either hearing or seeing something of her. The hill we now mounted is the same that I was upon in 1770, when I had the second view of the strait. We then built a tower with the stones we found there, which we now saw had been levelled to the ground no doubt by the natives, with a view of finding something hid in it. When we returned from the hill, we found a number of them collected round our boat. After some exchanges, and making them some presents, 
we re-embarked in order to return on board, and, in our way, visited others of the inhabitants by whom we were kindly received. Our friends, the natives, employed themselves on the 17th in fishing in our neighbourhood, and as fast as they caught the fish, came and disposed of them to us, insomuch that if we had more than we could make use of. From this day to the 22nd nothing remarkable happened, and we were occupied in getting everything in readiness to put to sea, being resolved to wait no longer than the assigned time for the adventure. The winds were between the south and west, stormy with rain till the 23rd, when the weather became settled, clear and pleasant. Very early in the morning we were visited by a number of the natives in four or five canoes, very few of whom we had seen before. They brought with them various articles, curiosities, which they exchanged for Otaheitan cloth, etc. At first the exchanges were very much in our favour, till an old man, who was no stranger to us, came and assisted his countrymen with his advice, which in a moment turned the trade above a thousand per cent against us. After these people were gone, I took four hogs, that is, three sows and one boar, two cocks and two hens, which I landed in the bottom of the West Bay, carrying them a little way into the woods, where we left them with as much food as would serve them ten or twelve days. This was done with a view of keeping them in the woods, lest they should come down to the shore in search of food, and be discovered by the natives which, however, seemed not probable, as this place had never been frequented by them, nor were any traces of them to be seen near it. We also left some cocks and hens in the woods in Ship Cove, but these will have a chance of falling into the hands of the natives, whose wandering way of life will hinder them from breeding, even suppose they should be taken proper care of. Indeed, they took rather too much care of those which I had already given them, by keeping them continually confined, for fear of losing them in the woods. The sow pig we had not seen since the day they had her from me, but we were now told she was still living, as also the old boar and sow given them by Captain Furneaux, so that there is reason to hope they may succeed. It will be unfortunate, indeed, if every method I have taken to provide this country with useful animals should be frustrated. We were likewise told that the two goats were still alive and running about, but I gave more credit to the first story than this. I should have replaced them by leaving behind the only two I had left, but had the misfortune to lose the ram soon after our arrival here, in a manner we could hardly account for. They were both put ashore at the tents, where they seemed to thrive very well. At last the ram was taken with fits bordering on madness. We were at a loss to tell whether it was occasioned by anything he had eaten, or by being stung with nettles, which were in plenty about the place, but supposed it to be the latter, and therefore did not take the care of him we ought to have done. One night, while he was lying by the sentinel, he was seized with one of these fits and ran headlong into the sea, but soon came out again and seemed quite easy. Presently after he was seized with another fit and ran along the beach with the she-goat after him. Some time after she returned, but the other was never seen more. Diligent search was made for him in the woods to no purpose. We therefore supposed he had run into the sea a second time and had been drowned. After this accident it would have been in vain to leave the she-goat, as she was not with Kid, having kidded but a few days before we arrived, and the kids dead. Thus the reader will see how every method I have taken to stock this country with sheep and goats has proved ineffectual. When I returned on board in the evening I found our good friends the natives had brought us a large supply of fish. Some of the officers visiting them at their habitations saw, among them, some human thigh-bones, from which the flesh had been but lately picked. This, and other circumstances, led us to believe that the people, whom we took for strangers this morning, were of the same tribe. 
that they had been out on some war expedition, and that those things they sold us were the spoils of their enemies. Indeed, we had some information of this sort the day before, for a number of women and children came off to us in a canoe, from whom we learnt that a party of men were then out, for whose safety they were under some apprehension. But this report found little credit with us, as we soon after saw some canoes come in from fishing, which we judged to be them. Having now got the ship in a condition for sea, and to encounter the southern latitudes, I ordered the tents to be struck, and everything to be got on board. The boatswain, with a party of men, being in the woods cutting broom, some of them found a private hut of the natives, in which was deposited most of the treasure they had received from us, as well as other articles of their own. It is very probable some were set to watch this hut, as, soon after it was discovered, they came and took all away. But missing some things, they told our people they had stolen them, and in the evening came and made their complaint to me, pitching upon one of the party as the person who had committed the theft. Having ordered this man to be punished before them, they went away seemingly satisfied, although they did not recover any of the things they had lost. Nor could I by any means find out what had become of them, though nothing was more certain than that something had been stolen by some of the party, if not by the very man the natives had pitched upon. It was ever a maxim with me to punish the least crimes any of my people committed against these uncivilized nations. Their robbing us with impunity is, by no means, a sufficient reason why we should treat them in the same manner, a conduct we see they themselves cannot justify. They found themselves injured and sought for redress in a legal way. The best method, in my opinion, to preserve a good understanding with such people is, first by showing them the use of firearms, to convince them of the superiority they give you over them, and then to be always upon your guard. When once they are sensible of these things, a regard for their own safety will deter them from disturbing you, or from being unanimous in forming any plan to attack you, and strict honesty and gentle treatment on your part will make it their interest not to do so. Calm or light airs from the north all day on the 23rd hindered us from putting to sea as intended. In the afternoon some of the officers went on shore to amuse themselves among the natives, where they saw the head and bowels of a youth who had lately been killed lying on the beach, and the heart stuck on a forked stick which was fixed to the head of one of the largest canoes. One of the gentlemen bought the head and brought it on board, where a piece of the flesh was broiled and eaten by one of the natives, before all the officers and most of the men. I was on shore at this time, but soon after returning on board was informed of the above circumstances, and found the quarter-deck crowded with the natives, and the mangled head, or rather part of it, for the under-jaw and lip were wanting, lying on the taffrail. The skull had been broken on the left side just above the temples, and the remains of the face had all the appearance of a youth under twenty. The sight of the head and the relation of the above circumstances struck me with horror, and filled my mind with indignation against these cannibals. Curiosity, however, got the better of my indignation, especially when I considered that it would avail but little and being desirous of becoming an eye-witness of a fact which many doubted, I ordered a piece of the flesh to be broiled and brought to the quarter-deck, where one of these cannibals ate it with surprising avidity. This had such an effect on some of our people as to make them sick. Oedee, who came on board with me, was so affected with the sight as to become perfectly motionless, and seemed as if metamorphosed into the statue of horror. It is utterly impossible for art to describe that passion with half the force that it appeared in his countenance. 
when roused from this state by some of us he burst into tears continued to weep and scold by turns told them they were vile men and that he neither was nor would be any longer their friend he even would not suffer them to touch him he used the same language to one of the gentlemen who cut off the flesh and refused to accept or even touch the knife with which it was done such was odidi's indignation against the vile custom and worthy of imitation by every rational being i was not able to find out the reason for their undertaking this expedition all i could understand for certain was that they went from hence into admiralty bay the next inlet to the west and there fought with their enemies many of whom they killed they counted to me fifty a number which exceeded probability as they were not more if so many themselves i think i understood them clearly that this youth was killed there and not brought away prisoner and afterwards killed nor could i learn that they had brought away any more than this one which increased the improbability of their having killed so many. We had also reason to think that they did not come off without loss, for a young woman was seen, more than once, to cut herself, as is the custom when they lose a friend or relation. That the New Zealanders are cannibals can now no longer be doubted. The account given of this in my former voyage being partly founded on circumstances was as i afterwards understood discredited by many persons few consider what a savage man is in his natural state and even after he is in some degree civilized the new zealanders are certainly in some state of civilization their behaviour to us was manly and mild showing on all occasions a readiness to oblige they have some arts among them which they execute with great judgment and unwearied patience. They are far less addicted to thieving than the other islanders of the South Sea. And I believe those in the same tribe, or such as are at peace one with another, are strictly honest among themselves. This custom of eating their enemies slain in battle, for I firmly believe they eat the flesh of no others, has undoubtedly been handed down to them from the earliest times and we know it is not an easy manner to wean a nation from their ancient customs let them be ever so inhuman and savage especially if that nation has no manner of connection or commerce with strangers for it is by this that the greatest part of the human race has been civilized an advantage which the new zealanders from their situation never had an intercourse with foreigners would reform their manners and polish their savage minds or were they more united under a settled form of government they would have fewer enemies consequently this custom would be less in use and might in time be in a manner forgotten at present they have but little idea of treating others as themselves would wish to be treated but treat them as they expect to be treated if i remember right one of the arguments they made use of to topia who frequently expostulated with them against this custom was that there could be no harm in killing and eating the man who would do the same by them if it was in his power for said they can there be any harm in eating our enemies whom we have killed in battle would not those very enemies have done the same for us? I have often seen them listen to Topia with great attention, but I never found his arguments have any weight with them, or that with all his rhetoric he could persuade any one of them that this custom was wrong. And when Odidi and several of our people showed their abhorrence of it, they only laughed at them among many reasons which i have heard assigned for the prevalence of this horrid custom the want of animal food has been one but how far this is deducible either from facts or circumstances i shall leave those to find out who advanced it in every part of new zealand where i have been 
Fish was in such plenty that the natives generally caught as much as served both themselves and us. They have also plenty of dogs, nor is there any want of wild fowl which they know very well how to kill, so that neither this nor the want of food of any kind can, in my opinion, be the reason. But whatever it may be, I think it was but too evident that they have a great liking for this kind of food. I must here observe that Odi soon learnt to converse with these people, as I am persuaded he would have done with the people of Amsterdam, had he been a little longer with them, for he did not understand the New Zealanders at first any more or not so much as he understood the people of Amsterdam. At four o'clock in the morning on the twenty-fourth we unmoored with an intent to put to sea, but the wind being at north and north-east without, and blowing strong puffs into the cove, made it necessary for us to lie fast. While we were unmooring, some of our old friends came on board to take their leave of us, and afterwards left the cove with all their effects. But those who had been out on the late expedition remained, and some of the gentlemen having visited them, found the heart still sticking on the canoe, and the intestines lying on the beach, but the liver and lungs were now wanting. Probably they had eaten them, after the carcass was all gone. On the twenty-fifth early in the morning we weighed, with a small breeze out of the cove, which carried us no farther than between Motuara and Long Island, where we were obliged to anchor. But presently, after a breeze springing up at north, we weighed again, turned out of the sound, and stood over for Cape Terawite. During our stay in the sound we were plentifully supplied with fish, procured from the natives at a very easy rate, and besides the vegetables our own gardens afforded, we found everywhere plenty of scurvy grass and celery, which I caused to be dressed every day for all hands. By this means they had been mostly on a fresh diet for the three preceding months, and at this time we had neither a sick nor scorbutic man on board. It is necessary to mention, for the information of others, that we had now some pork on board, salted at Ulitea, and as good as any I ever ate. The manner in which we cured it was this. In the cool of the evening the hogs were killed, dressed, cut up, the bones cut out, and the flesh salted while it was yet hot. The next morning we gave it a second salting, packed it into a cask, and put to it a sufficient quantity of strong pickle. Great care is to be taken that the meat be well covered with pickle, otherwise it will soon spoil. The morning before we sailed I wrote a memorandum, setting forth the time we last arrived, the day we sailed, the route I intended to take, and such other information as I thought necessary for Captain Furneaux, in case he should put into the sound, and buried it in a bottle, under the root of a tree in the garden, which is in the bottom of the cove, in such a manner as must be found by him, or any other European who might put into the cove. I, however, had little reason to hope it would fall into the hands of the person for whom it was intended, thinking hardly possible that the adventure could be in any port in New Zealand, as we had not heard of her all this time. Nevertheless, I was resolved not to leave the coast without looking for her, where I thought it most likely for her to be. It was with this view that I stood over for Cape Terawite, and afterwards ran along shore from point to point to Cape Palliser, firing guns every half hour, but all to no effect. At eight o'clock we brought two for the night, Cape Palliser bearing south-east by east distant three leagues, in which situation we had fifty fathoms water. I had now an opportunity of making the following remarks on the coast between Cape Terawite and Cape Palliser. The bay which lies on the west side of the last cape does not appear to run so far inland to the northward as I at first thought the deception being caused by the land in the bottom of it being low. 
It is, however, at least five leagues deep, and full as wide at the entrance, though it seems to be exposed to southerly and south-westerly winds. It is probable there may be places in the bottom of it sheltered even from these. The bay or inlet on the east side of Cape Terawite, before which we anchored, lies in north, inclining to the west, and seem to be sheltered from all winds. The middle cape, or point of land that disjoins these two bays, rises to a considerable height, especially inland for close to the sea is a skirt of low land off which lie some pointed rocks, but so near to the shore as to be no ways dangerous. Indeed, the navigation of this side of the strait seems much safer than the other, because the tides here are not near so strong. Cape Terawite and Cape Palliser lie in the direction of north 69 degrees west and south 69 degrees east from each other, distant ten leagues. The cape which disjoins the two bays above mentioned lies within, or north of this direction. All the land near the coast between and about these capes is exceedingly barren, probably owing to its being so much exposed to the cold southerly winds. From Cape Terawite to the two brothers, which lie off Cape Kaumuru, the course is nearly northwest by west, distant sixteen miles. North of Cape Terawite, between it and Entry Island, is an island lying pretty near the shore. I judged this to be an island when I saw it in my former voyage, but not being certain, left it undetermined in my chart of the strait, which is the reason of my taking notice of it now, as also of the bays, etc., above mentioned. At daylight in the morning on the 26th we made sail round Cape Palliser, firing guns as usual, as we ran along the shore. In this manner we proceeded till we were three or four leagues to the northeast of the Cape. When the wind shifted to northeast, we bore away for Cape Campbell, on the other side of the strait. Soon after, seeing a smoke ascend at some distance inland, away to the northeast, we hauled the wind and continued to ply till six o'clock in the evening, which was several hours after the smoke disappeared, and left us not the least signs of people. Every one being unanimously of opinion that the adventure could neither be stranded on the coast, nor be in any of the harbours thereof, I gave up looking for her, and all thoughts of seeing her any more during the voyage as no rendezvous was absolutely fixed upon after leaving New Zealand. Nevertheless, this did not discourage me from fully exploring the southern parts of the Pacific Ocean, in the doing of which I intended to employ the whole of the ensuing season. On our quitting the coast, and consequently all hopes of being joined by our consort, I had the satisfaction to find that not a man was dejected, or thought the dangers we had yet to go through, were in the least increased by being alone, but as cheerfully proceeding to the south, or wherever I may think proper to lead them, as if the adventure, or even more ships, had been in our company. End of Book Two, Chapter Five. Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts. Book Two, Chapter Six, Part One of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 1 by James Cook. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Cole. Chapter 6. Route of the Ship from New Zealand in Search of a Continent, with an account of the various obstructions met with from the ice, and the methods pursued to explore the Southern Pacific Ocean. 1773 November. At eight o'clock in the evening of the 26th, we took our departure from Cape Palliser, and steered to the south, inclining to the east, having a favourable gale from the north-west and south-west. We daily saw some rockweeds, seals, Port Egmont hens, albatrosses, pintadoes, and other petrels. 1773 December. 
and on the 2nd of December, being in the latitude of 48 degrees 23 minutes south, longitude 179 degrees 16 minutes west, we saw a number of red-billed penguins, which remained about us for several days. On the 5th, being in the latitude 50 degrees 17 minutes south, longitude 179 degrees 40 minutes east, the variation was 18 degrees 25 minutes east. At half an hour past eight o'clock the next evening, we reckoned ourselves antipodes to our friends in London, consequently as far removed from them as possible. On the 8th, being in the latitude 55 degrees 39 minutes, longitude 178 degrees 53 minutes west, we ceased to see penguins and seals, and concluded that those we had seen retired to the southern parts of New Zealand whenever it was necessary for them to be at land. We had now a strong gale at northwest and a great swell from southwest. This swell we got as soon as the south point of New Zealand came in that direction, and as we had had no wind from that quarter the six preceding days, but on the contrary it had been at east, north and northwest, I conclude there can be no land to the southward under the meridian of New Zealand, but what must lie very far to the south. The two following days we had very stormy weather, sleet and snow, winds between the north and south-west. The eleventh the storm abated, and the weather clearing up, we found the latitude to be 61 degrees 15 minutes south, longitude 173 degrees 4 minutes west. This fine weather was of short duration. In the evening the wind increased to a strong gale at south-west, blew in squalls attended with thick snow showers, hail and sleet. The mercury in the thermometer fell to 32. Consequently the weather was very cold, and seemed to indicate that ice was not far off. At four o'clock the next morning, being in the latitude of 62 degrees 10 minutes south, longitude 172 degrees west, we saw the first ice island, eleven and a half degrees further south than the first ice we saw the preceding year, after leaving the Cape of Good Hope. At the time we saw this ice, we also saw an Antarctic petrel, some grey albatrosses, and our old companions pintadoes and blue petrels. The wind kept veering from south-west by the north-west to north-north-east, for the most part a fresh gale, attended with thick haze and snow, on which account we steered to the south-east and east, keeping the wind always on the beam, that it might be our power to return back nearly on the same track, should our course have been interrupted by any danger whatever. For some days we had a great sea from the north-west and south-west, so that it is not probable there can be any land near between these two points. We fell in with several large islands on the 14th, and about noon, with a quantity of loose ice, through which we sailed, latitude 64 degrees 55 minutes south, longitude 163 degrees 20 minutes west. Grey albatrosses, blue petrels, pintadoes, and fulmers were seen. As we advanced to the south-east by east with a fresh gale at west, we found the number of ice islands increase fast upon us. Between noon and eight in the evening we saw but two, but before four o'clock in the morning of the fifteenth we had passed seventeen, besides a quantity of loose ice which we ran through. At six o'clock we were obliged to haul to the north-east, in order to clear an immense field that lay to the south and south-east. The ice, in most part of it, lay close packed together. In other places there appeared partitions in the field, and a clear sea beyond it. However, I did not think it safe to venture through, as the wind would not permit us to return the same way that we must go in. Besides, as it blew strong, 
and the weather at times was exceedingly foggy, it was the more necessary for us to get clear of this loose ice, which is rather more dangerous than the great islands. It was not such ice as is usually found in bays or rivers and near shore, but such as breaks off from the islands, and may not improperly be called pairings of the large pieces, or the rubbish or fragments which fall off when the great islands break loose from the place where they are formed. We had not stood long to the north-east, before we found ourselves embayed by the ice, and were obliged to tack and stretch to the south-west, having the field or loose ice to the south, and many huge islands to the north. After standing two hours on this tack, the wind very luckily veering to the westward, we tacked, stretched to the north, and soon got clear of the loose ice, but not before we had received several hard knocks from the larger pieces which, with all our care, we could not avoid. After clearing one danger, we still had another to encounter. The weather remained foggy, and many large islands lay in our way, so that we had to luff for one and bear up for another. Once we were very near falling aboard of, and, if it had happened, this circumstance would never have been related. These difficulties, together with the improbability of finding land farther south, and the impossibility of exploring it, on account of the ice, if we should find any, determined me to get more to the north. At the time we last tacked, we were in the longitude of 159 degrees 20 minutes west, and in the latitude of 66 degrees 0 minutes south. Several penguins were seen on some of these islands, and a few Antarctic petrels on the wing. We continued to stand to the north, with a fresh gale at west, and tended with thick snow showers till eight o'clock in the evening, when the wind abated, the sky began to clear up, and at six o'clock in the morning of the 16th it fell calm. Four hours later it was succeeded by a breeze at northeast, with which we stretched to the southeast, having thick hazy weather, with snow showers, and all our rigging coated with ice. In the evening we attempted to take some up out of the sea, but were obliged to desist, the sea running too high and the pieces being so large that it was dangerous for the boat to come near them. The next morning, being the 17th, we succeeded better, for falling in with a quantity of loose ice, we hoisted out two boats, and by noon got on board as much as we could manage. We then made sail for the east, with a gentle breeze northerly, attended with sleet and snow, which froze to the rigging as it fell. At this time we were in the latitude of 64 degrees 41 minutes south, longitude 155 degrees 44 minutes west. The ice we took up proved to be none of the best, being chiefly composed of frozen snow, on which account it was porous, and had imbibed a good deal of salt water. But this drained off after lying a while on deck, and the water then yielded was fresh. We continued to stretch to the east, with a piercing cold northerly wind, attended with a thick fog, snow and sleet, that decorated all our rigging with icicles. We were hourly meeting with some of the large ice islands, which in these high latitudes render navigation so very dangerous. At seven in the evening, falling in with a cluster of them, we narrowly escaped running aboard of one, and with difficulty, war clear of the others. We stood back to the west till ten o'clock, at which time the fog cleared away, and we resumed our course to the east. At noon the next day we were in the latitude of 64 degrees 49 minutes south, longitude 149 degrees 19 minutes west. Some time after, our longitude, by observed distance of the sun and moon, was 149 degrees 19 minutes west, by Mr. Kendall's watch, 148 degrees 36 minutes, 
and by my reckoning 148 degrees 43 minutes, latitude 64 degrees 48 minutes south. The clear weather and the wind veering to northwest tempted me to steer south, which course we continued till seven in the morning of the twentieth, when the wind changing to north-east and the sky becoming clouded, we hauled up south-east in the afternoon. The wind increased to a strong gale, attended with a thick fog, snow, sleet and rain, which constitutes the very worst of weather. Our rigging at this time was so loaded with ice that we had enough to do to get our topsails down, to double the reef. At seven o'clock in the evening, in the longitude of 147 degrees 46 minutes, we came the second time within the Antarctic or polar circle, continuing our course to the south-east till six o'clock the next morning, at that time, being in the latitude of 67 degrees 5 minutes south, all at once we got in among a cluster of very large ice islands, and a vast quantity of loose pieces, and as the fog was exceedingly thick, it was with the utmost difficulty we wore clear of them. This done, we stood to the northwest till noon, when, the fog being somewhat dissipated, we resumed our course again to the south-east. The ice islands we met with in the morning were very high and rugged, forming at their tops many peaks, whereas the most of them we had seen before were flat at top, and not so high, though many of them were between two and three hundred feet in height, and between two and three miles in circuit, with perpendicular cliffs or sides, astonishing to behold. Most of our winged companions had now left us, the grey albatrosses only remained, and instead of the other birds, we were visited by a few Antarctic petrels. The 22nd we steered east-south-east with a fresh gale at north, blowing in squalls, one of which took hold of the mizzen topsail, tore it all to rags, and rendered it for ever after useless. At six o'clock in the morning, the wind veering towards the west, our course was east-northerly. At this time we were in the latitude of 67 degrees 31 minutes, the highest we had yet been in, longitude 142 degrees 54 minutes west. We continued our course to the east by north till noon, the 23rd, when being in the latitude of 67 degrees 12 minutes, longitude 138 degrees 0 minutes, we steered southeast having then at twenty-three ice islands in sight from off the deck, and twice that number from the masthead, and yet we could not see above two or three miles round us. At four o'clock in the afternoon, in the latitude of sixty-seven degrees twenty minutes, longitude one thirty-seven degrees twelve minutes, we fell in with such a quantity of field or loose ice, as covered the sea in the whole extent from south to east, and was so thick and close as wholly to obstruct our passage. At this time, the wind being pretty moderate and the sea smooth, we brought two at the outer edge of the ice, hoisted out two boats, and sent them to take some up. In the meantime, we laid hold of several large pieces alongside, and got them on board with our tackle. The taking up ice proved such cold work, that it was eight o'clock by the time the boats had made two trips, when we hoisted them in and made sail to the west, under double reef topsails and courses, with a strong gale at north, attended with sleet and snow, which froze to the rigging as it fell, making the ropes like wires, and the sails like boards or plates of metal. The sheaves also were frozen so fast in the block, that it required our utmost efforts to get a topsail down and up, the cold so intense as hardly to be endured, the whole sea in a manner, covered with ice, a hard gale, and a thick fog. Under all these unfavourable circumstances, it was natural for me to think of returning more to the north, seeing no probability of finding any land here, 
nor a possibility of getting further south, and to have proceeded to the east in this latitude must have been wrong, not only on account of the ice, but because we must have left a vast space of sea to the north unexplored, a space of twenty-four degrees of latitude, in which a large tract of land might have lain. Whether such a supposition was well grounded, could only be determined by visiting those parts. While we were taking up ice, we got two of the Antarctic petrels so often mentioned, by which our conjectures were confirmed, of their being of the petrel tribe. They are about the size of a large pigeon. The feathers of the head, back, and part of the upper side of the wings are of a light brown. The belly and underside of the wings white. The tail feathers are also white, but tipped with brown. At the same time we got another new petrel, smaller than the former, and all of a dark grey plumage. We remarked that these birds were fuller of feathers than any we had hitherto seen. Such care has nature taken to clothe them suitably to the climate in which they live. At the same time we saw a few chocolate-coloured albatrosses. These, as well as the petrels above mentioned, we nowhere saw but among the ice. Hence one may with reason conjecture that there is land to the south. If not, I must ask where these birds breed. A question which perhaps will never be determined, for hitherto we have found these lands, if any, quite inaccessible. Besides these birds we saw a very large seal, which kept playing about us some time. One of our people who had been at Greenland called it a seahorse, but every one else took it for what I have said. Since our first falling in with the ice, the mercury in the thermometer had been from 33 to 31 at noonday. On the 24th the wind abated, veering to the northwest, and the sky cleared up, in the latitude of 67 degrees 0 minutes, longitude 138 degrees 15 minutes. As we advanced to the northeast with a gentle gale at northwest, the ice islands increased so fast upon us that this day at noon we could see near one hundred round us, besides an immense number of small pieces. Perceiving that it was likely to be calm, I got the ship into as clear a berth as I could, where she drifted along with the ice, and by taking the advantage of every light air of wind, was kept from falling aboard any of these floating isles. Here it was we spent Christmas Day, much in the same manner as we did the preceding one. We were fortunate in having continual daylight in clear weather, for had it been as foggy as on some of the preceding days, nothing less than a miracle could have saved us from being dashed to pieces. In the morning of the 26th, the whole sea was in a manner covered with ice, 200 large islands and upwards, being seen within the compass of four or five miles, which was the limits of our horizon, besides smaller pieces innumerable. Our latitude at noon was 66 degrees 15 minutes, longitude 134 degrees 22 minutes. By observation we found that the ship had drifted, or gone, about 20 miles to the northeast or east-northeast, whereas by the ice islands it appeared that she had gone little or nothing from which we concluded that the ice drifted nearly in the same direction, and at the same rate. At four o'clock, a breeze sprang up at west-south-west, and enabled us to steer north, the most probable course to extricate ourselves from these dangers. We continued our course to the north with a gentle breeze at west, attended with clear weather, till four o'clock the next morning, when meeting with a quantity of loose ice we brought two, and took on board as much as filled all our empty casks, and for several days present expense. This done we made sail and steered northwest with a gentle breeze at northeast. Clear frosty weather. Our latitude at this time was sixty five degrees fifty three minutes south, longitude one thirty three degrees forty two minutes west. Islands of ice not half so numerous as before. At four in the morning of the 28th, 
The wind, having veered more to the east and southeast, increased to a fresh gale, and was attended with snow showers. Our course was north till noon the next day. Being then in the latitude of 62 degrees 24 minutes, longitude 134 degrees 37 minutes, we steered northwest by north. Some hours after the sky cleared up, and the wind abating veered more to the south. On the 30th, had little wind westerly, dark gloomy weather, with rain and sleet at times, several whales seen playing about the ship, but very few birds, islands of ice in plenty, and a swell from west northwest. On the 31st, little wind from the westward, fair and clear weather, which afforded an opportunity to air the spare sails, and to clean and smoke the ship between decks. At noon our latitude was 59 degrees 40 minutes south, longitude 135 degrees 11 minutes west. Our observation today gave us reason to conjecture that we had a southerly current. Indeed, this was no more than what might reasonably be supposed to account for such huge masses of ice being brought from the south. In the afternoon we had a few hours calm, succeeded by a breeze from the east, which enabled us to resume our northwest by north course. 1774 January January 1st. The wind remained not long at east, but veered round by the south to the west, blew fresh attended with snow showers. In the evening, being in the latitude of 58 degrees 39 minutes south, we passed two islands of ice, after which we saw no more till we stood again to the south. At five o'clock in the morning on the second, it fell calm. Being at this time in the latitude of 58 degrees 2 minutes, longitude 137 degrees 12 minutes. The calm being succeeded by a breeze at east, we steered northwest by west. My reason for steering this course was to explore part of the great space of sea between us and our track to the south. On the third at noon, being in latitude 56 degrees 46 minutes, longitude 139 degrees 45 minutes, the weather became fair and the wind veered to southwest. At about this time we saw a few small divers, as we call them, of the petrel tribe, which we judged to be such as are usually seen near land, especially in the bays, and on the coast of New Zealand. I cannot tell what to think of these birds. Had there been more of them, I should have been ready enough to believe that they were, at this time, not very far from land, as I never saw one so far from known land before. Probably these few had been drawn thus far by some shoal of fish, for such were certainly about us, by the vast number of blue petrels, albatrosses, and such other birds as are usually seen in the great ocean, all or most of which left us before night. Two or three pieces of seaweed were also seen, but these appeared old and decayed. At eight o'clock in the evening, being in the latitude of 56 degrees south, longitude 140 degrees 31 minutes west, the wind fixing in the westerly board obliged us to steer north-easterly and laid me under the necessity of leaving unexplored a space of sea to the west, containing nearly 40 degrees of longitude and half that of latitude. Had the wind continued favourable, I intended to have run 15 or 20 degrees of longitude more to the west in the latitude we were then in, and back again to the east in the latitude of 50 degrees. This route would have so intersected the space above mentioned, as hardly to have left room for the bare supposition of any kind of land lying there. Indeed, as it was, we have little reason to believe that there is, but rather the contrary, from the great hollow swell we had had for several days from the west and northwest, though the wind had blown from a contrary direction a great part of the time which is a great sign that we had not been covered by any land between these two points. While we were in the high latitudes, many of our people were attacked with a slight fever, 
occasioned by colds. It happily yielded to the simplest remedies, was generally removed in a few days, and at this time we had not above one or two on the sick list. We proceeded northeast by north till the 6th at noon, being then in the latitude of 52 degrees 0 minutes south, longitude 135 degrees 32 minutes west, and about 200 leagues from our trap to Otaheite, in which space it was not probable, all circumstances considered, there is any extensive land, and it being still less probable any lay to the west, from the great mountainous billows we had had, and still continued to have from that quarter. I therefore steered north-east with a fresh gale at west-south-west. At eight o'clock in the morning on the 7th, being in the latitude of 50 degrees 49 minutes south, we observed several distances of the sun and moon, which gave the longitude as follows, viz. By Mr. Wales, 133 degrees 24 minutes 0 seconds west, Gilbert, 133 degrees 10 minutes 0 seconds. Clark, 133 degrees 0 minutes 0 seconds. Smith, 133 degrees 37 minutes 25 seconds. Myself, 133 degrees 37 minutes 0 seconds. Meehan, 133 degrees 21 minutes 43 seconds. By the watch, 133 degrees 44 minutes 0 seconds west. My reckoning, 133 degrees 39 minutes 0 seconds. Variation of the compass, 6 degrees 2 minutes 0 seconds east. Thermometer, 50 degrees. The next morning we observed again, and the results were agreeable to the preceding observations, allowing for the ship's run. I must here take notice that our longitude can never be erroneous while we have so good a guide as Mr. Kendall's watch. This day at noon we steered east-north-east a half-east, being then in the latitude of 49 degrees 7 minutes south, longitude 131 degrees 2 minutes west. On the ninth, in latitude 48 degrees 17 minutes south, Longitude 127 degrees 10 minutes west. We steered east with a fine fresh gale at west, attended with clear present weather, and a great swell from the same direction as the wind. In the morning of the 10th, having but little wind, we put a boat in the water, in which some of the officers went and shot several birds. These afforded us a fresh meal. They were of the petrel tribe, and such as are usually seen at any distance from land. Indeed, neither birds nor any other thing was to be seen that could give us the least hopes of finding any, and therefore at noon the next day, being then in the latitude of 47 degrees 51 minutes south, longitude 122 degrees 12 minutes west, and a little more than 200 leagues from my track to Otaheite in 1769, I altered the course and steered southeast with a fresh gale at southwest by west. In the evening, when our latitude was 48 degrees 22 minutes south, longitude 121 degrees 29 minutes west, we found the variation to be 2 degrees 34 minutes east, which is the least variation we had found without the tropic. In the evening of the next day, we found it to be 4 degrees 30 minutes east. Our latitude at that time was 50 degrees 5 minutes south, longitude 119 degrees half west. Our course was now more southerly till the evening of the 13th, when we were in the latitude of 53 degrees 0 minutes south, longitude 118 degrees 3 minutes west. The wind being then at northwest, a strong gale with a thick fog and rain, which made it unsafe to steer large, I hauled up southwest and continued this course till noon the next day, when our latitude was 56 degrees 4 minutes south, longitude 122 degrees 1 minute west. The wind having veered to the north, and the fog continuing, 
I hauled to the east under courses and close-reefed topsails. But this sail we could not carry long, for before eight o'clock in the evening the wind increased to a perfect storm and obliged us to lie to, under the mizzen staysail, till the morning of the 16th, when the wind having a good deal abated and veered to west, we set the courses, reefed topsails, and stood to the south. Soon after the weather cleared up, and in the evening we found the latitude to be 56 degrees 48 minutes south, longitude 119 degrees 8 minutes west. We continued to steer to the south, inclining to the east till the 18th, when we stood to the southwest with a wind at southeast, being at this time in the latitude of 61 degrees 9 minutes south, longitude 116 degrees 7 minutes west. At 10 o'clock in the evening it fell calm, which continued till 2 the next morning, when a breeze sprung up at north, which soon after increased to a fresh gale, and fixed at northeast. With this we steered south till noon on the 20th, when being now in the latitude of 62 degrees 34 minutes south, longitude 116 degrees 24 minutes west, we were again becalmed. End of Book 2, Chapter 6, Part 1book 2 chapter 6 part 2 of a voyage towards the south pole and round the world volume 1 by james cook this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by david cole book 2 chapter 6 route of the ship from new zealand in search of a continent part 2 in this situation we had two ice islands in sight, one of which seemed to be as large as any we had seen. It could not be less than two hundred feet in height, and terminated in a peak not unlike the cupola of St. Paul's Church. At this time we had a great westerly swell which made it improbable that any land should lie between us and the meridian of 133.5 degrees which was our longitude, under the latitude we were now in, when we stood to the north. In all this route we had not seen the least thing that could induce us to think we were ever in the neighbourhood of any land. We had indeed frequently seen pieces of seaweed, but this, I am well assured, is no sign of the vicinity of land, for weed is seen in every part of the ocean. After a few hours calm we got a wind from south-east, but it was very unsettled and attended with thick snow-showers. At length it fixed at south by east, and we stretched to the east. The wind blew fresh, was piercing cold, and attended with snow and sleet. On the 22nd, being in the latitude of 62 degrees 5 minutes south, longitude 112 degrees 24 minutes west, we saw an ice island, an Antarctic petrel, several blue petrels and some other known birds, but no one thing that gave us the least hopes of finding land. On the 23rd at noon we were in the latitude of 62 degrees 22 minutes south, longitude 110 degrees 24 minutes. In the afternoon we passed an ice island. The wind, which blew fresh, continued to veer to the west, and at eight o'clock the next morning it was to the north of west, when I steered south by west and south-southwest. At this time we were in the latitude of 63 degrees 20 minutes south, longitude 108 degrees 7 minutes west, and had a great sea from south-west. We continued this course till noon the next day, the 25th, when we steered due south. Our latitude at this time was 65 degrees 24 minutes south, longitude 109 degrees 31 minutes west. The wind was at north, the weather mild and not unpleasant, and not a bit of ice in view. This we thought a little extraordinary, as it was but a month before, 
and not quite two hundred leagues to the east, that we were in a manner blocked up with large islands of ice in this very latitude. Saw a single pintado petrel, some blue petrels, and a few brown albatrosses in the evening, being under the same meridian and in the latitude of sixty five degrees forty four minutes south. The variation was nineteen degrees twenty seven minutes east. But the next morning, in the latitude of sixty six degrees twenty minutes south, longitude the same as before, it was only eighteen degrees twenty minutes east. Probably the mean between the two is the nearest the truth. At this time we had nine small islands in view, and soon after we came, the third time, within the Antarctic polar circle, in the longitude of 109 degrees 31 minutes west. About noon, seeing the appearance of land to the south-east, we immediately trimmed our sails and stood towards it. Soon after it disappeared, but we did not give it up till eight o'clock the next morning, when we were well assured that it was nothing but clouds or a fog bank, and then we resumed our course to the south, with a gentle breeze at north-east, attended with a thick fog, snow and sleet. We now began to meet with ice islands more frequently than before, and in the latitude of 69 degrees 38 minutes south, longitude 108 degrees 12 minutes west, we fell in with a field of loose ice. As we began to be in want of water, I hoisted out two boats and took up as much as yielded about ten tons. This was cold work, but it was now familiar to us. As soon as we had done, we hoisted in the boats, and thereafterwards made short boards over that part of the sea we had in some measure made ourselves acquainted with. For we had now so thick a fog that we could not see two hundred yards round us, and as we knew not the extent of the loose ice, I durst not steer to the south till we had clear weather. Thus we spent the night, or rather that part of twenty-four hours, which answered to-night. For we had no darkness, but what was occasioned by fogs. At four o'clock in the morning of the twenty-ninth, the fog began to clear away, and the day becoming clear and serene, we again steered to the south, with a gentle gale at north-east and north-north-east. The variation was found to be twenty-two degrees forty-one minutes east. This was in the latitude of 69 degrees 45 minutes south, longitude 108 degrees 5 minutes west. And in the afternoon, being in the same longitude and in the latitude of 70 degrees 23 minutes south, it was 24 degrees 31 minutes east. Soon after the sky became clouded and the air very cold, we continued our course to the south and passed a piece of weed covered with barnacles, which a brown albatross was picking off. At ten o'clock we passed a very large ice island. It was not less than three or four miles in circuit. Several more being seen ahead, and the weather becoming foggy, we hauled the wind to the northward. But in less than two hours the weather cleared up, and we again stood south. On the thirtieth, at four o'clock in the morning, we perceived the clouds over the horizon to the south to be of an unusual snow-white brightness, which we knew denounced our approach to field ice. Soon after it was seen from the topmast head, and at eight o'clock we were close to its edge. It extended east and west far beyond the reach of our sight. In the situation we were in, just the southern half of our horizon was illuminated, by the rays of light reflected from the ice to a considerable height. Ninety-seven ice hills were distinctly seen within the field, besides those on the outside, many of them very large and looking like a ridge of mountains, rising one above another till they were lost in the clouds. The outer or northern edge of this immense field was composed of loose or broken ice close packed together, so that it was not possible for anything to enter it, this was about a mile broad, within which was solid ice in one continued compact body. It was rather low and flat, except the hills, but seemed to increase in height as you traced it to the south, 
in which direction it extended beyond our sight. Such mountains of ice as these, I believe, were never seen in the Greenland seas, at least not that I ever heard or read of, so that we cannot draw a comparison between the ice here and there. It must be allowed that these prodigious ice mountains must add such additional weight to the ice fields which enclose them, as cannot but make a great difference between the navigating this icy sea and that of Greenland. I will not say it was impossible anywhere to get farther to the south, but the attempting it would have been a dangerous and rash enterprise, and what I believe no man in my situation would have thought of. It was indeed my opinion, as well as the opinion of most on board, that this ice extended quite to the pole, or perhaps joined on some land, to which it had been fixed from the earliest time, and that it is here, that is, to the south of this parallel, where all the ice we find scattered up and down to the north is first formed, and afterwards broken off by gales of wind or other causes, and brought to the north by the currents, which we always found to set in that direction in the high latitudes. As we drew near this ice, some penguins were heard, but none seen, and but few other birds or any other thing that it would induce us to think that any land was near. And yet I think there must be some to the south behind this ice, but if there is, it can afford no better retreat for birds or any other animals than the ice itself with which it must be wholly covered. I, who had had ambition not only to go farther than any one had been before, but as far as it was possible for man to go, was not sorry at meeting with this interruption, as it in some measure relieved us, at least shortened the dangers and hardships inseparable from the navigation of the southern polar regions. Since, therefore, we could not proceed one inch farther to the south, no other reason need be assigned for my tacking and standing back to the north, being at this time in the latitude of 71 degrees, 10 minutes south, Longitude 106 degrees, 54 minutes west. It was happy for us that the weather was clear when we fell in with this ice, and that we discovered it as soon as we did, for we had no sooner tacked than we were involved in a thick fog. The wind was at east and blew a fresh breeze, so that we were enabled to return back over that space we had already made ourselves acquainted with. At noon, the mercury in the thermometer stood at thirty-two and a half degrees, and we found the air exceedingly cold. The thick fog continuing with showers of snow gave a coat of ice to our rigging of near an inch thick. In the afternoon of the next day the fog cleared away at intervals, but the weather was cloudy and gloomy, and the air excessively cold. However, the sea within our horizon was clear of ice. 1774 February We continued to stand to the north with the wind easterly till the afternoon on the 1st of February when falling in with some loose ice which had been broken from an island to windward we hoisted out two boats and having taken some on board resumed our course to the north and northeast with gentle breezes from southeast attended sometimes with fair weather and at other times with snow and sleet. On the 4th we were in the latitude of 65 degrees 42 minutes south, longitude 99 degrees 44 minutes. The next day the wind was very unsettled both in strength and position, and attended with snow and sleet. At length, on the 6th, after a few hours calm, we got a breeze at south, which soon after freshened, fixed at west-south-west, and was attended with snow and sleet. I now came to the resolution to proceed to the north and to spend the ensuing winter within the tropic, if I met with no employment before I came there. I was now well satisfied no continent was to be found in this ocean, but what must lie so far to the south as to be wholly inaccessible on account of ice, and that if one should be found in the southern Atlantic Ocean, it would be necessary to have the whole summer before us to explore it. 
On the other hand, upon a supposition that there is no land there, we undoubtedly might have reached the Cape of Good Hope by April, and so have put an end to the expedition, so far as it related to the finding a continent, which indeed was the first object of the voyage. But for me at this time to have quitted the southern Pacific Ocean, with a good ship expressly sent out on discoveries, a healthy crew, and not in want either of stores or of provisions, would have been betraying not only a want of perseverance, but of judgment, in supposing the South Pacific Ocean to have been so well explored that nothing remained to be done in it. This, however, was not my opinion. For though I had proved that there was no continent, but what must lie far to the south, there remained nevertheless room for very large islands, in places wholly unexamined, and many of those which were formerly discovered are but imperfectly explored, and their situations as imperfectly known. I was besides of opinion that my remaining in this sea some time longer would be productive of improvements in navigation and geography as well as in other sciences. I had several times communicated my thoughts on this subject to Captain Furneaux, but as it then wholly depended on what we might meet with to the south, I could not give it in orders without running a risk of drawing us from the main object, since now nothing had happened to prevent me from carrying these views into execution. My intention was first to go in search of the land said to have been discovered by Juan Fernandez above a century ago in about the latitude of 38 degrees. If I should fail in finding this land, then to go in search of Easter Island or Davis's land, whose situation was known with so little certainty that the attempts lately made to find it had miscarried. I next intended to go within the tropic, and then proceed to the west, touching at, and settling the situations of such islands as we might meet with till we arrived at Otaheite, where it was necessary I should stop to look for the adventure. I had also thoughts of running as far west as the Tierra Austral de Espiritu Santo, discovered by Juras, and to which Monsieur de Bougainville calls the great Cyclades. Quiros speaks of this land as being large, or lying in the neighbourhood of large lands, and as this was a point which Monsieur de Bougainville had neither confirmed nor refuted, I thought it was worth clearing up. From this land my design was to steer to the south, and so back to the east, between the latitudes of fifty and sixty degrees, intending, if possible, to be the length of Cape Horn in November next, when we should have the best part of a summer before us, to explore the southern part of the Atlantic Ocean. Great as this design appeared to be, I, however, thought it possible to be executed, and when I came to communicate it to the officers, I had the satisfaction to find that they all heartily concurred in it. I should not do these gentlemen justice if I did not take some opportunity to declare that they always showed the utmost readiness to carry into execution, in the most effectual manner, every measure I thought proper to take. Under such circumstances, it is hardly necessary to say that the seamen were always obedient and alert, and on this occasion they were so far from wishing the voyage at an end, that they rejoiced at the prospect of its being prolonged another year, and of soon enjoying the benefits of a milder climate. I now steered north, inclining to the east, and in the evening we were overtaken with a furious storm at west-south-west, attended with snow and sleet. It came so suddenly upon us, that before we could take in our sails, two old topsails, which we had bent to the yards, were blown to pieces, and the other sails much damaged. The gale lasted without the least intermission till the next morning, when it began to abate. It continued, however, to blow very fresh till noon on the twelfth, when it ended in a calm. At this time we were in the latitude of 50 degrees 14 minutes south, longitude 95 degrees 18 minutes west. Some birds being about the ship, we took the advantage of the calm to put a boat in the water and shot several birds, 
on which we feasted the next day. One of these birds was of that sort which has been so often mentioned in this journal, under the name of Port Egmont hens. They are of the gull kind, about the size of a raven, with a dark brown plumage except the underside of each wing, where there are some white feathers. The rest of the birds were albatrosses and shearwaters. After a few hours calm, having got a breeze at north-west, we made a stretch to the south-west for twenty-four hours, in which route we saw a piece of wood, a bunch of weed, and a diving petrel. The wind, having veered more to the west, made us tack and stretch to the north till noon on the fourteenth, at which time we were in the latitude of forty-nine degrees thirty-two minutes south, longitude ninety-five degrees eleven minutes west. We had now calms and light breezes succeeding each other till the next morning, when the wind freshened at west-north-west and was attended with a thick fog and drizzling rain the three following days, during which time we stretched to the north, inclining to the east, and crossed my track to Otaheite in 1769. I did intend to have kept more to the west, but the strong winds from that direction put it out of my power. On the 18th the wind veered to south-west and blew very fresh, but was attended with clear weather, which gave us an opportunity to ascertain our longitude by several lunar observations made by Messrs. Wales, Clark, Gilbert and Smith. The mean result of all was 94 degrees 19 minutes 30 seconds west. Mr. Kendall's watch at the same time gave 94 degrees 46 minutes west. Our latitude was 43 degrees 53 minutes south. The wind continued not long at southwest before it veered back to the west and west-northwest. As we advanced to the north, we felt a most sensible change in the weather. The 20th at noon we were in the latitude of 39 degrees 58 minutes south, longitude 94 degrees 37 minutes west. The day was clear and pleasant, and, I may say, the only summer's day we had had since we left New Zealand. The mercury in the thermometer rose to 66. We still continued to steer to the north, as the wind remained in the old quarter, and the next day at noon we were in the latitude of 37 degrees 54 minutes south, which was the same that Juan Fernandez's discovery is said to lie in. We, however, had not the least signs of any land lying in our neighbourhood. The next day at noon we were in latitude 36 degrees 10 minutes south, longitude 94 degrees 56 minutes west. Soon after the wind veered to south-south-east and enabled us to see a west-south-west, which I thought the most probable direction to find the land of which we were in search. And yet I had no hopes of succeeding as we had a large hollow swell from the same point. We, however, continued this course till the 25th, when the wind having veered again round to the westward, I gave it up, and stood away to the north, in order to get into the latitude of Easter Island. Our latitude at this time was 37 degrees 52 minutes, longitude 101 degrees 10 minutes west. I was now well assured that the discovery of Juan Fernandez, if any such was ever made, can be nothing but a small island, there being hardly room for a large land, as will fully appear by the tracks of Captain Wallace, Bougainville of the Endeavour, and this of the Resolution. Whoever wants to see an account of the discovery in question will meet with it in Mr. Dalrymple's collection of voyages to the South Seas. This gentleman places it under the meridian of 90 degrees, which I think it cannot be, for Monsieur de Bougainville seems to have run down under that meridian, and we had now examined the latitude in which it is said to lie, from the meridian of 94 degrees to 101 degrees. It is not probable it can lie to the east of 90 degrees, because if it did, it must have been seen at one time or other by ships bound from the north and to the southern parts of America. Mr. Pangre, in a little treatise concerning the transit of Venus, published in 1768, 
gives some account of land having been discovered by the Spaniards in 1714, in the latitude of 38 degrees, and 550 leagues from the coast of Chile, which is in the longitude of 110 or 111 degrees west, and within a degree or two of my track in the endeavour, so that this can hardly be its situation. In short, the only probable situation it can have must be about the meridian of 106 degrees or 108 degrees west, and then it can only be a small isle, as I have already observed. I was now taken ill of the bilious colic, which was so violent as to confine me to my bed, so that the management of the ship was left to Mr. Cooper, the first officer, who conducted her very much to my satisfaction. It was several days before the most dangerous symptoms of my disorder were removed, during which time Mr. Patton, the surgeon, was to me not only a skilful physician, but an affectionate nurse. And I should ill deserve the care he bestowed on me if I did not make this public acknowledgment. When I began to recover, a favourite dog belonging to Mr. Forster fell a sacrifice to my tender stomach. We had no other fresh meat on board, and I could eat of this flesh as well as broth made of it, when I could taste nothing else. Thus I received nourishment and strength from food, which would have made most people in Europe sick. So true it is, that necessity is governed by no law. On the 28th, in the latitude of 33 degrees 7 minutes south, longitude 102 degrees 33 minutes west, we began to see flying fish, egg birds, and noddies, which are said not to go above sixty or eighty leagues from land. But of this we have no certainty. No one yet knows to what distance any of the oceanic birds go to sea. For my own part, I do not believe there is one in the whole tribe that can be relied on, in pointing out the vicinity of land. In the latitude of 30 degrees 30 minutes south, longitude 101 degrees 45 minutes west, we began to see men of war birds. In the latitude of 29 degrees 44 minutes, longitude 100 degrees 45 minutes west, we had a calm of nearly two days together, during which time the heat was intolerable. But what ought to be remarked, there was a great swell from the southwest. 1774 March on the 6th of March the calm was succeeded by an easterly wind, with which we steered northwest till noon the 8th, when, being in the latitude of 27 degrees 4 minutes south, longitude 103 degrees 58 minutes west, we steered west, meeting every day with great numbers of birds, such as men of war, tropic and egg birds, poddies, shearwaters, etc., and once we passed several pieces of sponge, and a small dried leaf, not unlike a bay one. Soon after we saw a sea snake, in every respect like those we had before seen at the tropical islands. We also saw plenty of fish, but we were such bad fishers that we caught only four albacores, which were very acceptable to me especially, who was just recovering from my late illness. End of Book 2, Chapter 6, Part 2 Recording by David Cole, Medway, Massachusetts.